Prefaces of A Brief History of Forestry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. Preface to the Second Edition. It has been a great surprise, and also a great gratification to the author, to see the first edition of this volume exhausted within less than two years since its appearance in complete form. The gratification has come especially because of the opportunity thus afforded of revision, improvement in style, and correction of the many inaccuracies which the first edition contained, excusable only by the manner in which, as explained in the preface of the first edition, the volume had come into existence. Only in a few cases has it seemed desirable to expand, since the object of the book is not to be complete, but to give as briefly as possible an oversight over a rather large field. The chapter on France has, however, been entirely rewritten and considerably enlarged to meet the just criticisms of reviewers. The excellent work of Huffel, full of historical data, which was not available when the first edition was printed, permitting a clearer and fuller statement to be made. As long as history is in the making, a book of this kind can hardly be brought up to date. This should especially be kept in mind by the reader in regard to the statistics brought in, since these are only to serve in general to show the magnitude of the interests involved, they may without damage be only approximately accurate and even of older date. Some of the chapters have been submitted for criticism and corrections to correspondence in the various countries to which they refer. For the kindly assistance of these friends, thanks is due from the author. Toronto, October 1911, B. E. Fernow. Preface to the First Edition this publication is the result of a series of twenty-five lectures which the writer was invited to deliver before the students of forestry in Yale University as a part of their regular course of instruction during the session of 1904. Circumstances made it desirable, in the absence of any existing textbooks on the subject, to print at once, for the sake of ready reference, the substance of the lectures while they were being delivered. This statement of the manner in which the book came into existence will explain and, it is hoped, excuse the crudities of style, which has been also hampered by the necessity of condensation. The main object was to bring together the information, now scattered and mostly inaccessible to English or American readers. The style has been sacrificed to brevity. It is a book of expanded lecture notes, in the nature of the case, the book does not lay claim to any originality, except in the manner of presentation, being merely a compilation of facts gathered mostly from other compilations, official documents, and journals. For none of the countries discussed does a complete work on the history of forests and forestry exist, excepting in the case of Germany, which can boast of a number of comprehensive works on the subject. It was therefore possible to treat that country more in extenso. Moreover, it appeared desirable to enlarge upon the history of that country, since it is preeminently in the lead in forestry matters, and has passed through all the stages of development of forest policies and forestry practice, which, with more or less variations, must be repeated in other countries. Especially the growth of the technical science and art of forestry which has been developed in Germany for a longer time, and to a more refined degree than in other countries, has been elaborated in the chapter relating to that country. For some of the other countries, available sources of information were quite limited. The writer believes, however, that for the purpose of this brief statement, the data collected will be found sufficient. In order to make conditions existing in the different countries and their causes more readily understood, it appeared desirable to give very brief historic references to their political and economic developments, and also brief statements of their general physical conditions. Present conditions of forest policy and forest administration have sometimes been enlarged upon beyond the requirements of historical treatment. Ithaca, New York, 
May 1907, B. E. Fernow. End of the Prefaces of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 1 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernow. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introductory The value of studying the historical development of an economic subject, or of a technical art which, like forestry, relies to a large extent upon empiricism, lies in the fact that it brings before us, in proper perspective, accumulated experience, and enables us to analyze cause and effect, whereby we may learn to appreciate the reasons for present conditions and the possibilities for rational advancement. If there be one philosophy more readily derivable than another from the study of the history of forestry, it is that history repeats itself. The same policies and the same methods which we hear propounded today have at some other time been propounded and tried elsewhere. We can study the results, broadening our judgment and thereby avoid the mistakes of others. Nowhere is the record of experience and the historic method of study of more value than in an empiric art like forestry, in which it takes decades, a lifetime, nay, a century, to see the final effects of operations. Such study, if properly pursued, tends to free the mind from many foolish prejudices, and particularly from an unreasonable partiality for our own country and its customs and methods, merely because they are our own, substituting the proper patriotism, which applies the best knowledge wherever found to our own necessities. Forestry is an art born of necessity, as opposed to arts of convenience and of pleasure. Only when a reduction in the natural supplies of forest products, under the demands of civilization, necessitates a husbanding of supplies or necessitates the application of art or skill or knowledge in securing a reproduction, or when unfavorable conditions of soil or climate induced by forest destruction make themselves felt, does the art of forestry make its appearance. Hence, its beginnings occur in different places at different times, and its development proceeds at different paces. In the one country, owing to economic development, the need of an intensive forest management and of strict forest policies may have arrived, while in another, rough exploitation and wasteful practices are still natural and practically unavoidable. And such differences, as we shall see, may even exist in the different parts of the same country. The origin and growth of the art, then, is dependent on economic and cultural conditions, on various economic development, and on elements of environment. The development of the art can only be understood and appreciated through the knowledge of such environment, of such other developments as of agriculture, of industries, of means of transportation, of civilization generally. Hence we find, for instance, that England, located so as to be accessible by sea from all points of the compass, and within oceanic shipping well developed, can apparently dispense with serious consideration of the forest supply question. Again, we find that more than a century ago fear of a timber famine agitated not only the dense populations of many European countries, but even the scanty population of the United States in spite of the natural forest wealth which is still supplying us, and not without good reason, for at that time wood was the only fuel and rivers the only means of transportation. Hence, local scarcity was to be feared, and was not unfrequently experienced when accessible forest areas had been exploited. Railroad and canal development and the use of coal for fuel changed this condition on both continents. Now, with improved means of transportation by land and by sea, the questions of wood supply and of forestry development, which at one time were of very local concern, have become world questions, 
and he who proposes to discuss intelligently forest conditions and forestry movement in one country must understand what is going on in other countries. As will appear from the study of the following pages, with the exception of some parts of Central Europe, or of some sporadic attempts elsewhere to regulate forest use, the development of the forestry idea belongs essentially to the 19th century, and more especially to the second half, when the rapid development of railroads had narrowed the world and the remarkable development of industries and material civilization called for increased draft on forest resources. Yet, we are still largely ignorant as to the extent of available forest area, not only in this country but elsewhere. We do not know whether it be sufficient in extent and yield to furnish a continuous supply for the needs of our civilization, or, if not, for how long a time it will suffice. We can only make very broad statements as to questions of wood supply, and very broad inferences from them as argument for the need of a closer study of forest conditions and of the practice of forestry. 1. Practically, the northern temperate zone alone produces the kinds of wood which enter most largely into our economy, namely the soft conifers and the medium hardwoods. Most of the woods of the tropics are very hard, fit primarily for ornamental use and hence less necessary. Possibly a change in the methods of the use of wood may also change the relative economic values, but at present the vast forests of the tropical countries are of relatively little importance in the discussion of wood supply for the world. 2. The productive forest area of the temperate zone in which the industrial nations are located has continuously decreased. We shall not be far from wrong in stating this area liberally to be at present around 2,500 million acres. Note. The total forest area of the world is supposed to be 3,800 million acres. Namely in Europe, 800 million acres, in Asia, 800 million acres, in North America, 900 million acres. How much of this acreage contains available virgin timber? How much is merely potential forest? How much growing crop? It is impossible to state. Number three. The civilized wood-consuming population of this territory is about 500 million, hence the per capita acreage is still 5 acres. Taking the European countries, which now have to import all or part of their consumption, excess over exports, we find that their population is estimated at 180 million and that they use 30 cubic feet of wood per capita, of which 12 cubic feet is log timber, or, altogether, they use 2,200 million cubic feet of this latter description, of which they import in round numbers 1,000 million, at a cost of about $250 million, their forest acreage of 100 million acres being insufficient to produce, even under careful management as in Germany, more than two-thirds of their needs and the wood consumption in all these nations is growing at the rate of 1.5 to 2% annually. 4. The deficiency is at present supplied by the export countries, Russia, Sweden, Norway, Austria-Hungary, Canada, and United States, and these countries themselves, also increasing their consumption, are beginning to feel the drain on their forest resources which are, for the most part, merely roughly exploited. 5. If we assume a log timber requirement by the 500 million people of 6,000 million cubic feet, and could secure what France annually produces, namely a little less than 9 cubic feet of such timber per acre, the area supposed to be under forest would amply suffice. But a large part of it is in fact withdrawn from useful production, and of the balance not more than 250 million acres at best, are as yet under management for continuous production. Hence, attention to forestry is an urgent necessity for every industrial nation. The history of the forest in all forest countries, 
shows the same periods of development. First, hardly recognized as of value or even as personal property, the forest appears an undesirable encumbrance of the soil, and the attitude of the settler is of necessity inimical to the forest. The need for farm and pasture leads to forest destruction. The next stage is that of restriction in forest use and protection against cattle and fire, the stage of conservative lumbering. Then come positive efforts to secure regrowth by fostering natural regeneration or by artificial planting. The practice of silviculture begins. Finally, a management for continuity, organizing existing forest areas for sustained yield, forest economy is introduced. That the time and progress of these stages of development and the methods of their inauguration vary in different parts of the world is readily understood from the intimate relation which, as has been pointed out, this economic subject bears to all other economic as well as political developments. At the present time, we find all the European nations practicing forestry, although with a very varying degree of intensity. The greatest and most universal development of the art is for good reasons to be found in Germany and its nearest neighbors. Early attention in forest conservancy was here, induced by density of population, which enforces intensity in the use of soil, and by the comparative difficulty of securing wood supplies cheaply enough from outside. On the other hand, such countries as the Mediterranean peninsulas, by their advantageous situation with reference to importations, with their mild climate and less intensive industrial development, have felt this need less. Again, the still poorly settled and originally heavily timbered countries of the Scandinavian peninsula and the vast empire of Russia are still heavy exploiters of forest products, and are only just beginning to feel the drain on their forest resources, while the United States, with as much forest wealth as Russia, but with a much more intensive industrial development, has managed to reach the stage of need for a conservative forest policy in a shorter time. From each of the European countries we learn something helpful towards inaugurating such policies, and while owing to a different historical background— and to different political and social conditions, none of their administrative methods and measures may appeal to us. The principles underlying them as well as those underlying their silvicultural methods remain the same. They are applicable everywhere, and can best be recognized and studied in the history of their development. End of section 1. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 2 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Forest of the Ancients. Waldgeschichte des Altertums by August Siedensticker, 1886, in two volumes, page 863, is a most painstaking compilation from original sources of notes regarding the forest conditions and the knowledge of trees, forests, and forestry among the ancients, contains also a full bibliography. Die Waldwirtschaft der Römer by J. Trurich collects the knowledge especially of arboriculture and silviculture possessed by the Romans. Forstwissenschaftliche Leistungen der Altgriechen by Dr. Chloros in Forstwissenschaftliches Centralblatt, 1885, pages 8. Archaeologia Forestale dell'Antica Storia e Jurisprudenza Forestale in Italia by A. de Berenge, 1859. The forest was undoubtedly the earliest home of mankind, its edible products forming its principal value. Its wild animals developed the hunter, the chase first furnishing means of subsistence, and then exhilaration and pleasure. Next, it was the mast, and in its openings the pasture which gave to the forest its value for the herder, and only last, with the development into settled communities and more highly civilized conditions of life, did the wood product become its main contribution toward that civilization. Finally, 
in the refinement of cultural conditions in densely settled countries, is added its influence on soil, climate, and water conditions. Although there is no written history, there is little doubt that these were the phases of an appreciation of woodlands in the earliest development of mankind, for we find the same phases repeated in our own times in all newly settled countries. As agriculture develops, the need for farming ground overshadows the usefulness of the forest in all these directions, and it is cleared away. Moreover, as population remains scanty, a wasteful use of its stores forms the rule, until necessity arises for greater care in the exploitation, for more rational distribution of farm and forest area, and finally, for intentional reproduction of wood as a useful crop. Correspondingly, forest conditions change from the densely forested hills and mountain slopes during the age of the nomad and hunter to the enclaves or patches of field and pasture enclosed by the forest of the first farmers. Then follows the opening up of the valleys and lowlands, while the hill and mountain farms may return to forest. And finally, with the increase of population and civilization in valleys and plains, a reduction of the forest area and a decrease of forest wealth results. 1. Forest Conditions While we have many isolated references to forest conditions and progress of forest exploitation among the ancients in the writings of poets and historians, these are generally too brief to permit us to gain a very clear picture of the progress of forest history. Except in isolated cases, they furnish only glimpses, allowing us to fill in the rest to some extent by guess. That the countries occupied and known to the ancients, even Spain and Palestine, were originally well wooded, there seems little doubt, although in the drier regions and on the drier limestone soils, the forest was perhaps open, as is usual under such conditions, and truly arid, Forestless regions were also found where they exist now. Although it has been customary to point out some of the Mediterranean and eastern countries as having become deserts and depopulated through deforestation, and although this is undoubtedly true for some parts, as Mount Lebanon and Syria, generalization in this respect is dangerous. We know, however, that by the 11th century before Christ, in Palestine, Asia Minor, and Greece, especially in the neighborhood of thriving cities, the forest cover had vanished to a large extent, and building timber for the temples at Tyre and Sidon had to be brought long distances from Mount Lebanon, whose wealth of cedar was also freely drawn upon for ship timber and other structures. Although about 465 B.C., Artaxerxes I., having recognized the pending exhaustion of this mountain forest, had attempted to regulate the cutting of timber. The exploitation had, by 333 B.C., progressed to such an extent that Alexander the Great found at least the south slope exhausted and almost woodless. The destruction by axe and fire of the celebrated forests of Sharon, Carmel, and Bashan is the theme of the prophet Isaiah writing about 590 B.C., and the widespread devastation of large forest areas during the Jewish wars is depicted by Josephus. In Greece, the Persian wars are on record as causes of widespread forest destruction, yet in other parts, as on the island of Cyprus, which originally densely wooded, had rapidly lost its forest wealth during Cleopatra's time through the development of mining and metallurgical works shipbuilding and clearing for farms, the kings seem to have been able to protect the remnants for a long time so that respectable forest cover exists even to date. The Romans seem to have had still a surplus of ship timber at their command in the 3rd and 2nd centuries before Christ, when they did not hesitate to burn the warships of the Carthaginians in 203 BC and of the Syrians in 189 BC although it may be that other considerations forced these actions. Denuded hills and scarcity of building timber in certain parts are mentioned at the end of the 3rd century before Christ, 
and that the need for conservative use of timber resources had arrived also appears from the fact that when, in 167 BC, the Romans had brought Macedonia under their sway, the cutting of ship timber in the extensive forests of that country was prohibited. Although at that time the Roman state forests were still quite extensive, it is evident that under the system of renting these for the mast and pasture and for the exploitation of their timbered companies of contractors, their devastation must have progressed rapidly. Yet, on the whole, with local exceptions, Italy remained well wooded until the Christian era. In Spain, according to Diodorus Siculus, about 100 BC, the southern provinces were densely wooded when about 200 BC, the Romans first took possession, but soon after a great forest fire starting from the Pyrenees ran over the country, exposing deposits of silver ore, which invited a large influx of miners, the cause of reckless deforestation of the country. The interior of this peninsula, however, was probably always forestless, or at least scantily wooded. While through colonization, exploitation, fire, and other abuse, the useful forest area was decimated in many parts. The location of the Mediterranean peninsular countries was such that wood supplies could be readily secured by water from distant parts, and the Lignarii, or wood merchants of Italy, drew their supplies even from India by way of Alexandria. They went for ash to Asia Minor, for cedar to Cilicia. Paphlagonia, Liguria, and Mauritania became the great wood export countries. It is interesting to note that a regular wood market existed in Rome, as in Jerusalem, and at the former place firewood was sold by the pound, 75 cents per 200 pounds in Cicero's time. At the same time that the causes of devastation were at work, the forest area also increased in some parts recovering ground lost during wars and through the neglect of farms by natural seeding, much less by active effort, although planting of trees in parks, vineyards, and groves was early practiced to a limited extent. 2. Development of Property As to development of forest property, we have also only fragmentary information. Nomads do not know soil as property. When they became settled farmers, the plough land, the vineyard, or olive grove, and orchard are recognized as private property, but all the rest remains common property, or nobody's in particular, and even the private property was not at first entirely exclusive. Hence, for a long time, and in some parts even to date, the exclusive property right in forests is not fully established. At least the right to hunt over all territory without restriction was possessed by everybody, although an owner might prevent undesirable hunters from entering his property if it was enclosed. The setting aside of hunting grounds for private use came into existence only in later Roman times, but woodland parks, planted or otherwise, like the paradises of the Persian kings and the nemora of the Romans and Carthaginians, were early a part of the private property of princes and grandees from which others were excluded. Forests formed a barrier and defense against outsiders, or a hiding place in case of need, hence we find in early times frontier forests, or as the Germans called them, Grenzmachen. Set aside or designated for such purposes and withdrawn from use, and sometimes additionally fortified by ditches and other artificial barriers. Even before the Grenzmachen of the Germans, the forest was used by the Greeks, Romans, and still earlier among Asiatic tribes, to designate the limit of peoples, as well as to serve as a bulwark against attacks from invaders. Again, the pantheistic ideas of the ancients led to consecrating not only trees but groves to certain gods, Holy groves were frequent among the Greeks and Romans, and also among other pagans. The Jews, however, were enjoined to eradicate these emblems of paganism in the Promised Land with axe and fire, and they did so more or less, removal and re-establishment of holy groves varying according to the religious sentiment of their rulers. 
Altogether in Palestine, the forests were left to the free and unrestricted use of the Israelites. Out of religious conceptions and priestly shrewdness arose church property in farms and forests among the Indian Brahmins, the Ethiopians and Egyptians, as also among Greeks and Romans. It appears that the Oriental kings were exclusive owners of all unappropriated or public forests, this was certainly the case with the princes of India and of Persia, and such ownership can be proved definitely in many other parts as in the case of the forests of Lebanon, of Cyprus, and of various forest areas in Asia Minor. That in the Greek republics the forests were mainly public property seems to be likely, for Attica at least this is true without doubt. While the first Roman kings seem to have owned royal domains, which were distributed among the people after the expulsion of the kings, the public property which came to the republic as a result of conquest was in most cases at once transferred to private hands, either for homesteads of colonists or in recognition of services of soldiers and other public officers, or to mollify the conquered or by sale or for rent, not to mention the rights acquired by squatters. The rents were usually farmed out to collectors, publicani, or to corporations formed of these. Livy, however, mentions also state forests in which the cutting was regulated, probably by merely reserving the ship timber. That occasionally single cities and other smaller municipal units owned forest properties in common, seems also established. Private forest properties connected with farm estates existed in Ethiopia, in Arabia, among the Greeks and among the Romans at home as well as in their colonies, especially pasture woods, saltus, connected with small and large estates, latifundia, into which probably most forest areas near settlements were turned, are frequently mentioned as in private ownership, but also other private forests existed. The institution of servitudes, or rights of user, usus and usus fructus, and a considerable amount of law regarding the conditions under which they were exercised, and regarding their extinguishment, were in existence among the Romans in the first centuries of the Christian era. 3. Forest Use Restrictions in the use of woods were not entirely absent, but with the exception of reserving ship timber in the state forests, they refer only to special classes of forest. In the frontier forests reserved for defensive purposes, timber cutting was forbidden, and in the holy groves set aside by private or public declaration, no wood could be cut thereafter being in the latter case considered nobody's property, but sanctified and dedicated to religious use, res sacra, and whoever removed any wood from them was considered a patricide, except the cutting be done for purposes of improvement, thinnings, and after a prescribed sacrifice. With the extension of Christendom, the holy trees and groves became the property of the emperors, who sometimes substituted Christian holiness for the pagan, and retained the restrictions which had preserved them. Thus, the cutting and selling of Cyprus and other trees in the holy grove near Antioch, and of Persea trees in Egypt, generally which had been deemed holy under the pharaohs, was prohibited under penalty of five pounds gold, unless a special permit had been obtained. In Attica, as well as in Rome, the theory that the state cannot satisfactorily carry on any business was well established. Hence, the state forests were rented out under a system of time rent, or a perpetual license. The renters, after exploiting the timber, usually subletting the culled woods merely for the pasture, except where coppice could be profitably utilized. The officials with titles referring to their connection with the woods as with the Roman saltuarii, or the Greek hyloroi, forest guards, and Velici silvarum, the overseers, both grades taken from the slaves had hardly even police functions. Forest management proper, in other words, regulated use for continuity, except in coppice, seems nowhere to have been practiced by the ancients, 
although arboriculture in artificial plantations was well established, and occasionally even attempts at replacement in forest fashion seem to have been made deliberately. Not only were many arboricultural practices of today well known to them, but also a number of the still unsettled controversies in this field were then already subjects of discussion. The culling system of taking only the most desirable kinds, trees, and cuts, which until recently has characterized our American lumbering methods, was naturally the one under which the mixed forest was utilized. Fire used in the pasture woods for the same purposes as with us effectively prevented reproduction in these and destroyed gradually the remnants of old trees. Only where, for park and hunting purposes, some care was bestowed upon the woodland, was reproduction purposefully attempted as, for instance, when in a hunting park an underwood was to be established for game cover. The treatment of the coppice and methods of sowing and planting were well understood, in spite of the lack of natural sciences. Whatever forestry practice existed was based merely on empirical observations, and was taught in the books on agriculture as part of farm practice. Silviculture was mainly developed in connection with the coppice, which was systematically practiced for the purpose of growing vineyard stakes, especially with chestnut, castanetum, oak, quercetum, and willow, salicetum, while the arbustum denoted the plantings of trees for the support of grapes, and incidentally for the foliage used as cattle feed, still in vogue in modern Italy. This planting of vine supports was done with saplings of elm, poplar, and some other species, by pollarding and by a well-devised system of pruning. These were gradually prepared and maintained in proper form for their purpose. The coppice seems to have been systematically managed in Attica, as well as in Italy in regular fellings the mild climate producing sprouts and root suckers readily without requiring much care, even conifers, cypress and fir, reproducing in this manner. The oak coppice was managed in seven-year rotation, the chestnut in five-year, and the willow in three-year rotation. Yield and profitableness were discussed, and the practice of thinnings is known, but only for the purpose of removing and using the dead material. Forest protection was poorly developed, of insects little, of fungi no knowledge existed, hand-picking was applied against caterpillars, also ditches into which the beetles were driven and then covered, the use of hogs in fighting insects was also known. That goats were undesirable in the woods had been observed, some remarkable precocious physiological knowledge or rather philosophy existed. It was recognized that frost produces drought, and that a remedy is to loosen the soil, aerating the roots, to drain or water as the case might require, and to prune, but also sapletting was prescribed. Against hail, dead owls were to be hung up. Against ants, which were deemed injurious, ashes with vinegar were to be applied, or else an ass's heart. Curiosities in wood technology were rife, and many contradictions among the wood sharps existed, as in our times. Only four elements, earth, water, fire, air, composed all bodies. The more fire in the composition of a wood, the more readily it would decay. Spruce, being composed of less earth and water but more fire and air, is therefore lighter than oak, which mostly composed of earth, is therefore so durable. But the latter warps and develops season splits because, on account of its density, it cannot take up readily and resists the penetration of moisture. Wood impregnation, supposed to be a modern invention, was already practiced. Cedrium, cedar oil, being used as well as a tar coating or immersion in seawater for one year to secure greater durability. 4. Literature as regards literature, we find in Greece, besides what can be learned incidentally from the historians Herodotus and Xenophon, and from the natural history of Aristotle, the first work on plant history and wood technology, if not forestry in 18 volumes by Theophrastus, 390-286 BC, a pupil of Aristotle and Plato. 
Among the Romans, besides a number of historians, at least three writers before Christ discussed in detail agriculture and in connection with it tree culture, namely Cato, 234 to 149 BC, who wrote an excellent work, De Re Rustica, in 162 chapters. Faro, 116 to 26 BC, also De Re Rustica, in three books, and Virgilius Maro, 70 to 19 BC, who, in his Georgica, records in six books the state of knowledge at that time. Of the many writers on these subjects who came in the Christian era, there are also three to be mentioned, namely Cassius Plinius Major, 2379 AD, who in his Historia Naturalis in 37 books discusses also the technique of silviculture, Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella, about 50 AD, with 12 books, De Re Rustica and one book, De Arboribus, the former being the best work of the ancients on the subject, and Palladius, writing about 350 AD, 13 books, De Re Rustica, which in the original and in translations was read until past the Middle Ages. Only a few references which exhibit the state of knowledge on arboricultural subjects among the Romans, as shown in this literature, may be cited, some of which knowledge was also developed in Greece and found application, more or less, throughout the Roman Empire from India to Spain. Nursery practice was already well known to Cato, while Varro knew, besides sowing and planting, the art of grafting and layering, and Columella discusses in addition pruning and pollarding, which latter was practiced for securing fuel wood, and the propriety of leaving the pruned trees two years to recuperate before applying the knife again. The method of wintering acorns and chestnuts in sand, working them over every thirty days and separating the poor seed by floating in water, was known to Columella, and, indeed, he discusses nursery management with minute detail, even the advantages of transplants and of doubly transplanted material. The question whether to plant or to sow, the preference of fall or spring planting with distinction for different species and localities are matters under his consideration, and preference of sowing oak and chestnut instead of transplanting is pointed out and supported by good reasons. Pliny, the Humboldt of the ancients, recognizes tolerance of different species, the need of different treatment for different species, the desirability of transplanting to soil and climatic conditions similar to those to which the tree was accustomed, and of placing the trees as they stood with reference to the sun. But, to be sure, he also has many curious notions, as, for instance, his counsel to set shallow-rooted trees deeper than they stood before, his advice not to plant during rain or windy weather, and his laying much stress on the phases of the moon as influencing results. While then the ancients were not entirely without silvicultural knowledge, indeed, possessed much more than is usually credited to them, the need of a forest policy and of a systematic forest management in the modern sense had not arisen in their time. The mild climate reducing the necessity of fuel wood, and the accessibility by water to sources of supply for naval and other construction, delaying the need for forest production at home. There is little doubt that some of the agricultural and silvicultural knowledge and practice of the Romans found entrance among the German tribes, who especially the Alemanni came into contact with the Romans in their civilized surroundings during the 4th century. End of section 2 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 3 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Germany. Besides a dozen or more earlier histories of forestry in Germany, some of which date back to the beginning of the 19th century, there are two excellent modern compilations, namely Geschichte des Waldeigentums und der Waldwirtschaft und Forstwissenschaft in Deutschland by August Bernhardt, 1872-75, to 
three volumes, 1,062 pages, a classic which treats especially extensive of political and economic questions having a bearing on the development of forestry, and Handbuch der Forst- und Jagdgeschichte Deutschlands by Adam Schwabach, 1886, two volumes, 892 pages, which appeared as a second edition of Bernhardt's history, abridging the political history and expanding the forestry part. This volume has been mainly followed in the following presentation of the subject. In condensed form, this history is also to be found in Lorry's Handbuch der Forstwissenschaft, 1888, volume 1, pages 143 to 210. In Schwabach's history, a full list of original sources is enumerated. These are, for the oldest period, Roman writings which are unreliable, the laws of the various German tribes, the laws of kings, capitularia, the laws of villages and other territorial districts, weist humor, judgments, inventories of properties, especially of churches and cloisters, documents of business transactions and chronicles. For the time after the Middle Ages, the most important source is found in the forest ordinances of princes and other forest owners, forest laws, police orders, business documents, and finally, special literature. It is generally conceded that both the science and art of forestry are most thoroughly developed and most intensively applied throughout Germany. It must, however, not be understood that perfection has been reached anywhere in the practical application of the art, or that the science, which, like that of medicine, has been largely a growth of empiricism, is in all parts safely based, nor are definitely settled forest policies so entrenched that they have become immutable. On the contrary, there are still mismanaged and unmanaged woods to be found, mainly those in the hands of farmers and other private owners. There are still even in well-managed forests practices pursued which are known not to conform to theoretical ideals, and others which lack a sure scientific foundation. And while the general policy of conservative management and of state interest in the same is thoroughly established, the methods of attaining the results are neither uniform throughout the various states which form the German Federation, nor positively settled anywhere. In other words, the history of forestry is still, even in this most advanced country, in the stage of lively development. For the student of forestry, the history of its development in Germany is of greatest interest, not only because his art has reached here the highest and most intensive application, but because all the phases of development through which other countries have passed, or else will eventually have to pass, are here exemplified. And many, if not most, of the other countries of the world have more or less followed German example, or have been at least influenced by German precedent. There is hardly a policy or practice that has not at some time, in some part, been employed in the fatherland of forestry. One reason for this rich historical background is the fact that Germany has never been a unit, that from its earliest history it was broken up into many independent, and until modern times, only loosely associated units, which developed differently in social, political, and economic direction. This accounts also for the great variety of conditions existing even today in the 26 principalities which form the German Empire. Politically, it may be mentioned that out of the very many independent principalities into which the German territory had been divided, variable in number from time to time, the 26 which had preserved their autonomy formed in 1871 the Federation of States known as the German Empire. Each of these has its own representative government, including the Forest Administration, very much like the state governments of the United States. Only the army and navy, tariff, posts, telegraphs, criminal law and foreign policy, and a few other matters are under the direct jurisdiction of the empire, 
represented in the Reichstag, the Bundesrat, and the Emperor. The 208,830 square miles of territory, which supports a population of about 60 million people, still contain a forest area of around 35 million acres, 26% of the land, or 0.61 acre per capita, which although largely under conservative management has long ago ceased to supply by its annual increment, somewhat over 50 cubic feet per acre, the needs of the population, the imports during the last 50 years since 1862, when Germany began to show excessive imports over exports, having grown in volume at the average rate of 10% to now round 380 million cubic feet, $45 million, or nearly 15% of the consumption. The larger part of Germany, two-thirds of the territory and population, is controlled by modern Prussia, with a total forest area of 20 million acres, Bavaria comes next with one-seventh of the land area and six million acres of forest. The five larger states of Württemberg, Baden, Saxony, Mecklenburg, and Hesse occupying together another seventh of the territory with five million acres of forest. The balance of the area is divided among the other nineteen states. Fifty percent of Germany, roughly speaking, is plains country, the larger part in the northern and eastern territory of Prussia. 25% is hill country, mostly in west and middle Germany, and 25% is mountain country, the larger portion in the southern states. There are at best only five species of timber of high economic general importance, the scotch pine, which covers large areas in the northern sandy plain, and the lighter soils in the south the Norway spruce, and silver fir, which form forests in the southwestern and other mountain regions and represent, in mixture with broadleaf forest, a goodly proportion in the northeastern lowlands. The English oak, of which botanically two species are recognized, and the beech. The last two are the most important hardwoods found throughout the empire, but especially highly developed in the west and southwest. In addition, there are half a dozen species of minor or more local importance, but the five mentioned form the basis of the forestry systems. The history of development of forestry in Germany may be divided into periods variously. Bernhardt recognizes six periods. Schwabach makes four divisions, namely the first from the earliest times to the end of the Carlovingians, 9-11 which is occupied mainly with the development of forest property conditions, the second to the end of the Middle Ages, 1500, during which the necessity of forest management begins to be sporadically recognized, the third to the end of the 18th century, during which the foundation for the development of all branches of forestry is laid, the fourth, the modern period, accomplishing the complete establishment of forestry methods in all parts of Germany, for the later historian, it would be proper to recognize a fifth period from about 1863, when, by the establishment of experiment stations, a breaking away from the merely empiric basis to a more scientific foundation of foresty practice was begun. For our purposes, we shall be satisfied with a division into three periods, namely, first, to the end of the Middle Ages, when, with the discoveries of America and other new countries, an enlargement of the world's horizon gave rise to a change of economic conditions. Second, to the end of the 18th century, when change of political and economic thought altered the relation of peoples and countries. Third, the modern period, which exhibits the practical fruition of these changes. Part 1 from earliest times to end of Middle Ages. Many of the present conditions, especially those of ownership, as well as the progress in the development both of forest policy and of forest management, can be understood only with some knowledge of the early history of the settlement of the country. 
As is well known, Aryan tribes from Central Asia had more than a thousand years before Christ begun to overrun the country. These belonged to the Celtic, Celtic or Gaelic race, which had gradually come to occupy partly or wholly France, Spain, northern Italy, the western part of Germany, and the British Islands. They were followed by the Germani, supposedly a Celtic word meaning neighbor or brother, also Aryan tribes who appeared at the Black Sea about 1000 BC, in Switzerland and Belgium about 100 BC. These were followed by the Slovenes, Slovaks, or Vents, crowding on behind, disputing and taking possession of the lands left free by or conquered from the Germani. Through these migrations, by about 400 AD, the whole of Western Europe seems to have been fully peopled with these tribes of hunters and herders. The mixture of the different elements of victors and vanquished led to differentiation into three classes of people, economically and politically speaking, namely the free, the unfree, serfs or slaves, and the freedmen, an important distinction in the development of property rights. 1. Development of Property Conditions the German tribes who remained conquerors were composed of the different groups of Franks, Saxons, Thuringians, Bajuvarians, Burgundians, etc., each composed of families aggregated into communal hordes with an elected duke, dukes, herzog, graf, fürst. Organized for war, each in itself a socialistic and economic organization known as Mach, owning a territory in common, the members or Machgenossen forming a republic. Outside of house, yard, and garden, there was no private property. The land surrounding the settlement known as Almand, commons, was owned in common but assigned in parcels to each family for field use, the assignment first changing from year to year, then becoming fixed. The outlying woods, known as Maka or Grenzwald, forming a debatable ground with the neighboring tribes, were used in common for hunting, pasturing, fattening of hogs by the oak mast, and for other such purposes, rather than for the wood of which little was needed. In return for the assignment of the fields, the freemen, who alone were fully recognized citizens of the community, had to fulfill the duties of citizens, and especially of war service. Only gradually, by partition, immigration, and uneven numerical development, was the original mock or differentiation into family associations destroyed, and a more heterogeneous association of neighbors substituted. At the same time, inequality of ownership arose especially from the fact that those who owned a larger number of slaves, the conquered race, had the advantage in being able to clear and cultivate more readily new and rough forest ground. Those with slaves would seek assistance from those more favored, exchanging for rent or service their rights to use the land. Out of this relationship a certain vassalage and inequality of political rights developed. Under the influence of Roman doctrine, a new aspect regarding newly conquered territory gained recognition, by which the dukes, as representatives of the community, laid claim to all unceded or unappropriated land. They then distributed to their followers or donated to the newly established church portions of this land, so that by the year 900 AD a complete change in property relations had been effected. By that time, the large baronial estates of private owners had come into existence which were of such great significance in the economic history of the Middle Ages, changing considerably the status of the free men, and changing the free mock societies into communities under the dominion of the barons. The first real king, who did not, however, assume the title, was Clovis, a duke of the Franks who had occupied the Lower Rhine country. About 500 A.D., picking a quarrel with his neighbors, the Alamanni, he subdued them and aggrandized himself by taking their mock. 
In this way, he laid the foundation for a kingdom which he extended by conquest, mainly to the westward, but also by strategy to the eastward, the warlike tribes of Saxons and other Germans conceding in a manner the leadership of the Franks. A real kingdom, however, did not arise until Charlemagne in 772 became the ruler, extending his government far to the east. At times, the kingdom was divided into the western Neustria and the eastern Austria, and then again united, but it was only when the dynasty of Charlemagne became extinct with the death of Louis the Child, 911, that the final separation of France was effected, and Germany became a separate kingdom, the eastern tribes between the Rhine and Elba choosing their own king, Conrad, Duke of Franconia. There were then five tribes or nations, each under its own duke and its own laws, comprising this new kingdom, namely the Franks, Swabians, Bavarians, Saxons on the right, and Lorrainers on the left bank of the Rhine, while the country east of the Elba River was mostly occupied by Slovenians. With Clovis began the new order of things, which was signalized by the aggrandizement of kings, dukes, and barons. In addition to the rule regarding the ownership of unceded lands, there developed also, under Roman law doctrine, the conception of seniorial right, i.e., the power of the king to jurisdiction over his property. This right, first claimed by the duke or king for himself, is then transferred with the territory, given to his friends and vassals who thereby secure for themselves his powers and jurisdiction, immunity from taxes and from other duties, as well as the right to exact taxes and services from others, the favored growing into independent knights and barons. The forest, then, originally was communal property, and the feeling of this ownership in common remains even to the present day. Indeed, actually it remained in most cases so until the 13th century, although the changes noted had their origins in the 7th century, when the kings began to assert their rights of princely superiority. In these earlier ages, the main use of the forests was for the hunt, the mast and the pasture, and, since wood was relatively plentiful, forest destruction was the rule. Those who became possessed of larger properties through the causes mentioned tried to secure an increased value of their possessions by colonization, in which especially the slaves or serfs were utilized. These often became freedmen, paying rent in product or labor, and acquiring the rights of usufruct in the property, out of which developed the so-called servitudes or rights of user, the Pradium of the Romans, a limited right to use the property of another. With the development of private property, there naturally also developed the right of preventing the hunting on such lands, this being then their main use. This exclusive right to the chase or hunt we find recognized as part of the property of the kings and barons in the 8th century, when the kings forbade trespass under penalty of severe fines. The king's ban or interdiction of 60 shillings being imposed upon the trespassers. Indeed, by the end of the 8th century, the word forst, wurst, foresta, which until then had been used merely to denote the king's property, was exclusively used to designate not necessarily woodland, the latter being referred to as Silva or Nemus, but any territory in which the hunt had been reserved. This right to reserve the chase and the fishing, that is, to establish ban forests, was in the 10th century extended by the kings to territory not belonging to them, the right to the chase being according to the Roman doctrine a regal right over any property. Under this conception, fields and pastures, woods and waters, and whole villages with their inhabitants became in forested grounds. 
the Norman kings, imbued with a passion for the chase, exercised this right widely, especially in England. The forests of Dean, Epping, and the New Forest, being such in forested territories, the inhabitants of which were placed under special forest laws and a judging by special forest courts. Presently, the king's right of ban was granted with the land grants to his barons and to the clergy. Ban forests also grew up through owners of properties placing themselves and their possessions under the protection of kings or bishops or other powerful barons and giving in exchange this hunting right and in various other ways at the same time the headmen of the mock obermacher graf waldgraf who from being elected officers of the people had become officials of the king began to exercise by virtue of their office the jurisdiction of the king and declaring the ban for their own or their friend's benefit excluded the Maka from their ancient right to hunt and fish freely over the territory of the mock while in this way the freedom of the communal owners was undermined the institution of ban forests was nevertheless its value in that it led to forest protection restriction in forest use, and restriction in clearing. All this, to be sure, merely for the benefit of the chase. Special officers to guard the rights of the king, forestorii, chosen from the free and freedmen, and also superior officers, forest masters, were instituted to administer the chase and enforce the restrictions which went with it. Gradually, with the loss of property rights, there came also a change in the political rights of the Merke or commoners, through the large barons interfering with self-government, assuming for themselves the position of Obermerke, appointing the officials and issuing strict forest ordinances to regulate the cutting of wood. Finally, the original right which belonged to every commoner of supplying himself with wood material became dependent upon permission in each case, and thus his title to ownership became doubtful. Undoubtedly, also through the influence of Roman institutions with which the Franks under their Merovingian kings came into close contact, there arose that social and political institution which became finally known as feudal system by the grants of lands which the kings made out of their estates to their kinsmen and followers with the understanding that they would be faithful and render service to their masters a peculiar relationship grew up based on land tenure the land so granted being called a fief or feud and the relationship being called vassality or vassalage this vassalage denoted the personal tie between the grantor and the grantee, the lord and the vassal, the lord having the obligation to defend the vassal, and the vassal to be a faithful follower of his lord. Similar relationships arose from the surrender by landowners of their estates to the church, or to other powerful barons, to be received back again as fiefs, and to be held by them as tenants in exchange for rent or service. In this way, a complete organization of society developed in which, from the king down to the lowest landowner, all were bound together by obligation of service and defense, both the defense and service being regulated by the nature and extent of the fief. Finally, all kinds of property of whatever nature, as well as official positions which would give an income, were subject to be treated as fiefs. The obligations of the recipient were of various nature, but finally service in army or court became the main one, giving rise to the class of knights, ritter, or barons, while the fiefs to the small farmer gave rise to the class of peasants, Bauern, this name appearing first in 1106 under Conrad II. The fiefs of the higher class, while at first given only to the individual, became early, 
hereditary, and hereditary succession to estates and offices generally became the rule. A promogenture in the succession to the estates did then not, as in England, prevail in Germany. Instead, either tenancy in common or else equal division among the sons was practiced. As a result, the very many small principalities came into existence in the 14th and 15th centuries, these growing smaller and smaller by subdivision. The first to institute the promogenture rule by law was the House of Brandenburg in the 15th century. In addition to the class of peasants and knights, there came into existence a third class, the burghers, when, by the order of Conrad I in the beginning of the 10th century, towns were built with walls and towers for defense against the encroachments of the Huns, who endangered the eastern frontier mock. In order to encourage the settlement of these towns, any slave moving to town was declared a free man, and the cities became free republics. Gifts of land, including forest areas, were made to the cities and the development of industries was encouraged in every way. These cities, favored by the kings, and having become rich and powerful in the later quarrels of the kings with the lawless nobility, gave loyal support with money and arms. In return for their loans, the forest properties of the kings were often mortgaged to the burghers, and failing of redemption were often forfeited to them. In this way, and through purchases, the city forests came into existence. Still, other property conditions arose when, under Otto the Great, 960, colonization of the eastern country beyond the Elba was pushed. In these cases, the mock institution was absent. Although the colonists did often become part owners in the king's forest, or acquired parts of it as common property, or else secured rights of user in the nearest royal forest. By the end of the period, due to these various developments, a great variety of property conditions in forest areas had developed, most of which continue to the present time, namely royal properties, which by the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th were in part to become state property, princely and lordly possessions under separate jurisdiction, with or without entail, and mostly encumbered with rights of user, allodial possessions, held independent of rent or service, municipal possessions owned by city corporations, communal properties, the remnants of the mock, and farmers' woodlots, Bauernwald, resulting from partitions of the mock. All these changes from the original communal property conditions did not, of course, take place without friction, the opposition often taking shape in peasants' revolts, hundreds of thousands of these being killed in their attempts to preserve their commons, forests, and waters free to all, to re-establish their liberty to hunt, fish, and cut wood, and to abolish tithes, serfdom, and duties. 2. Forest Treatment As stated, the German tribes which settled the country were herders and hunters, who only gradually developed into farmers while the country was being settled. At first, therefore, as far as the forest did not need to give way to farmlands, its main use was in the exercise of the chase and for pasture, and especially for the raising and fattening of hogs, the number of hogs which could be driven into a forest serving as an expression of the size of such a forest. Oak and beech furnishing the mast were considered the preferable species. It is natural, therefore, that wood being plentiful and the common property of all, the first regulation of forest use had reference to these. Now, minor benefits of forest property, as for instance the prohibition of cutting mast trees, which was enforced in early times. The first extensive regulation of forest use came, however, from the exercise of the royal right of the ban, and merely for the avowed purpose of protecting the chase. Real forest management, however, did not exist. 
the forestarii mentioned in these early times being nothing but policemen, guarding the hunting rights of the kings or other owners. The conception that wood on the stump was of the same nature as other property and its removal, theft, had not yet become established. Quia non res possessa sed deligno agitor, wood not being a possessed thing, a conception which still pervades the laws of modern times to some extent. The necessity of clearing farmlands for the growing population continued, even in the western, more densely populated sections, into the 12th and 13th century. The cloisters were especially active in colonizing and making farmland with the use of axe and fire, such cloisters being often founded as mere land speculations. Squatters, as with us, were a frequent class of colonists, and in eastern Prussia continued even into the 17th and 18th centuries to appropriate forest land without regard to property rights. The disturbed ownership conditions which we have traced led also often to wasteful slashing, especially in the western territory, while colonization among the Slavs of the eastern sections led to similar results. In the twelfth century, however, here and there appear the first signs of greater necessity for regulating and restricting forest use in the mock forest, and for improvement in forest conditions with the purpose of ensuring wood supplies. In that century, division of the mock forest begins for the alleged reason that individual ownership would lead to better management and less devastation. In the 12th and 13th centuries also, stricter order in the fellings and in forest use was insisted upon in many places. In the forest ordinances of the princes and barons, which, of course, have always reference to limited localities, we find prescriptions like the following. The amount to be cut is to be limited to the exact needs of each family, and the proper use of the wood is to be inspected. The timber is to be marked, must be cut in a given time, and be removed at once. Only dry wood is to be used for fuel, and the place and time for gathering it is specially designated. Similar to the present practice, the best oak and beech are to be preserved, this, however, merely with reference to the mast, and in the Alps we find already provisions to reserve larch and pine. The charcoal industry is favored because of easier transportation of its product, but permitted only under special precautions. Bark peeling and burning for potash is forbidden. The pasture is regulated with regard to the young growth, and sheep and goats are excluded. Such measures are, to be sure, found only here and there where local conditions give rise to a fear of a timber famine. Such communities may also be found making attempts to protect themselves against reduction of home supplies by forbidding the export of wood from their territory. An amusing restriction of this kind is found at Altenstadt, where the bakers were forbidden to bake bread for any but the citizens of the town. The first ordinance prohibiting for clearings is found at Losch in the Rhenish country in 1165, and other ordinances with such prohibition are on record in other parts in the 13th century. In 1237 at Salzburg, clearings were prohibited in the interest of the salt mines, quote, so that the cut forest may grow up to wood again, unquote and also in other parts where mining interests made a special demand for props or charcoal, the regulation of forest use was begun early. The difficulties of transportation and the absence of roads rendered local supply of more importance than at present, and this accounts for the early measures to secure more economical use while distant woods were still plentiful but unavailable while in the 12th and 13th centuries a merely restrictive and regulative or else a let-alone policy quote, allowing the wood to grow up unquote, 
prevailed. We find in the 14th century the first beginnings of an attempt at forest extension or recuperation. In 1309, Henry VII ordered the reforestation of a certain stripped area by sowing. Of the execution of this order, we have no record, but the first actually executed plantation on record is that by the city of Nuremberg in 1368, where several hundred acres of burned area were sowed with pine, spruce, and fir. And there is also a record that in 1449 this crop was harvested. In 1420, the city of Frankfurt on the Main followed this example, relying on the Nuremberg seed dealer, whose correspondence is extant and who was invited to go to Frankfurt for advice how to proceed. He sowed densely in order to secure clear bowls, but expressed the opinion that the plants could not be transplanted. He also relied on the phases of the moon for his operations. The planting of hardwoods seems to have been begun much later, the first reference to it coming from the cloister and city of Selingenstadt, which agreed in 1491 to reforest annually 20 to 30 acres with oak. Natural regeneration by coppice was in quite general practice and proved satisfactory enough for few wood production. The system of coppice with standards was also frequently practiced, the standards 20 or 30 to the acre being, quote, reserved for the Lord, unquote. In the timber forest, the unregulated selection system was continued generally throughout the period, although in 1454 we find in the Hartz Mountains a transition to a seed tree management a few seed trees or groups of seed trees being left on the otherwise cleared area, somewhat in the manner of the French méthode à terre à terre. Toward the end of the 15th century, we find here and there a distinction made between timber forest, where no firewood is to be cut, and leaf forest, which is to serve the latter purpose and is to be treated as coppice. Toward the end of the period, we find, however, various provisions which are unquestionably dictated by the fear of a scarcity of timber. The discovery that pasture prevents natural regeneration led to a prohibition of pasturing in the newly cut felling areas. In 1488, we find already a diameter limit of 12 inches, just as is being advocated in the United States now, as a basis for conservative exploitation. The city of Brunswick buying stumpage and in the contract being limited to this diameter and, in addition, obligated to leave 15 oaks or aspen per acre for seed trees. Attempts at regulating the use of a given forest by division into felling areas are recorded in 1359, when the city forest of Erfurt, 286 acres, was divided into seven felling areas. It is questionable whether this referred to a coppice with short rotation, or whether a selection forest with seven periodic areas is meant. We see, then, that the first sporadic and, to be sure, crude beginnings of a forest management in Germany may be traced back to the 14th and 15th centuries but it took at least 250 to 350 years before such management became general. Outside of the information found scattered in forest ordinances, instructions, and prescriptions of various kinds, there is no forestry literature to be recorded from this period, except one single book, published about the year 1300 by an Italian Petrus de Crescentiis, which was translated into German. It was merely a scholastic compilation on agriculture and allied subjects, mostly cribbed from old Roman writers and without value for German conditions. End of section 3. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.
Section 4 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Germany, Part 2. First Development of Forestry Methods, Period 1500 to 1800. The period following the Middle Ages marks the gradual changes from the feudal system to the modern state organizations, and to considerable change of ownership conditions and forest treatment. Various causes which led to an increased development of industrial life were also instrumental in hastening the progress of forest destruction. At the same time, during this period, the germs and embryonic beginnings of every branch of forestry, real forestry policy, forestry practice, and forestry science are to be noted. By the end of this period, Preparatory to more modern conditions, we find organized technical forest administrations, well-developed methods of silviculture, and systems of forest management. 1. Development of Forest Property Conditions A number of changes in the conceptions of political relations, in methods of life and of political economy, brought further changes in property conditions on the same lines as those prevailing in the 14th and 15th centuries, these changes were especially influenced by the spread of Roman law doctrine regarding the rights of the governing classes, by the growth of the cities favoring industrial development and changing methods of life, by the change from barter to money management favored by the discovery of America, by other world movements, and by the resulting changes in economic theory. Through the discovery of the New World and the influx of gold and silver that came with it gave impetus to industry and commerce of the cities. The rapid increase of money capital increased extravagance and induced a desire for amassing wealth, which changed modes of life, changed policies and systems of political economy. The fiscal policy of the many little principalities was dominated by a desire to get a good balance of trade by fostering exports of manufacturers, but forbidding exports of raw materials like forest products, also by forbidding imports, subsidizing industries, fixing prices by law, and taking in general an inimical attitude towards outsiders except in so far as they sent gold and silver into the country. This so-called mercantilistic system, which saw wealth not in labor and its products, but in hoarded gold and silver, had also full sway in England under Cromwell and in France under Colbert's influence. This fiscal policy, which was bent upon bringing cash into the country, led under the direction of servile officials to oppressive measures. A reaction naturally followed when it was pointed out that the real wealth of a nation lies in its natural resources and in its labor. But this so-called physiocratic doctrine had little practical influence except to prepare men's minds for the reception of the teachings of Adam Smith at the end of the period. The doctrine of the Roman law, deified by the jurists and commentators, undermined the national conceptions and institutions of free citizenship and of existing property relations. Courts, legislation, and administration were subject to their sway, and this influence lasted, in spite of reactions, until the end of the 18th century. Under it, the doctrine of the imperium, the seigneurage or superior power of the princes, Hoheitsrecht, was further developed into the dominium terre, in other words, superior ownership of all the land, which gives rise to the title and the exercise of the function of Landesherren, masters of the land, and confers the privilege of curtailing and even discontinuing private property rights. To sustain their position in each of the state units, a restriction of the autonomy of churches and cloisters, of the mock and of the vassals, became needful to the princes. This was secured by taking the first under their protection, by making themselves obermarkers, and by changing vassals who held office in fief to employees beamte. For a time, the three privileged classes of prelates, knights, and burghers, combined in the Landstand or Landtag, participated in some of the functions of government, 
especially in raising and administering taxes, but by the second half of the 14th century the princes had become absolute, and the doctrine of the Hoheitsrecht was firmly established. Under this doctrine the historic position of the mock is perverted, and instead of being the common property of the people, it becomes the property of the prince, on which he graciously permits the usufruct, for forest, pasture, and water, vault, vida, vasa, are res publicie, hence ownerless and at the disposal of the king. Through this new construction of relationship, as well as through the same machinations and tricks which the princes as Obermerker, or headmen of the mark, had employed during the foregoing period in usurping power, and partly through voluntary dissolution, was the decadence of the social, economic, and political organization of the mock gradually completed. The original usufruct of a property held in common is explained in the Roman sense as a precarium, or servitude, and from being a right of the whole organization becomes a right of the single individual or group of individuals. In this way, the socialistic basis of the mock is destroyed. Through the exercise of the Forsthoheit, in other words, the superior right of the prince over all forest property, by the appointment of the officials instead of their election, by issuance of ordinances, in short, by the usurpation of the legislative and police power, the political power of the mock is broken and the Thirty Years' War completes the breakdown. The pride of the burgher and the peasant is gone, their autonomy destroyed, and their economic and political organizations sink into mere corporations based on land tenure, which, according to Roman doctrine, come under the regulation of the state or prince. The nobility move into the cities and leave the administration of their estates to officials, who are constantly pressed to furnish the means for the extravagant life of their masters. These in turn harass and oppress the peasantry, who finally become bondsmen, gutsherrich, bound to the glebe, and lose their independence entirely. These briefly are the steps by which the changes social and economic progressed. Reforms in this situation of the peasantry began first in Prussia in 1702, when bondage was abolished for all those who could purchase their houses and farms from the gentry. As few had the means to do so, the result was the creation of a proletariat, hitherto unknown because, under the old feudal system, the lord had to feed his impoverished bondsmen from which he was now absolved. Changes in forest property in particular were brought about by the increase of princely property through the various methods of exercising the seigniorage, especially after the Thirty Years' War, ownerless tracts falling under this right were plentiful. In addition, wherever wastelands grew up to wood, they were claimed by the princes. Quote, Wenn das Holz dem Ritter reicht an den Sporn, hat der Bauer sein Recht verloren. When wood has grown up to the spur of the night, the peasant has lost his right. Some additions came from the secularization of church and cloister property, and others by the slices which the princes of Obermerker secured from the mock forest by various artifices. It is these properties, which in Prussia were turned over by the king to the state in 1713, and by other princes, not until the 19th century. The same means which the princes employed were used by the landed gentry, to increase their holdings especially at the expense of the mark, from which in their capacity of Obermerke they secured portions by force or intrigue. The peasants' forest property, the mock forest, had by the 19th century been almost entirely dismembered, part having come into the hands of the princes and barons, part having been divided among the Merke, and part having become corporation forest in the modern sense. Partition had become desirable when the restrictions of use which were ordered for the good of the forest became unendurable under the rigid rule of appointed officials, but the expected improvement in management which was looked for from partition and private ownership was never realized. After the Thirty Years' War, the free cities were impoverished and their autonomy undermined by Roman doctrine. From free republics they became mere corporations under the supervision of appointed officials, 
and experienced decadence in political as well as material directions. Hence, no increase in city forest took place except through division of the mock forest in which cities had been co-owners and through secularized properties of cloisters. The worst feature, from the standpoint of forest treatment, which resulted from these changes in property conditions and relationship, was the growth of the pernicious servitudes, or rights of user, which were either conferred to propitiate the powerless but dangerous peasantry, or evolved out of the feudal relations. From the 16th to the 19th centuries, these servitudes grew to such an extent that in almost every forest, someone outside of the owner had the right to use parts of it, either the pasture or the litter, or certain classes or sizes of wood. These rights have proved the greatest impediment to the progress of forestry until most recent times, and only within the last few decades have the majority of them been extinguished by legal process or compromise. 2. Forest Conditions Under the exercise of these various rights and the uncertainty of property conditions, the forest conditions naturally deteriorated continuously until the end of the 18th century. The virgin woods were called of their wealth and then grew up to brush, as is usual in the United States. Every forest ordinance began with complaints regarding the increasing forest devastation and predicted a timber famine in view of the increasing population, increasing industry and commerce, and hence increased wood consumption especially along the water routes which furnish the means of transportation the available supplies were ruthlessly exploited more serious enemies than the exploitation of the timber proved the pasturing of cattle the removal of the litter and above all the fires towards the end of the sixteenth century ordinances against forest fires began to be enacted yet as late as seventeen seventy eight the necessity of keeping the rides or fire lanes open in the forests of eastern Prussia is justified by the statement that, quote, otherwise the still constantly recurring fires could not be checked. At another place it is stated that, quote, not a single acre of forest could be found in the province that had not been burnt in former or later times, and that, quote, the people are still too much accustomed to the ruthless use of fires, so that no punishment can stop them. Other causes of devastation were the Thirty Years' War, the wars of the 18th century, and the loss of interest in the forest by the peasants after the collapse of the mock. These had often to steal what they needed, and their depredations were increased by the desire to revenge themselves on the landed proprietors for the oppressions to which they were subjected. The increase in game, which was fostered by the landed gentry, did much damage to the young growths, and the increase in the living expenses of the nobility, who mostly abandoned country for town, had to be met by increased exploitation. By the end of the Middle Ages, the reduction of forest area had proceeded so far that it was generally believed desirable to restrict the making of clearings to exceptional necessities except in the northeastern parts and in the distant mountain districts. Yet, a growing population increased the need for farmland, and since intensive use of the existing farm area was not attempted until the end of the 18th century, the forest had to yield still further. 3. Methods of Restriction in Forest Use all ordinances issued by the princes to regulate the management of their properties contain the prescription that permission of the Landesherr is necessary for clearings, and that abandoned fields growing up to wood are to be kept as woodland, this partly for timber needs, partly for considerations of the chase. Still, Frederick the Great, in colonizing East Prussia, expressed himself to the effect that he cared more for men than for wood, and enjoined his officials to colonize especially the woods far from water, which entailed even more waste of wood than where means of transportation allowed at least partial marketing. Improvident clearings proceeded even under his reign on the Frischen Nehrung between Danzig and Pilau, and started the shifting sands of that peninsula. 
in the absence of all knowledge as regards the extent to existing supplies or of the increment, and with poor means of transportation, at least local distress was imminent. To stave off a threatening timber scarcity, regulation in the use of wood was attempted by the forest ordinances, even to the extent of forbidding the hanging out of green bush to designate a drinking hall, or the cutting of may trees, similar to our crusade in the United States against the use of Christmas trees. A diameter limit to which trees might be permitted to be cut was also frequently urged. Regulation of forest use did not confine itself to the princely properties alone, but in the interest of the whole the restrictions were extended to all owners. These restrictions were directed either to the practice and the exploitation of the forest or in the use of the material. In the latter direction, the attempts at reducing the consumption of building timber are of special interest. Building inspectors were to approve building plans and inspect buildings to see that they were most economically constructed, that repairs were made promptly to avoid the necessity of more extensive ones, that new buildings replacing old ones were not built higher than the old ones. In Saxony, as early as 1560, it was ordered that the whole house must be built of stone, while elsewhere the building of stone base walls and the use of brick roofs instead of shingles was insisted upon. Even the number of houses in any community was restricted. Fences were to be supplanted by hedges and ditches. Economies in charcoal burning, in potash manufacture for glass works, and in the turpentine industry were prescribed. In about 1600, the burning of potash for fertilizer was forbidden entirely, but these laws proved unavailing. Even in fuel wood, a saving was to be effected by using only the poorer woods and windfalls, by instituting public bake ovens, still in use in Westphalia, by improving stoves, restricting the number of bathing rooms, etc. The consumption of fuel wood seems to have been enormous, for we find record of two hundred cords used by one family in a year, and of twelve hundred cords or more used by the court at Weimar during the same time. The substitution of turf and coal for firewood was ordered in some sections in 1697 and again in 1777, but practically not until 1780 did coal come in as a substitute. Tan bark peeling was also forbidden or only the use of bark of trees soon to be felled was allowed. For cooperage, only the top dry oak. For coffins, only soft wood, or, according to Joseph II of Austria, no wood but black cloth was to be used. In some parts of the country, the use of oak was restricted even as early as 1562. For regulating practices in the forest, the restrictions often took only the general form of forbidding devastation without specifying what that meant. Then, besides establishing a diameter limit and regulating pasture in order to protect young growth, excluding sheep and goats entirely, an attempt was made to secure at least orderly procedure in the fellings. Foresters were to designate what was to be cut even for firewood. Marking irons and hammers were employed for this purpose by the middle of the 15th century, usually two markings by forester and by inspector to check. And this designation by officials extended even into the private forests, where finally no felling was allowed without previous permission and designation by a forester. The use of the litter by the small farmers had grown to a large extent in these times, and it was thought desirable to stop it. But this aid to the poor peasant was so necessary that only regulating the gathering of it could be insisted upon. It must be understood that all these various attempts at securing a conservative forest use were by no means general, but refer to circumscribed territory, and much of it was only paper legislation without securing actual practice. 4. Development of Forest Policy with the beginning of the 18th century, we find, besides these prescriptions against wasteful use, and ordinances regulating the management of the properties of the princes, definite forest policies in some sections, 
having in view forest preservation and improvement of forest conditions, and also means of providing wood at moderate prices. Between the years 1550 and 1590, most of the German states had already enacted ordinances which had the force of general law exercising police functions over private forest property, although in Prussia this general legislation did not occur until 1720. The objects in view with this legislation were entirely of a material kind, the conservation of resources. Besides securing the rights of the Landesherr to the chase, it was to secure a conservative use of the princely as well as private forests, since devastation of the latter would require the former to be drawn on extravagantly. It was to stave off a timber famine, and in certain localities to assure particularly the mining industry of their wood supplies. There were, however, concessions made to the privileged and influential classes of forest owners. By the end of the 18th century, this forest police owing to the uncontrolled harshness and the grafting practices of the lower officials, had become the most hated and distasteful part of the administration. The argument of the protective influence of forest cover did not enter into this legislation. This argument belongs to the 19th century. Yet, Riboismont of Torrance had already, in 1788, been recognized as a proper public measure in German Austria, although active work in that direction was not begun until nearly a century later. The rise of prices during the 17th and 18th centuries had been very considerable, doubling, trebling, and even quadrupling in the first half of the 18th century. The mercantilistic doctrines of the time led, therefore, to attempts to keep prices low by prescribing rates for wood, and in general by restricting and regulating wood commerce. This was done especially by interdicting sale to outsiders, forbidding export from the small territory of the particular prince, or at least giving preference to the inhabitants of the territory as purchasers and at cheaper rates. Owing to the small size of the very many principalities, the free development of trade was considerably hampered by these regulations. Sometimes also wood imports were prohibited, as, for instance, in Württemberg, when, in 1740, widespread windfalls had occurred which had to be worked up and threatened to overstock the market. Wood depots under government control were established in large cities, and the amount of wood to be used per capita prescribed, as in Königsberg, 1702. In Berlin, in 1766, a monopoly of the fuel wood market was rented to a corporation, excluding all others except by permission of the company. This was in 1785 supplanted by government administration of the wood yards. Another such monopoly was created in the Nutzholzhandelsgesellschaft, Wookwood Sales Agency, for the export trade of building materials from Kermach and Magdeburg, which had prior right of purchase to all timber cut within given territory, the idea being to provide cheap material for the industries. This, too, came into the hands of the state in 1771. In Prussia, to prevent overcharges, the Jews were excluded from the wood trade in 1761. The exercise of Forsthoheit, princely supervision, originating in the ban forests and favored by the mercantilistic and absolutist ideas of the 17th and 18th centuries, gradually grew until the end of the 18th century to such an extent that the forest owners themselves were not allowed to cut a tree without sanction of some forest official, and could not sell any wood without permission, even down to hop poles, although the large landed property owners vigorously resisted this assumption of supervisory powers. Much discussion and argument regarding the origin of this right to supervision was carried on by the jurists upon the basis of Roman law doctrine, and it was proved by them to be of ancient date. The degree, however, to which this supervision was developed varied considerably in the different parts of the empire, according to different economic conditions. The interference and the protection of forests appeared more necessary, where advanced civilizations and denser population created greater need for it. We find, therefore, that the restrictive policy was much more developed in the southern and western territories than in the northern and eastern ones, where the development begins two centuries later.
The oldest attempts of controlling private forest property are found in Bavaria, 1516, Brunswick, 1590, and Württemberg, 1614. Here, forest properties were placed either entirely under the supervision of the princely forest administration, or at least permission for intended fellings had to be secured. Later, these restrictions were considerably reduced in rigor. Bavaria, 1789. In Prussia, private forest property remained free from government interference well into the 18th century. An edict by the great elector in 1670 merely inveighs against the devastation of forests by their owners, but refrains from any interference. And the Forst Ordnung of 1720 also contains only the general injunction to the owners not to treat their forests uneconomically. But... In 1766, Frederick the Great instituted a rigid supervision providing punishment for fellings beyond a special budget determined by experts. Soon after the French Revolution, however, unrestricted private ownership was re-established. Church and cloister property had always been severely supervised, similar to the mock and other communal forest property, under the direction either of specially appointed officials or the officials of the princes. Finally, in some sections, Hesse Kassel, 1711, Baden, 1787, the management of these communal forests was entirely undertaken by the government. In Prussia, by the order of 1754, the foresters of the state were charged with the supervision of the communal forests, in which they were to designate the trees to be felled and the cultures to be executed, but... As there was no pay connected with this additional duty, and the districts were too large, the execution of this supervision was but indifferently performed. In 1749, a special city forest order placed the city forests in Prussia under the provincial governments, requiring for their management the employment of a forester and the inspection of his work by the provincial forest master. 5. Personnel Although all this supervision was probably more or less lax, the possibility of more general and incisive influence was increasing because the personnel to whom such supervision could be entrusted was at last coming into existence. The men in whose hands at the beginning of the 18th century lay the task of developing and executing forest policies and of developing forestry practice came from two very different classes— the work in the woods fell naturally to the share of the huntsmen and forest guards, who by their practical life in the woods had secured some wood lore and developed some technical detail upon empiric basis. These so-called Holzgerecht Jäger, woodcrafty hunters, prepared for their duties by placing themselves under the direction of an established huntsman, who taught them what he knew about the rules of the chase while by questioning woodchoppers, colliers, etc., and by their own observation the knowledge of woodcraft was acquired. At the head of affairs stood the so-called camaralis, or chamber officials, men who had prepared themselves by the study of philosophy, law, diplomacy, and political economy for the positions of directors of finance and state administration. Rather ignorant of natural science and without practical forestry knowledge, their efforts were not always well directed. They deserve credit, however, for having collected into encyclopedic volumes the empiric knowledge of the practitioners of Holzgerechten, and for having elaborated it more or less successfully. In this work they were joined by some of the professors of Camaralia and law at the universities. By the middle of the 18th century, the hunters had so far grown in knowledge and education as to be able to produce their knowledge in books of their own. Quite a literature developed, full of acrimonious warfare of opinions, as is the rule where empiricism rules supreme. Notable progress, however, came only when hunting was placed in the background and more or less divorced from forest work. 6. Development of Silviculture in addition to the restrictive measures and attempts at mere conservative lumbering, without much thought of reproduction, there were as early as the 16th century silvicultural methods applied to secure or foster reproduction. 
Owing to differences in local conditions and difference in necessities, this development varied greatly in various sections as to the time it took place. The western and middle country practiced as early as the 16th century, what in the eastern country did not appear until the 18th century. The forest ordinances from which we derive our knowledge or inferences of these conditions prescribe, to be sure, many things that probably were not really put into practice. A. Natural Regeneration Was at first merely favored, without the adoption of any very positive measures to secure it, namely, by removing the cut wood within the year, so as to give young growth a chance of establishing itself, by removing the brush so as to not smother the young growth, by keeping out cattle from the young growth, Schnonung. If the selection method of lumbering, most generally practiced without much plan, did not produce any desirable result in reproduction, the clear cutting which was practiced without system, where charcoal manufacturing or river driving invited to it, did even less so. In either case, besides the defective and damaged old stubs which were left in the logging, a poor aftergrowth of undesirable character remained, as is the case in the American woods on so many areas. As early as 1524 and 1529, we have record of conscious attempt to secure a reproduction by leaving 10 to 30 seed trees per acre, but the result was disappointing, for this practice, being applied to the shallow-rooted spruce, produced the inevitable result, namely, the seed trees were thrown by the winds. This experience led to the prescription in 1565 in the Palatinate to leave, besides seed trees, parts of the other stand for protection against wind damage. Later, wind protection was sought by leaving parcels standing on all four sides, giving rise to a checkered board progress of fellings or a group system of reproduction, which by the middle of the 18th century had developed into the regular strip system applied in Austria 1766 to fir and spruce, and in Prussia 1764 to pine. And this marginal seeding method remained for a long time the favorite method for the conifers. To avoid long strips and distribute the fellings more conveniently, versus Berlepschen Kassel, recommended in 1760 the cutting in echelons, curtain method, Kulissenheib, which ensured better seeding but also increased danger from windfalls and was never much practiced, the disadvantages of the method being shown up especially in the Prussian Forest Order of 1788. In the first half of the 18th century, it was recognized that the wind danger would be considerably reduced by making the fellings progress from east or northeast to west. The conception of a regular, properly located felling series was first elaborated in the Harz Mountains in 1745 by von Langen, who also accentuated the necessity of preserving a wind mantle on exposed situations. Both of these propositions reappear in the Prussian Order of 1780, according to which fellings are to proceed in a breadth of 20 to 35 rods from east to west. The application of a nurse tree method for conifers was proposed in 1787 by V. Bergstorff, Prussia. A dark position, Dunkelschlag, and a regeneration period of seven years being advocated, in broadleaf forest, beside the selection forest, the natural result of the sprouting capacity of the hardwood had led to a coppice method, which was extensively relied upon for fuel production. This was rarely, however, a simple coppice, for intentionally or unintentionally, some seedlings or sprouts would be allowed to grow on, leading to a composite forest and finally to a regular coppice with standards, 1569, etc., with an intentional holding over of the valuable oak and ash for standards. Probably, however, large areas of unconsciously produced composite forest exhibited sad pictures of branchy overwood with suppressed underwood of poor sprouts, injured by game and cattle, a scrubby growth into which crept softwoods of birch and aspen. Attempts at pruning such scrub growths into shape on quite an extensive scale are on record. The recognition that more wood per acre could be secured by lengthening the rotation of the coppice, which seems to have been mostly twelve years or less, 
led to 20 and 30 year turns and finally to 50, 60 and even 80 year rotations or so-called polewood management, Brunswick 1745, also called Hochwald, high forest. A full description and working plan for such a forest to be managed in 80 year rotation, the city forest of Mainz in the Odenwald and Spessart mountains dates from 1773, and this polewood forest management became quite general after the middle of the 18th century, but in the last half of the 19th century it was generally replaced by the true high forest management under nurse trees, the experiences with the natural reproduction of conifer forest having proved the advantages of this method. The primitive beginnings of this so-called Femmelschlock method, compartment selection or shelterwood method, are found in 1720 in Hesse, Darmstadt, where Oberforstmeister von Minigerode prescribed regular fellings, progressing from north to south, in which all material down to polewood size, in selection or virgin forest, was to be removed, excepting only a number of clean bowls, one every ten to twelve paces being left for seed and nurse trees. The good results in reproduction stimulated owners of adjoining estates to imitate the method, 1737. The observation that in beech forest the young crop needed protection and succeeded better when gradually freed from the shade of the seed trees, especially on south and west aspects where drought, frost, and weeds are apt to injure it on sudden exposure, led to the elaboration of the principle of successive fellings. In the Ordinance of Hanau, as early as 1736, three grades of fellings were developed, the cutting for seed, the cutting for light, which was to begin when the crop was knee-high, and the removal cutting when the crop was high. This method spread rapidly and was further developed by the addition, in 1767, of a preparatory cutting to secure a desirable seedbed and by lengthening the period of regeneration and elaborating other detail, so that by 1790 the principles of natural regeneration under nurse trees for beech forest were fully developed in western Germany. In other parts, hardwood forest management was but little developed. The Prussian Forest Ordinance of 1786 contented itself with forbidding the selection method by declaring natural regeneration, as practiced in the pineries, not applicable while the Austrian Ordinance of 1786 recognizes only clearing, followed by planting, as the general rule. b. Artificial Reforestation All those sporadic attempts at sowing and planting are on record as early as the beginning of the 14th century. Extensive artificial reforestation did not begin until the middle of the 18th century, by which time planting methods were quite fully developed. Among the hardwoods, the oak was the first to receive special attention. By the middle of the 16th century, the forest ordinances gave quite explicit instructions for planting oak in the so-called Hutwald, a combination of pasture and tree growth such as is found today in the bluegrass region of Kentucky. The remnants of these poor pasture woods with their gnarly oaks have lasted into modern times. In the Forest Ordinance of Brunswick, 1598, Orders are given to plant on felling areas, quote, Every fool farmer shall every year at the proper time set out ten young oaks, every half farmer five, every farm laborer three, well taken up with roots, wildlings, and plant them in the commons or openings at Martini, November, or Mitfasten, Easter, and cover them with thorn brush to protect them against cattle, end quote. About that time, it was indeed incumbent on every marker to sow annually five oaks, or plant several young seedlings for every tree cut, and to tend them a few years, and the custom existed in the Low Country, afterwards 1700 introduced by law in Saxony, to plant in celebration of certain occurrences, a kind of arbor day, especially to celebrate the marriage day, in order to be married, the bridegroom had to prove that he had planted a certain number of oaks, which in Prussia, 1719, had to be six, besides six fruit trees. 
The existence of this custom, now long forgotten, has given rise in the United States to the story that this is the method by which the German forest is maintained. The method of collecting and keeping acorns over winter was well known in 1579, as is evidenced by the Hohenlohe Forest Ordinance, which advised fall sowing, but, if that did not prove successful to prepare the ground in summer, leave it through the winter and sow in the spring. While in earlier times sowing seems to have had the preference, at a later period planting was practiced, at first with wildlings, but as early as 1603 we find mention of oak nurseries. The Prussian Order of 1720 ordered the foresters to plant oaks in the openings before Christmas, for which they were to be paid if the trees were found alive after three years. The growing and culture of oak also interested Frederick the Great, who ordered its extension everywhere. Very explicit and correct rules for growing and transplanting them, and some to which we would not subscribe, were given in the books of the 18th century. Among the planting methods we find, in 1719 and again in 1776, one similar to the Monteufel method of planting in mounds. While oak culture was especially fostered in northwestern Germany, the cultivation of conifers first received attention in the southwest, and in the same manner which was inaugurated by the Nuremberg seed dealer in 1368. A new idea introduced in the Palatine Forest Ordinance 1565 and in the Bavarian Forest Ordinance 1568 was the prescription to soak the seed before use and so mixed with sawdust or sand, bringing the seed under with brush or iron rakes. Carlowitz, 1713, taught well the methods of collecting, extracting, and keeping the seed, and even proposed seed tests. The seed beds were to be made as for carrots, dense sowings to be thinned, and the thinnings transplanted into nursery rows, the seed beds to be covered with moss and litter to protect them against heaving. He also discusses the question of cost. The adaptation of plant material to different sites, conifers where oaks are not suitable, was also understood by the Bavarian Forest Ordinance 1683, as long as the old method of extracting the seed in hot stoves or ovens prevailed, conifer sowings gave but indifferent results. In the pine forests of Prussia during the second half of the 18th century, the method of sowing the cones on large waste and sand barrens, where the sun would make them release the seed, was practiced, and before Bramontier had written his celebrated Memoir sur la dune, Sand dunes had been recovered with pine plantations in Germany in the manner which is still in vogue. The planting of conifers came into practice much later, and then it was mostly done with wildlings. Opinions differed as to the value of sowing or planting. It was erroneously held until the 19th century that planting was less successful and too costly in comparison with the small harvest yield, which necessitated cheapness of operations. It was only toward the end of the 18th century that planting of pine was resorted to, but merely for repairing fail places in sowings and natural regeneration, and then with a ball of earth, 1779, using a hollow spade, a costly method. The cost of a certain plantation made in 1751 is, however, reported as less than $3 per metric ton, in 1770 as low as 70 cents per metric ton, to cheapen the operations, the labor was exchanged for wood, pasture, or other materials or advantages. In Prussia, in 1773, all recipients of free wood had to do service in the cultures. In 1785, every farmer had to furnish a certain amount of cones or acorns. The method lately adopted in Russia came into vogue in Prussia in 1719, namely of charging, besides the value of the wood, a toll to be paid into the planting fund, about 7% of the value. This method was also imitated elsewhere. The use of vault feldbau, combined farm and forest culture, was also inaugurated for the purpose of cheapening the cost of plantations by van Langen in 1744. When the great movement for reforesting wastes and openings began, the tree seed being sown with the grain either at once or after farm use for some years. Regular annual planting budgets, 
of fifty to a hundred to two hundred dollars were inaugurated in brunswick by van langen in seventeen forty five and in seventeen eighty one the prussian forest administration had attained so entirely modern planting plans and annual planting budgets it was no wonder that the fear of a timber famine and the apparent hopelessness of bringing improvement into the existing forest conditions created anxiety and a desire to plant rapid growers such as birch willow aspen alder the planting of the white birch became so general in the beginning of the eighteenth century that a regular betulomania is recorded corresponding to the incipient catalpomania in the united states at that time to be sure firewood was still the main concern and the use of these rapid growing species had some justification but where birch was mixed in spruce plantations its baneful effects consisting in whipping off the spruce tips and injuring its neighbors were soon recognized and much trouble was experienced in getting rid of the unwelcome addition the robinia which had been brought from america in sixteen thirty eight was also one of the trees recommended in the middle of the eighteenth century and was much planted until hottish pointed out that the expectations from it were entirely misplaced of course no building material could be expected from these species hence the larch also a rapid grower was transplanted from the alps seventeen thirty in hart's mountains and its use was extended as with us to conditions for which it was not adapted it was principally a desire for novelty and perhaps for better especially foreign things that led to the planting of north american species in parks during the first half of the eighteenth century but although f a j von wangenheim's very competent writings on the american forest flora and on the laws of naturalization seventeen eighty seven stimulated interest in that direction the use of american species for forest planting was not inaugurated till nearly one hundred years later with the single exception of the white pine pinus strobus of which large numbers were planted end of section four recording by john van stan savannah georgia Section 5 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard for Now. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 5. Germany. 7. Improvement of the crop. Thinning of stands had been practiced early in the 16th century, not for improvement of the remaining stand so much as to secure fence material although in fifteen thirty one the observation was already recorded that thinning improved and stimulated the remaining growth in the seventeenth century opposite views or at least doubts as to its usefulness were expressed in the forest orders and sometimes thinning was even forbidden even in the eighteenth century some of the prominent foresters Doebel and beckmann were opposed to it and although others favored the operation, the practice of it remained limited. In 1761, we find the first good statement of the theory of thinnings by Berletsch, who advised taking out the suppressed trees when the sound poles were clear of lower and middle branches. He also accentuated the financial argument of earlier returns and increased value of the remainder. About the same time, Xanthia recommended two thinnings, namely for conifers first in the thirtieth to fortieth year, and again in the fiftieth year, for broadleaf forest first in the forty-fifth, and again in the eightieth to ninetieth year. In 1765, the financial gain from thinnings is figured by Urtelt, and the possible reduction of the rotation due to thinnings is recognized by Liubert in 1774 just as the thinning in pole woods arose from the need of earlier utilization so the weeding of young growths was done for the purpose of getting material for wythes to bind the grain etc the removal of coppice shoots and oak plantings was practiced in prussia in seventeen nineteen and the thinning of two dense sowings was advised by karlowitz in seventeen thirteen yet much later even such an intelligent man as Ottelt 
inveighed against the weeding out of the birch and spruce sowings because quote, nature prefers variety with which preference it is not good to interfere this was in opposition to von langen seventeen forty five who prescribed for the first time regular cleaning or weeding especially the removal of the softwoods aspen and birch and of coppice shoots from seedling forest it was also known that this weeding is best done quote, in the full sap in order to kill the stocks eight methods of regulating forest management organized forest management was slower to develop than silvicultural methods the first attempts to bring order into the progress of fellings took the form of dividing the whole area into a certain number of fellings twelve sixteen twenty thirty etc several ordinances dating from the middle of the fifteenth and seventeenth centuries containing prescriptions to that effect it is doubtful whether the numbers of these areas indicate years of rotation in which case they could only have applied to coppice or whether they indicate periods of return in selection forest although the historians seem to jump to the former conclusion the area division practiced by van langen in the harz mountains 1745 who prescribed the division of larger districts into fifty and sixty of smaller districts into twenty to thirty felling areas also leaves it doubtful whether the areas corresponded to an assumed rotation or to a period of return at first the division was not into equal areas for no survey existed and its object was simply to localize the cutting and provide orderly progress the subdivision was made in the mountain country by following the topography valleys and ridges while in the plain the lines opened up for purposes of the chase to set up nets called schneisen or gestella rides bounding square areas called jagen quadrat stallung were used for the limitation of the felling areas most commonly however largely due to absence of surveys the ordered division did not materialize but only existed on paper with more exact measuring of areas and with the conception of a rotation or longer periods of return it was recognized that the inequality of the sites or soil qualities especially in mountain districts produced very unequal felling budgets to overcome this inequality jacobi in Göttingen, seventeen forty one introduced proportional felling areas making the felling areas on poor sites permanently larger similarly van langen and xanthier attempt to secure equal annual returns without slavishly holding to the geometric division merely making sure that the total area be cut over in the predetermined rotation the first attempts to introduce a regulated management by making a volume division the basis is recorded from the hearts mountains in fifteen forty seven this method based on very crude estimates although upon very fair forest description was continued into the eighteenth century in the last half of the eighteenth century all these crude methods were improved and applied on extensive areas in seventeen eighty five xanthier combined area and volume division determining the felling budget on each felling area by counting and estimating the trees and calculating how many trees could be used annually under a sustained yield management the area division being used only as a check or means of control a very considerable advance was made by uttelt who surveyed and regulated the weimar forests in seventeen sixty in the elaboration of details and establishment of proper principles for regulating the felling budget in his forest description he introduces for the first time periodic age classes usually six but of uneven length young growth below twelve years thicket twelve to twenty four years pole wood twenty four to forty years clear timber forty to fifty medium timber fifty to seventy five mature timber seventy five years and over he divides the forest into proportional areas which were marked by stones in the woods equalizing them according to age quality increment soil exposure so as to secure equal annual budgets 
The stands were ranged into seven or eight unequal age classes, and each into as many annual felling areas as there are years in the age class. If some of the age classes were absent, he extended the time for cutting in the older class until the younger had grown to the proper age, and by varying the cut, from good to poor sites for stands, he tried to even out the budgets. The volume budget he determined by average increment measurements. This method was, however, much too far advanced and required too much mathematics to find imitators at that time. Another method, which proved also too complex for the foresters of the time, was that of Van Vedel. Nevertheless, by 1790 he had by it put into working over 800,000 acres in Silesia. He divided this area into districts, the districts into blocks or management classes, and used an elaborated proportional area division for determining the felling budget. He distinguished quality of stand and quality of sight, and made four site classes. The volume of stock he found by means of sample areas, to which he added the increment in order to find the total volume for harvest. When it could be determined how long, with a given budget, the stand would last, or what average annual felling budget could be taken before the next age class would be mature. In the North German plain, with very uniform conditions of soil and timber, the method of equal felling areas was the most natural and most easily applied. Frederick the Great, who took a considerable interest in forestry matters, ordered such an area division for the state pineries in 1740, fixing upon different numbers of felling areas, but finally, in 1770, deciding on a rotation of 70 years. Lack of personnel retarded progress in this forest survey and regulation until 1778. Van Kropf undertook the direction. Not agreeing with his master regarding the short rotation of 70 years, he arranged to have each district divided into two working blocks, and by cutting alternately in these, managed to double that rotation. His successor, Hennert, in 1788, devised a new method by introducing allotment of a number of annual felling areas to a period of the rotation, when at least the periodic budget could be equalized. A value or money yield equalization of the felling budgets was also attempted. For easier handling, the forest was divided into small compartments or yagen, and the classification of four still uneven periodic age classes of different length for conifers and broadleaf forest and three site qualities were employed. The merchantable stock was ascertained by a sample area method, and the felling budget by dividing the oldest age class by the number of years. It must last until the next was ready. Since no attempt was made to secure a proper age class gradation, the method failed to improve conditions for the next rotation. Some 500,000 acres were regulated according to this plan in Prussia, probably very superficially. In 1789, Bavaria also ordered a division into annual felling areas. In all these methods of regulating the yield or budget, the area played the main role, the volume being only a secondary consideration. The first elaboration of a pure volume division was made by Beckmann in 1759. He estimated stock on hand by trees and guessed more or less at the increment, allowing two and a half, two and one percent for the different sites and then made a year-to-year -year calculation of stock for a hundred and twenty-five years. How the felling budget was finally determined is not known. Two methods were simultaneously devised in Württemberg in 1783, which formed the transition to the so-called allotment methods, making periodic age classes of an equal number of years and allotting either felling areas or volumes to each period of the rotation. Incapacity of the officials prevented the application of the one method, while the other, devised by Maurer, remained also only a proposition. But, in 1788, Krechting, in his Mathematical Contributions to Forestry Science, teaches a pure volume allotment method with ten-year age classes and nearly all the apparatus which was afterward developed by Hartisch who in the next period dominated to such a large extent the development of forestry in all its branches.
9. Improvements in Methods of Mensuration In scientific direction, the mathematical disciplines were the first to be developed. The natural sciences received attention much later. A considerable amount of mathematical knowledge was required for this work of forest organization. The mathematical apparatus of the foresters, even at the end of this period, was rather slender, but its development went hand in hand with the development of these methods of regulation, and even elaborate mathematical formulae for determining felling budgets were not absent. Until nearly the middle of the 18th century, surveys of exact nature were almost unknown. Only when the division into equal or proportionate felling areas became the basis for determining the felling budgets did the necessity for such surveys present itself. Plain table and compass were the instruments which came into use in the beginning of the 18th century, but not until the latter half of that century were extensive forest surveys and maps of various character made, especially in Prussia under Vidal, Kropf, and Hennet. The methods of measurement of wood developed still later. Until Othelt's time, no method of precise determination of volumes was known, everything being estimated by cords or by diameter breast height and height or by the number of boards which a tree would make, board feet. The diameter was sometimes used as a price maker, the price increasing in direct proportion to the diameter increase. Othelt calculated the volume of coniferous trees as cones, and Ferencle, who wrote a book on mathematics for the use of foresters, calculated timbers with the top removed by using the average diameter, to which Henert added the volume of a cone with the difference of the two diameters as a base to make the total tree volume. Most measurements of standing trees were, of course, made on the circumference, for in the absence of calipers, the diameter would be directly measured only on the felled tree. Double had already measured the height by means of a rectangular triangle, and the first real hypsometer with movable sights was described by Jung in 1781, and a complete instrument, which could be used for measuring both height and diameter at any height, similar to some more modern ones, was constructed by Reinhold. Determination of the real wood contents in a cord of wood, and of the volume of bark by measurement was taught by Othalt, and the method of immersion in water and measuring the displaced volume by Hennert, 1782. In 1785, Krona first called attention to the variation of the increment in different age classes, and the need of determining the accretion for each separately. In 1789, Trunk, taught how to determine average felling age increment, and also the method of determining the change of diameter classes, which is now used by the United States Forest Service. Quote, on good soil a tree grows one inch in three years, on medium soil in four years, on poor soil in five years. With this knowledge, the attainment of a given diameter or the change from one diameter or age class to the next could be calculated. Volume tables were at Trunk's command, and Paulson in 1787, Krechting in 1788 mentioned periodic yield tables, but generally speaking, ocular taxation or estimating was the rule. Checked by experience in actual fellings, the method of the American timber looker. Generally, of course, only the log timber was estimated as with us, and only the very roughest estimating, or rather guessing, was in vogue until near the end of the period. The first attempt at closer measurement was made by Beckmann, 1756, who surrounded the area to be measured with twine, drove a colored wooden peg into each tree, one color for each diameter class, when, knowing the original number of pegs that had been taken out, the difference gave the number of trees in each diameter class, and by multiplying the average cubic contents of a measured sample tree in each class, by the number in the class, its volume was found. The method, often employed at present, of ascertaining by tally the diameter classes on strips 40 to 50 paces wide, the so-called strip survey, was described by Zantier in 1763. These measurements were usually confined to sample areas, the use of such being already known in 1739. 
The contents of the sample area, if a special degree of accuracy was desired, were ascertained by felling the whole and measuring. Uthelt, of mathematical fame, was the first to publish something about the determination of the age of trees by counting rings, although the practice probably antedates this account. He knew of the dependence of the ring width on the site and on the density of the stand. It seems that long before this time the French had made the determination of yield in a more scientific manner. Réamur, reporting in 1721 to the French Academy, comparative studies of the yield of coppice and of volumes of wood. Ertelt, too, laid the foundation of forest financial calculations when he ascertained the value of a forest by determining the value of an acre of mature wood, the oldest age class, and multiplying it by half the acreage of the whole forest, suggesting the well-known expression for the normal stock, I times R over 2, soon after to be developed by an obscure Austrian tax collector. Even the first forest finance calculations with the use of compound interest and a comparison of the profitableness of the different methods of management are to be recorded as made by Zantier in 1764, bringing the beginning of forestal statistics into this period. 10. Methods of Lumbering and Utilization At the beginning of this period, rough exploitation was still mainly in vogue, only parts of trees being used, just as in the United States now. Here and there, attempts were made toward more conservative use. For instance, at Brunswick in 1547, the use of log timber for fuel was discouraged. In Saxony, as early as 1560, the brushwood was utilized for fuel. High stumps were a usual feature in spite of the threats of punishments of the forest ordinances, as in Bavaria, 1531. The axe was the only instrument used until the end of the 18th century for felling as well as cutting into lengths. Not until 1775 do we find an allusion to the use of the saw, when the forest ordinance of Weimar ordered that the saw cut should be made for three-fourths of the tree's diameter and the axe be used to finish the last quarter. Not until the 18th century was the fuel wood split in the woods, and it was near the end of the period before it was set up in mixed cords, round and split, after the splitting had been introduced. The measurement was, until about that time, made merely in loads, the cord being of later introduction. The value of low stumps and of the use of the saw was recognized in Austria in 1786, to show how variously and locally the need of conservative use of wood developed, we may cite the fact that in the Hots, about 1750, trees were dug with their roots as now in some of the pineries of the Mark Brandenburg, in order to utilize more of the body wood and the root wood. In 1757 we find stump pulling machines described. In measurement of standing trees, the circumference at breast height was measured with a chain, and for the body wood, when felled, the mean diameter was employed. As regards the felling time, specific advice is found in many forest ordinances which recommend mostly winter felling, stating the proper beginning and end of the season by the phases of the moon, the rule being that all white wood, for example conifers, beech, and aspen, should be felled on the increase or waxing of the moon, oak at the waning, but coppice because it is desired to secure a new growth at the waxing moon. Prescription was also made sometimes regarding the time by which the removal of the wood from the felling area was to be finished, May to June. Means of transportation were poor up to the end of the period. Snow, as in the United States, was in the northern country the main reliance for moving the wood. River driving, both with and without rafts, was well organized. Various systems of log slides were developed to a considerable extent. In one place, even an iron pipe, 900 feet in length, is reported to have been used in such capacity. Originally, the consumer cut his own wood, but in the middle of the 17th century, special wood choppers appear to have been employed, for, in 1650, mention is made in Saxony of men who, under oath to secure honest service, 
were organized for the exploitation of the different classes of wood. A system of jobbers came into existence about this time, something like the logging bosses in the United States, Holzmeister, who were responsible for the execution of the logging job. The organization of wood choppers went so far that in 1718 we find in the Hartz Mountains mention of an accident insurance and mutual charity association among them. The sale of wood was at first carried on in the house. Later it became customary to indicate in the forest the trees to be cut or the area from which they should be cut by the purchaser, and finally they were felled by the employees of the owner. For a long time, persisting into the 18th century, the sale was by area, and this method developed the necessity of surveying, at the same time, however, sales by the tree and by wood measure occurred, but only in the 18th century did the present method of selling wood by measure after felling come into existence. In Prussia, the buyer had to take the risk of felling and pay even if the tree proved to be rotten or broke in the felling. The forest owner seems to have had the whip hand in determining the price one-sidedly, revising, for example, increasing the toll in longer or shorter intervals. But in 1713 we find mention of wood auctions, or at least similar methods of getting the best prices. Finally, special market days for making sales and for designating of wood were instituted. On these days also, all offenses against the forest laws were adjudged. 11. Forest Administration The administration of the different forest properties which the princes had aggregated in the course of time was at first a part of the general administration of the princely property. The requirements in the woods being merely to look after utilization and protection, illiterate underlings, forstknechte, were sufficient to carry out the police functions, generally under a forstmeister or oberforstmeister, who from time to time would make an inspection tour. Later on, when a more intensive forest management had come into existence, it became customary to call in experienced foresters from outside to make inspections and give advice. A much more elaborate organization of services, however, reported in the mining districts of the Hartz Mountains in 1547, with the director of mines, Berg Hauptmann, at the head, and different grades of officials under him, who were called together periodically for reports and discussions. Until the middle of the 18th century, all those employed in the forest service, at least those in the superior positions, had also duties in connection with the chase the head official of the hunt being also the head of the forest service, and hunting had usually superior claims to forestry. The men were supposed to be masters of the two branches, to be familiar with the technique of the hunt and of forestry, Hirschgerecht and Holzgerecht. The higher positions were usually reserved to the nobility, until, during the 18th century, the Cameralis came into control of the administration, and with them, under the mercantilistic teachings, the apparatus of officials also increased. These men usually possessed wide, but not deep, knowledge of the matters bearing upon their charges. In Prussia, in 1740, the forest service was at least in part combined with the military service, Frederick the Great instituting the corps of riding couriers for the carrying of despatches who were selected from the forest service, an institution which persists up to date in the corps of Feldjäger, while the sons of foresters were enlisted in a troop known as Fussjäger Chasseurs. A new era dates from the middle of the 18th century when the connection with the hunt, the military organization, and the preferred position of the nobility were at least in part abrogated, and a more technical organization was attempted. The cause for this change was the increase of wood prices, which made a more technical management desirable, and also a decrease in the passion for the hunt. Still, although the forests in Bavaria were declared in 1780 to 1790 to be of more importance than the hunt, and the two services were distinctly separated, the head of the hunt still ranked above the head of the forest service. In Prussia, the professional men became early independent and influential, and by 1770, 
an organization had been perfected which excelled in thoroughness and simplicity. The salaries of the foresters consisted originally mainly in a free house, use of land and pasture rights, their uniform, and incidental emoluments such as a toll for the designation of timber, etc. Later, when everywhere else a regular money management had been introduced, the absence of a cash income and general poverty forced the foresters to steal and extort, and the bad reputation established in the last part of the 18th century, as well as the bad practice, persisted until the 19th century. The lower grades in the service were exceedingly ignorant, and their social position consequently very low. Their main business was indeed simple and consisted in the booking of the cut, issuing permits for the removal and the sale of wood, and looking after police functions in the woods. Yet, by 1781, we find regular planting plans submitted in the Prussian administration, and in 1787, felling plans are on record. The administration of justice against offenders in the forest was until the end of the 18th century in charge of the head foresters, and only then was transferred to law officers. Theft of wood, as in olden days, was considered as a smaller offense than other thefts, except if it was cut wood. In the beginning of the period, the judge had wide latitude as to amount of the fine to be imposed, but in the 17th century, more precise fines were fixed, and in the 18th century, a revision of the fines brought them into proportion with the value of the stolen wood. A choice of punishments by fines, imprisonment, or labor in the woods was then also instituted. 12. Forestry Education The course of education for the foresters until the middle of the 18th century was a simple one, and mainly directed to learning the manipulations of the chase, training of dogs, tending of horses, setting of nets, shooting, etc., Two or three years' life with a practical hunter were followed by journeying and working for different employers, wood lore being picked up by the way from those that knew. When in the 18th century the need for better woods knowledge became pressing, the few really good forest managers were sought out by the young men who wished to secure this knowledge. In this way, a number of so-called master schools came into existence, each depending on one man. Such a school was that of Van Santier in Wernigerode, later transferred to Ilsenburg, started in 1763 and ending with his death in 1778. Theoretical teaching and opportunity for practical demonstration here was such that even students from the Berlin School and men in actual employment attended the courses. The two great masters and fathers of modern forestry, Hartisch and Cotta, each instituted such master schools, the former in 1789 and the latter in 1785. Cota's school was afterwards transferred to Tarant and became a state institution. The interest of the state in forestry education found first expression in Prussia, in a course of lectures in botany, later also in forest economy, given to the forest officials by Gleditch, professor of botany at the University of Berlin, 1770, to which was added a practicum at Tegel under Bergstorff, who finally became the head of this mixed state school and continued in this position until at his death in 1802, the school was discontinued. In imitation of this move by Prussia, a military planting school was instituted by Württemberg at Solitude in 1770. The most noteworthy feature of this school, which under various changes lasted less than 25 years, was the course of lectures by Stahl mentioned before. Besides this higher school, a lower grade school was started in 1783, but its career was even briefer, not more than 10 years. Bavaria organized a forest school at Munich in 1790 with a four years course and at least three years' study at this school was required of those seeking employment in the state service. But, without having ever flourished, this school too collapsed by 1803. 13. Forestry Literature The oldest forestry literature of this period is contained in the many forest ordinances. 
which allow us to judge from their prescriptions as to the conditions of the practice in the woods and as to the gradual accumulation of empiric knowledge. Of a forestry science, one could hardly speak until an attempt had been made to organize the knowledge thus empirically acquired into a systematic presentation, and this was not done until the middle or last half of the 18th century. The first attempts at a literary presentation of the empiric knowledge are found in the encyclopedic volumes of the so-called Hausfeta, household fathers, domestic economists, who treated in a most diffuse manner of agriculture in all its aspects, including silviculture. A number of these tomes appeared during the 17th century, the best and most influential being published at the very beginning of that century, 1595 to 1609 written by a preacher from Silesia, Johann Kolleris, and entitled Economia Ruralis et Domestica, worin das Amt aller braven Hausvetter und Hausmutter begriffen. Kolleris relied upon home experience and not as Petrus de Crescentius in his earlier work, Pradium Rusticum, translated from the French in 1592, had done upon the scholastic expositions of the Italians. He was rewarded by the popularity of his work, which went through thirteen editions and became very widely known. Somewhat earlier, a jurist, Noé Murer, wrote a book on forest law and hunting, second edition, 1576, which on this field remained long in authority and gives insight into the condition of forest use at the time. But the first independent work on forestry, divorced from the hunt and farming, did not appear until 1713, Silvicultura Economica, written by Saxon director of mines Hans Karl von Karlowitz. This book, while containing quaint and amusing ideas, gives many correct rules for silvicultural methods, especially as regards planting and sowing, but the subject of forest management or organization is entirely neglected. At about the same time, 1710, a forest official, von Guchhausen, published Notabilia Venatoris, which, however, contained little more than a description of the species of trees and methods of their utilization. About the middle of the 18th century, great activity began in the literary field. This was carried on by two distinct classes of writers, namely the empiricists and the cameralists. The former, the Holzgerechte Jäger, were the practical men of the woods who proved in many directions most unpractical and exhibited in their writings outside of the record of their limited experience the crassest ignorance the cameralists were educated in law and political economy and while lacking practical contact with the woods work tried to sift and systematize the knowledge of the empiricists and to secure for it a tangible basis some five or six of the empiricists deserve notice as writers. The first and most noted of them was Döbel, Heinrich Wilhelm, whose book, Jäger Praktika, Hunter's Practice, published in 1746, remained in authority until modern times for the part referring to the chase. The author was preeminently a hunter who worked in various capacities in Saxony, a self-taught man with very little knowledge of natural history. Being familiar mainly with broadleaf forest, he condemned planting and thinning, but described quite well for his time the methods of survey, subdivision, estimating and measuring, and the methods of selection forest and coppice with standards. His ignorance is characterized by his reference to the, quote, sulfurous and nitric elements of the soil as cause of spontaneous forest fires. Opinionated and one-sided, like many so-called practical men, he came into polemic controversies with other practitioners, not less opinionated among them J. G. Beckmann, who worked in another part of Saxony, where, having to deal with coniferous woods, he had gathered different experiences from those of Dubbel. Although he was himself poorly educated, especially in natural sciences, he complained of the ignorance of the foresters, and in his book, Anweisung zu einer pfleglichen Forstwirtschaft, 1759, used for the first time the word Forstwissenschaft, forest science. 
and insisted upon the necessity of studying nature. He may be credited with having really advanced forest organization by devising the first good volume division method, and silviculture by advocating the method of clearing followed by sowing. The first practical forester with a university education was J. J. Buchting, who worked in the Hartz Mountains. His main interest lay in the direction of survey, division, and orderly utilization. He did not, however, make any striking advance except that he gave equal standing to both planting and sowing. The two most eminent practitioners of the period, however, active during the middle of the century, were Johann Georg von Langen and his pupil, Hans Dietrich von Zantier, both of noble family and better educated than most of their contemporaries, and both engaged in the organization and management of Hartz Mountain Forests, namely those of the Duke of Brunswick and of Count of Stolberg Venegoroda. The former, without occupying himself directly with literary work, laid down in his expert reports and in his working plans many instructions which form the basis for orderly management and silviculture far ahead of the times. Santier, writing considerably, especially Kürzer Systematische Grundrisch der Praktischen Forstwissenschaft, 1764, is also notable as the founder of the first forestry school at Vanegeroda, 1763. Another of this class of better educated practitioners and co-worker with the former two was von Lasberg, who in 1764 to 1777 organized the Saxon forests. An interesting incident in the life of the last three men is their journey to Denmark and Norway, whither they were called to organize the management of the forest connected with the mines. Another prominent forest manager of the last half of the century, whose literary work is to be found only in various excellent official instructions, among which is one for the teaching of foresters, was the head of the Hessian Forest Service, a nobleman, Van Belch. Of the Cameralists, who helped to make forestry literature six or seven deserve mention, these men of education and polyhistors were either at the head of affairs or else professors at universities where they included forestry as one of the branches of political economy. The credit of the first really systematic presentation of forestry principles and rules, as developed at the time, belongs to Wilhelm Gottfried von Moser, a pupil of von Langen, who served in various principalities and finally with the Prince of Taxis, in his Principles of Forest Economy, published in 1757, which for the first time brought out the economic importance of the subject, he discusses in two volumes divided into nine chapters the different branches of forestry. A mining engineer, J. A. Kramer, came next with a very notable book, Anleitung zum Forstwesen, 1766, which although not as comprehensive as Moses treats, the subject of silviculture very well. Equal in arrogance and opinionated self-satisfaction to any of the empiricists with whom he frequently crossed swords was the Brunswick councillor von Broca, who, as an amateur practicing forestry on his own estate, developed the characteristic trait of the empiricists, namely, a profound belief in his own infallibility. He produced, besides many polemic writings, in which he charged the whole class of foresters with ignorance, laziness, and dishonesty, a magnum opus in four volumes entitled True Bases of the Physical and Experimental General Science of Forestry, which is in Ola Padrida of small value. Less original but more fair and well-informed, a typical representative of the Cameralis was J. F. Stahl finally head of the forest administration of Württemberg, and at the same time lecturer on mathematics, natural history, and forestry at the Forest School of Solitude, Stuttgart. Although an amateur in the field of forestry, he was a good teacher, and left many valuable and wise prescriptions evolved during his administration. He compiled in four volumes a dictionary of forest, fish, and game practice. Onomatologia, Forestalis Piscatoria Venatoria, 1772-1781, to 1781, and founded the first forestry journal. 
since 1770, forestry courses had been given for the Camaralists at most of the German universities, and many of the professors prepared textbooks for the purpose. At least three of these professors deserve mention, Beckmann, Jung, and Trunk. The first, J. Beckmann, professor of political economy at Göttingen, one of the most noted Camaralists, was author of a work in 45 volumes on the principles of German agriculture, 1769, in which he devotes 61 pages to forestry, giving a complete system of forestry with extracts from all known forestry writings. J. H. Jung, who gave a special course on forestry at the Kameralschule of Lautan, published a textbook in 1781 in which forest botany was well treated. J. J. Trunk, who was Oberforstmeister in Austria, as well as professor at Freiburg, was the most prominent of the three and wrote a comprehensive work full of practical sense. Neues Vollständiges Forst Erbuch oder Systematische Grundsätze des Forstrechtes, der Forstpolizei und Forstökonomie, nebst Anhang von Anslandischen Holzarten von Torf und Steinkollen. 1789. While at first the ephemeral writings, especially the polemic ones of the empiricists, found room in literary and cameralistic magazines, the need of a professional journal first found expression in 1763 in Stahl's Allgemeines Ökonomisches Forstmagazin, which ran into twelve volumes and contains many articles important to the history of forestry, and is especially rich in its reference to foreign literature. Two continuations of the magazine under different editorships were of less value, but von Moser's Forst Archive, running from 1788 to 1807 with its thirty volumes, is an authority and a historical source of the first rank. A very characteristic literature of the last half of the 18th century consisted in Forest Calendars, in which advice as to monthly and seasonal procedures in the forest were given Beckmann and Zantier being among the authors. End of section 5. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 6 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Germany. Development in the 19th century. The last hundred years or so has seen in Germany the development of fully established forest policies and the complete organization of stable forest administrations based upon thorough and careful recognition of the principles of forest management and intensive application of silvicultural methods. 1. Changes in Property Conditions The change in forest treatment from that prevailing during the previous period was mainly due to the change in property conditions, and especially to the establishment of state forests. This change was largely the result of the revolutionary movements at the beginning of the new century, which brought about changes in state organizations. In Prussia, the princely forest property had been declared state domain in 1713, but elsewhere, the public domain had been considered the property of the princes in their capacity as head of the country, as domanium, outside of their personal private property, chatulguta. The income from this dominium was in part liable to be applied to the expenses of the court and of the administration of the realm, to some extent alleviating the burdens of taxation. This property arose from a variety of relations which have been discussed at length in the foregoing chapters. It was derived mainly from feudal properties, fiefs of vassalage and fiefs of official position, secularized church property and other forfeited property, division of mock forests and from allodial possessions of the family. Gradually, by agreement with the landed estates, it was understood that this property could not be disposed of or dissipated by the prince and was inherited by the eldest son together with the princely dignity, being an attribute of his position in the state. In the Reconstruction period of 1806 to 1815, during and after the Napoleonic Wars, many of the small princes lost their seniorage, Landeshoheit ipso jore. 
and with the loss of the princely dignity the obligation of carrying the expense of court and administration naturally falling away. These properties became in most cases purely individual property of the former princes. Not, however, until the revolutionary movements of 1848 and even later was this divorce of the state idea from that of the person of the prince everywhere accomplished. Nor was it carried through without many bickerings and quarrels between the princes and the representatives of the people, who claimed this dominium for the state. In the larger states, all this domanial property was finally declared state lands, while in the smaller principalities a partition of the land between the princes and the state took place, or else a relation was established by which a part of the revenue resulting from the state lands was secured to the princes. An increase of the state's property came also during the first decade of the century, through the abolishment of cloisters and secularization of church property generally, the lands of both Protestant and Catholic church institutions being taken by the state. Curiously enough, at the same time that the idea of state forest was being realized, the changes in economic thought which brought the principle of individualism to the fore gave rise to a movement to sell the state properties. This movement was inspired by French doctrines, whose influence was at the time very strong by the teachings of Adam Smith, who held that the state is not fit to conduct business, and by the hope that in private ownership an improvement in forest conditions would be more readily realized. These ideas by themselves would probably not have led to the adoption of a policy of sale if it had not been for the need for cash, which, as a result of the French wars, was felt everywhere during the first years of the decade. The sale of this property seemed to provide a ready means for states to secure funds. In Prussia, after the collapse of 1806, this measure was widely discussed, and eventually in 1810 to 1813, repeatedly instructions for the sale of state forest property were issued. There were to be excluded from such sales only large complexes of forest, those on the sea coast, sand dunes, and river fronts where the protection of the forest cover was needed, and those which it was desirable to maintain for the use of important industrial establishments. Only the accession of Hartish, 1811, as chief of the forest administration, which was a branch of the Treasury Department, prevented the execution of this dismemberment. It was due to him that the difference in character between farm and forest property began to be recognized. Although after 1820 sales of forest property took place, they were never a fiscal measure, but were made either for the purpose of rounding off existing state forest property or paying off servitudes, or else in order to turn over agricultural soil to farm use. At present, Everywhere in Germany state properties are on the increase. The property conditions of the communal forests naturally changed also with the political changes of the 19th century, when existing communities were made part of the large political machine and changed from economic and social to modern political municipalities. The ownership conditions, however, were not simplified, but, as before, remained extremely varied. Of the mock forests, but a very small portion remains today. The majority of it had been finally divided among the America in the first decade of the century, and the few remaining parts became independent of the political organization and now exist merely in the form of appurtenances to certain farm property known as Genossenwald, association forests. In addition to the variety of communal ownerships existing in the preceding period, some new communal properties originated from the granting of land in the settlement and dissolution of servitudes, whereby an undivided property, Interessentenwald, in which sometimes even the state retains an interest, came into existence. The municipal property of the cities had become either the property of the entire community or of that part which constituted the real citizenship, or at least of certain class of citizens of the municipality. 
the encumbrances which had grown up with regard to forest property under the name of servitudes, and which so much retarded the development of better forest management, continued into this period, and although through the influences of the French Revolution a desire had been stimulated to get rid of all curtailments of property, some have persisted to this day. Indeed, for a time an increase of these servitudes took place due to the carelessness of forest officials in keeping unjustified use of the forest in check, when ancient usage of these rights of users was claimed and new servitudes were established. In Bavaria, it became at last necessary, in 1852, to positively forbid the further establishment of new servitudes or rights of user. Laws having in view the dissolution or buying out of these rights were issued in Bavaria in 1805 and in Prussia in 1821, giving the right to forest owners whose properties were so encumbered to call for a division of interests. But as at the first, the only way to settlement was by exchange for definite parcels of forest property, the progress in the abolishment of these rights was slow, until money exchange was permitted, as in Saxony 1832. At the present time, the state forest administrations have mostly got rid of these servitudes, or at least have progressed so far in their regulation that they are now rarely impediments to forest management. These peaceable adjustments of the rights of user constitute the last act of freeing property socially and economically. 2. Forest Conditions In spite of the sporadic efforts which had been made to bring about the recuperation of forest areas during the 18th century, the conditions of the forest at the beginning of the new century were most pitiable. The division of the mock by which the peasants became individual owners, profited little and led to devastation rather than to improving the condition of the property. In addition, export trade in wood had become brisk, and the financial depression, a result of the French wars, led to increased exploitations, which, with the improvement in means of transportation, progressed to the more distant forest areas and enlarged the waste area. Especially in the more densely populated parts of the country, the deforested area widened, and large wastes with poor young growth increased in all directions, in the same manner as now in the United States. The alarmists had good cause for renewing their cries, and around the year 1800 a considerable literature sprung up on the subject of the threatened timber famine. It is interesting to note that at that time the Catalpa played a role, at least on paper, as it does in our own day, being recommended as the only means of staving off the timber famine. A renewed betulomania spread widely over the country. In North Germany especially, great efforts were made to replant the denuded areas and to change the coppice areas, fit only for firewood, to coniferous species, pine, etc., by which eventually a great change in the forest type from the original mixed forest to the pure forest was effected. 3. Personnel The great change which led to improved conditions during the first half of the century was preeminently due to the knowledge and intelligence of a group of men, six in number, competent foresters who combined the high-grade education of the cameralists with the practitioner's knowledge, Hartisch, Kota, Hundeshagen, Kernisch, Feil, and Heyer. These men built, to be sure, on the shoulders of their precursors of the century in which they were born, but, being placed in authoritative positions, found better opportunities for putting their teachings into practice. The first two mentioned were older than the rest, and are usually described as the fathers of modern forestry. Born about a year apart, both educated at universities, they excelled in both scientific and practical directions. Georg Ludwig Hartig, 1764-1837, studied at the University of Gießen, and, after having served in various functions in various parts of southern Germany, became in 1811 head of the Prussian Forest Administration. 
He was equally eminent as a practical man and organizer, as a writer, and as a teacher. In literary direction his work lay not so much in developing new ideas as in formulating clearly the known ones, as evidenced in his celebrated general rules in silviculture. Not less than thirty separate publications attest his assiduity. Among them stands preeminent, Anvisung zur Holzzucht für Forster, 1791, 8th edition, 1818. As a teacher, he began his work by establishing a master school, 1789 to 1791, at Hungen, transferred to Stuttgart in 1807, and afterwards, as head of the Prussian Forest Administration, he lectured at the University of Berlin, continuing his lectures there, even after the forestry school at Eberswalde had been established until his death. He may be considered as having established on a firm basis the Forest Administration of Prussia, and many of the things he instituted still prevail. In organizing the service, he introduced fixed salaries. He relieved the foresters from financial responsibilities, transferring all handling of money to a separate set of officials, whereby the temptation of fraudulent practices of graft was removed, and he issued instructions for the very different grades of foresters, and every part of this work was all his own. In regulating the forest area of the state, he developed the volume allotment method, which, however, proved too cumbersome to be readily applied to large areas. Toward the end of his life, his work was not entirely successful, and he lost prestige in his later years. Heinrich von Cotta, 1763 to 1844, studied at the University of Jena, and afterwards practiced in Thuringia, where he established a master school at Zilbach, 1795. In 1811, he was called to Saxony as director of forest surveys, whither he also transferred his school at Tarant, which in 1816 was made a state institution and is still flourishing. In that year, he was made the director of the Bureau of Forest Management, like Hartig, he was eminent in the three directions of practical, literary, and educational work, but he excelled Hartish in originality, developing new principles and thoughts. Being a good plant physiologist and observer of nature, he developed new ideas in silviculture, especially with reference to methods of thinning, and his Anweisung zum Waldbau, written in the simplest, clearest, and most forceful manner, forms a classic worthy of study to this day. In the field of forest management, he became the inventor of the area allotment method and the originator of the highly developed Saxon forest management. As a teacher, he excelled in clearness, exposition, wealth of ideas, and geniality. Of an entirely different stamp was the third of the great masters, Johann Christian Hundeshagen, 1783 to 1834, who, having studied in Heidelberg, became, after some years of practice, professor of forestry at Tübingen in 1817 and at Gießen, 1825. He was a representative of the theoretical or philosophical side of forestry, being highly cultivated and imbued with the spirit of science. His bent was to systematize the knowledge in existence and extend it by means of exact experiments. In forest organization, he invented the well-known formula method or rational method of regulating felling budgets and became also one of the founders of forest statics, 1826, which he called, quote, the doctrine of measuring forestal forces, end quote, being thus the forerunner of modern scientific forestry. The fourth of the group, Gottlob König, 1776-1849, was a practitioner without a university education, who had enjoyed the teaching and influence of Cotta, whom he succeeded in Eisenach as the head of the Ducal Forest Administration. He also founded here a private forest school, which in 1830 became a state institution, and is still in existence. König became noted by his contributions to the scientific especially the mathematical side of forestry, developing forest mensuration and statics. 
In this latter branch he was the forerunner of Pressler and of the modern school of finance. In his Anleitung zur Holz Taxation, 1813, he gives a complete account of forest mensuration, and in the part devoted to forest valuation he develops the first soil rent formula and the methods of determining the cost value of his stands. His Forest Mathematics, 1835, in which he introduces factors of form and many other new ideas, was an original contribution to science. Very different in character from these four leaders was the aggressive, sharp-witted Friedrich Wilhelm Leopold Feil, 1783-1859, who, without a university education, and in spite of his poor knowledge of mathematics and natural history, advanced himself by native wit and genius. After a brief period of employment in private service in the province of Silesia, he accepted the position of professor of forestry at the Berlin University in 1821, in connection with Hartisch, with whom, however, he was at sword's point. It was at his instigation, with the assistance of von Humboldt, that the school was transferred in 1830 to Eberswalde, Feil becoming its director. While Hartisch was a generalizer, Pfeil was an individualizer, free from dogma and most suggestive, a freelance and a fighter, critical in the extreme and prolific in his literary work, he domineered the forestry literature of the day by means of his Christische Blätter, a journal of much import and merit. The youngest of the group, Karl Haya, 1797 to 1856, a thoroughly educated man, combined the professorial position in the University of Gießen, 1835, with practical management of a forest district, but in 1834, abandoned the latter in order to devote himself entirely to literary work. He was one of the clearest and most systematic expounders, and both his Waldbau, Silviculture, 1854, and his Walter Trag Regelung, Forest Organization, 1841, are classics. The last, fifth edition of the Waldbau, appearing in 1906 in two volumes, has been brought up to date by Professor Hess. He devised one of the most rational methods of forest organization and indeed with the necessity of basing forest management on exact scientific inquiry instead of on empiricism alone. He formulated instructions for forest static investigations, a subject which his son, Gustav Haya, elaborated into a science. 4. Progress in Silviculture Natural regeneration continued to be the favorite method well into this period, and for a long time selection, forest, and coppice were all that was known in practice until Hartish and Kota forced the recognition of the shelterwood system. The only way in which a transition from the generally practiced unregulated selection forest to an intensive management was possible with the ignorant personnel of under-foresters, was to formulate into an easily intelligible prescription the necessary rules, allowing the least play to individual judgment. This was done by Hartish when he formulated his eight general rules in 1808, which coincided also closely with the teachings of Cotta. Since these rules represent in brief the most definitely the status of silvicultural knowledge, on natural regeneration at the time, it may be desirable to translate them verbatim. Number one, every forest tree which is expected to propagate itself by natural regeneration must be old enough to bear good seed. Number two, every district or stand which is to be replaced by a thoroughly perfect stand by means of natural regeneration must be brought into such position, or density, that the soil may everywhere receive sufficient seeding. 3. Each compartment must be kept in such condition, or density, that it cannot, before the seeding takes place, grow up to grass and weeds. Number 4. With species whose seed loses its power of germination through frost, as is the case with the oak and beech, 
the compartments must be given such a position, or density, that the foliage which after the fall of seed covers and protects the same cannot be carried away by wind. Number five. All sands, which must be given such density that the germinating plants in the same, as long as they are still tender, find sufficient protection from their mother trees against heat of the sun and against cold. Number six. So soon as the young stand resulting from natural regeneration does not any longer require this motherly protection, it must gradually, through the careful removal of the mother trees, be accustomed to the weather, and finally must be entirely brought into the open position. Number seven. All the young growths, whether secured by natural or artificial seeding, must be freed from the accompanying less useful species and from weeds, if these, in spite of all precaution, threaten the better kinds. Number eight. From every young forest until it is full grown, the suppressed wood must be removed from time to time, so that the trees which are ahead or dominate may grow the better. The upper perfect crown cover, however, must not be interrupted until it is the intention to grow a new forest again in the place of the old one. Since these rules are applicable only in beech forests, much mischief and misconception resulted from their generalization. Pure, even-aged high forest became the ideal, and the mixed forest, which was originally the most widespread condition, vanished to a large extent. This was especially unfortunate in northern and northeastern pine forests. A reaction against Hartish's generalization began about 1830, under the lead of File. He had at first agreed with Hartish, and then with equal narrowness advocated for many years a clear-cutting system with artificial reforestation. Finally, however, he was not afraid to acknowledge that his early generalizations in this respect were a mistake, and that different conditions required different treatment. In the development of the Shelterwood system, there was at first, under the lead of Hartish, a tendency to open up rather sharply, taking out about three-fourths of the existing stand, but gradually he became convinced that this was too much and finally reduced the first removal to only about one-third of the stand. This was the origin of his nickname of Dunkelmann, in spite of the fact that it was claimed that Kolta took the opposite view, for which he was called Lichtmann. He, too, grew in favor of a dark position, and as he progressed, leaned more and more towards more careful opening up. Hatish originally recognized only three different fellings, the cutting for seed, the cutting for light, and the removal cutting. By and by, a second cut was made during the seed year, and the number of fellings to secure gradual removal were increased, so that by 1801 this system seems to have been pretty nearly perfected to its modern conditions. The best exposition of this Femmelschlachbetrieb, shelterwood system, as then developed, is to be found in Karl Heyer's Handbook, 1854. The method was unfortunately extended by Bergsdorf in 1787 to the northern pineries with a 70-year period of rotation. Within ten years, however, he recognized its inappropriateness and modified it by instructions to leave only six to twelve seed trees per acre. His successor, Kropf, reduced the number of seed trees to four or five, which were to be removed within two or three years. In spite of the development of this more rational method, the practitioners under Hatish's approval held mainly to a dark position even for pine, much in the manner of a selection forest, which produced a poor growth of oppressed seedlings, retarding for a long time the development of the pineries. In spruce or fir, either a pure selection forest or a strip system was employed. Attempts at a shelterwood system were made, but experience with the wind danger soon taught the lesson that this was not a proper method with shallow-rooted species. Even Hartish preferred for spruce clearing and planting, and this is still the most favored method with that species. For the deep-rooted and shade-enduring fir, the shelterwood method with a long regeneration period 
was thoroughly established in the Black Forest and in Württemberg by 1818. Natural regeneration being the main method of reproduction until the beginning of the 19th century, artificial means, as is evident from the forest ordinances of Prussia and Bavaria, 1812 and 1814, were usually applied only to repair fail places or to plant up wastes. In this artificial reforestation, with the exception of the planting of oak in pastures, sowing was almost entirely resorted to because it could be done cheaper and easier. But as the sowings were mostly made on unprepared soil and with very large amounts of seed, 30 to 60 pounds per acre, now only 7 to 10 pounds, the results were not satisfactory, either because the seed did not find favorable conditions for germinating, or when germinated the stand was too dense. Planting, if done at all, was done only with wildlings dug from the woods, and usually, following the practice of the planting of oaks in pastures, with saplings, the plant material was too large for success. Nurseries, except for oak, were not known, even Dakota in 1817, and Haya, having to plant up several thousand acres, still relied on wildlings, two or three years old, which he took up with a ball of earth by means of his whole spade, a circular spade reinvented by him and much praised by others. Hatish, in 1833, still advised the use of four- to five-year-old pine wildlings, root pruned, but eventually, having met with poor success, for which he was much discredited, came to the conclusion that unpruned two-year-old plants were preferable. The credit of having radically changed these practices belongs to Pfeil, who, entirely reversing his position, advocated for pine forest a system of clearing followed by sowing, or by planting of wildlings with a ball of earth. Then, suggesting that possibly planting without this precaution could be attempted, and pointing out the necessity of securing a satisfactory root system, he recommended about 1830 the use of one-year-old seedlings grown in carefully prepared seed beds. While for securing these he re relied upon the simple preparation of the soil by spading, Biermans added the use of a fertilizer in the shape of ashes of burned sod. The method of growing pine seedlings and planting them when one to three years old was further developed by Butla, 1845, who introduced the practice of dense sowing in the seed beds. He also invented an ingenious planting iron, or dibble, a half cone of iron which was thrown by the planter with great precision, first to make a hole and then to close it. This was improved by the addition of a long handle into the superior, well-known and much-used Wattenberg planting dibble. At the same time, in 1840, Monteufel devised the method known by his name of planting in mounds, which is especially applicable on wet soils. It was not until 1840 that transplanting of yearling pines with naked roots became general, the widespread application of this latter system resulted in abandoning to a large extent mixed growth, and led to the establishment of pure pine forests, introducing thereby most intensively all the dangers incident to a clearing system and pure forest, which are avoided by the mixed forest, namely insects, frost, and drought. A practice of planting spruce in bunches, originally twelve to twenty plants in a bunch, had been in existence since 1780. This practice increased until 1850 and is still in use in the Hartz Mountains and in eastern Prussia, although the bunches have been reduced so as to contain only from three to five plants, the object of the bunching being to make sure that one or the other of the plants should live. Much discussion as to the merits of this method took place between the old masters, Cotta favoring the small bunches upon the basis of successful plantation of his own, Hartish and Feil opposing it, but finally weakening. Since 1850, however, the practice of setting out single plants has become more general. A reaction from the indiscriminate application of the shelterward method to the hardwoods and of the clearing method to the pine set in during the last quarter of the 19th century 
under the lead of Burckhardt and Gaea. These advocated return to mixed forest, and to natural regeneration with long periods, approaching a selection forest. Geyer, especially, professor of silviculture at Munich, became the foremost apostle of this school. Yet even to this day, the principles of silvicultural treatment under the many different conditions remain unsettled. On the whole, however, with the financial question assiduously brought forward, the clearing system has made most progress, and the selection system has nearly vanished, being replaced by the group method and the shelterwood system. A number of special forms of silvicultural management, applicable under special conditions, have been locally developed, without, however, gaining much ground and being mainly of historical value. Among these may be mentioned a Zabox modified beech forest, which consists in opening up a beech stand so as to secure regeneration, merely to form a soil cover, leaving enough of the old stand on the ground to close up in thirty or forty years. By this treatment, the large increment due to open position is secured without endangering the soil. Similarly, the storied or two-aged high forest was applied to the management of oak forest in mixture with beech. In a few localities also on limited areas, a combination of forest and farming, Waldfeldbau, has been continued and elaborated, besides the more general use of coppice and coppice with standards. According to the statistics for 1900, the following distribution of the acreage under different silvicultural methods prevailed throughout the empire. Total forest, deciduous percent, 32.5. Coniferous percent, 67.5. High forest, deciduous percent, 18.4. Coniferous percent, 60.1. Selection forest, deciduous percent, 2.3. Coniferous percent, 7.4. Coppice, deciduous percent, 6.8. None, coniferous percent. Coppice with standards, deciduous percent, 5. None, coniferous percent. Coniferous forest, of which 68% is pine and 30% spruce, prevails in eastern and middle Germany. Deciduous forest, of which 20% is oak, the balance principally beech in the west and south. Coppice and coppice with standards are mostly in private hands as well as the coniferous selection forest, the state forest being almost entirely high forest, in other words, seed forest other than under selection methods. Methods of improving the crop. The credit of having first systematically formulated the practice of thinnings under the name of Dirschforstung, for the first thinning, Dersch plantierung for the later thinnings belongs to Hattisch, although the practice of such thinnings had been known and applied here and there before his time. He confined himself mainly to the removal of undesirable species, dead and dying, suppressed and damaged trees, being especially emphatic in his advice not to interrupt the crown cover. Excepting the early weeding or improvement cuttings, these thinnings were not to begin until the 50th to 70th year in the broad-leaved forest, but in conifers in the 20th to 30th year. The first attempt to explain on a biological basis the process and effect of thinning was made by Speth in the Special Contribution 1802. Cotta and his silviculture, although at first agreeing with Hartish, later in his third edition in 1821, changes his mind and improves both upon the biological explanation of Speth and the practices of Hattish, pointing out that the latter came too late with his assistance, that the struggle between the individuals should be anticipated, and the thinning repeated as soon as the branches begin to die. But he also recognizes the practical difficulty of the application of this cultural measure on account of the expense. Curiously enough, he recommends severer thinnings for fuel wood production than for timber forests. Feil accentuates the necessity of treating different sites and species differently in the practice of thinnings. Hundeshagen accentuates the financial result and the fact that the culmination of the average yield is secured earlier by frequent thinnings. 
Haya formulates the golden rule, early, often, moderate, but insists that first thinning should not be made until the cost of the operation can be covered by the sale of the material. Propositions to base the philosophy and the results of thinning on experimental grounds, rather than on mere opinion, were made as early as 1825 to 1828, and again from 1839 to 1846 at various meetings of forestry associations, until in 1860 Brunswick and Saxony inaugurated the first, more extensive experiments in thinnings. The two representatives of forest finance, König and Pressler, pointed out in 1842 and 1859 the great significance of thinnings in a finance management as one of the most important silvicultural operations for securing the highest yield. In spite of the advanced development of the theory of thinning, the practice has largely lagged behind because of the impracticability of introducing intensive management. Only lately, owing to improvement in prices and the possibility of marketing the inferior material profitably enough to justify the expenditure, has it become possible to secure more generally the advantages of the cultural effect. Within the last thirty or forty years, great activity has been developed among the experiment stations in securing a true basis for the practice of thinning. New ideas were introduced through French influence and by others independently in the latter part of the 80s when the distinction between the final harvest crop, elite, le hall, and the nurse crop, le bas, was introduced. The conception of such subdivision and the English nomenclature was independently first employed by the writer in his report for 1887 as chief of forestry division when discussing planting plans for the prairies. The physiological reasons for the practice of thinning upon experimental basis were advanced by the botanists Gibbert and R. Hartish, and among foresters the names of Kraft, Lorry, Hauck, Borgrave, Wagner, and others are intimately connected with the very active discussion of the subject lately going on in the magazines. Thinnings have become such an important part of the income of forest administrations, 25 to 40 percent of the total yield, that the prominence given to the subject is well justified, and a more modern conception of the advantages of thinnings, and especially of severer thinnings, is gaining ground. The proposition, now much ventilated, of severe opening up near the end of the rotation in order to secure an accelerated increment, Lichtungshebe, is, however, much older. Hosfeld, in 1824, and Jaeger, in 1850, advocated this measure for financial reasons, while Koenig and Pressler anticipated the development of an individual tree management by pruning and differentiation of final harvest and nurse crop, a method which is working itself out at the present time. 5. Methods of Forest Organization As stated before, to Hattish and Kota belongs the credit of having applied systematically on a large scale methods of forest organization for sustained yield. Hattish, having been active in Prussia since 1811, and Kota beginning to organize the Saxon forests in the same year. The method employed by Hartish, the so-called volume allotment, had been already formulated and its foundation laid by Krechting and others, although Hartish seems to have claimed the invention. But it was reserved to Hartish to build up this method in its detail and to formulate clearly and precisely its application as well as to improve the practice of forest survey, calculation of increment, and the making of yield tables. His method involved a survey, a subdivision, a construction of yield tables, and the formulation of working plans, in which the principle according to which the forest was to be managed during the whole rotation was laid down for each district. The rotation method was determined, divided into periods, finally of twenty years, and the periodic volume yield represented by all stands was distributed through all the periods of the rotation in such a manner as to make the periodic felling budgets approximately equal. Or, since the tendency to increased wood consumption was recognized, 
an increase in the felling budget toward the end of the rotation was considered desirable. Colta based his system of forest organization upon a method described by a Bavarian, Schischler, 1796. It relied primarily upon area rather than volume division. This method was later on, in 1817, called by him Fleischenfachwerk, area allotment. It divides the rotation into periods and allots areas for each periodic felling budget. But before this time, in 1804, Cotta had himself formulated a method of his own, which combined the area and volume method, the volume being the main basis and the area being merely used as a check. While Hartish dogmatically and persistently carried out his difficult scheme, Cotta was open-minded enough to improve his method of regulation, and by 1820, in his Anweisung zur Forst Einrichtung und Abschätzung, he comes to his final position of basing the sustained yield entirely on the area allotment, using the estimate of volume simply to secure an approximately uniform felling budget. He laid particular stress on orderly procedure in the subdivision and progress of the fellings. He did not prepare an elaborate working plan binding for the entire rotation, but merely prescribed the principles of the general management, and after 1816 he confined the formulating of felling and planting plans only to the next decade. A similar method, making a closer combination of volume and area allotment, now known as the combined allotment, in which the area forms the main basis for distributing the felling budgets, was prescribed by Klipstein in 1833. This also confines the working plan to the first period of the rotation, and for this period alone makes a rather careful statement of the expected volume budget. A new budget is then to be determined at the beginning of the next period. This idea of confining the budget determination to a comparatively short period is now generally accepted, the future receiving only summary consideration. These methods of organization were the ones generally applied in practice, and are still with some modifications in practical use. About 1820, however, new theories were advanced which led to the formulation of methods based upon the idea of the normal forest. The conception of a normal forest with a normal stock distributed in normal age classes so as to ensure a sustained yield management was evolved in 1788 by an obscure anonymous official in the tax collector's office of Austria, designed for assessing woods managed for sustained yield. This fertile idea, which is still the basis of forest organization in Austria, and explains better than any other method the principles involved in forest organization, did not find entrance into forestry literature and all its detail until 1811, when André compared this so-called camarotaxe with Hartish's method of regulation. We find, however, that simultaneously with the Austrian invention of this method, Paulson, 1787, proposed to determine the felling budget as a relation between normal stock and normal yield, and in his yield tables, the first of the kind, 1795, he gives the proportion of increment to normal stock in percentic relation, so that the felling budget may either be expressed as a fraction of the stock or as a percent. In beech forests, for instance, he determines the felling budget as 3.3% on best sites, 2.5% on medium, and 1.8% on poor sites. Probably stimulated by André's description, Huber, 1812, developed a method and formula which may be considered the foundation of the later development by Karl Heyer. Felling budget equals I plus S sub A minus S sub N over E. Based upon the normal forest idea, a number of methods were elaborated which, because of their employing a mathematical formula for the determination of the felling budget, are known as formula methods. They are indeed modified rational volume divisions. Hundeshaken has the merit of having first clearly explained the basis of these methods, and himself developed a formula of the correctness of which he was so convinced as to designate his method as the rational one. 
Two other formulae were brought into the world by Kernish, 1838-1851, but the credit of the most complete elaboration, both of the principles of the normal forest idea and of its practical application, belongs to Karl Haya. The principles of his method are briefly. First, determine upon the period of regulation during which the abnormal forest is to be brought nearer to normal conditions, the length of this period to be determined with due regard to the financial requirements or ability of the owner and to the conditions of the forest. The actual stock on hand is then determined and the total increment based on the average increment at felling age of each stand, which will take place during this period, is added. Deducting from this total what has been calculated as the proper normal stock requisite for a sustained yield management, the balance is available for felling budgets which may be utilized in annual or periodic installments during the period of regulation. A working plan is provided which takes care of securing an orderly progress of fellings and proper location of age classes to be revised every ten years. Although this is undoubtedly the most rational method yet devised, it has remained largely unused and is found in somewhat modified application only in Austria and Baden. An entirely new principle in the theory of forest organization was introduced when the aim of forest management was formulated to be the highest soil rent. According to this requirement, the proper harvest time of any stand, or even of any tree, was to be determined by the so-called index percent, and that is a calculation which determines whether a stand or a tree is still producing at a proper, predetermined rate, or is declining. The advocates of this principle were especially Pressler, professor of mathematics at Tarant, 1840-1843, and G. Heyer, son of Karl Heyer, who based his methods on his father's formula, merely introducing values for volumes. Eudeich, director of the Tarant School, also developed in the 60s a method based upon financial theory, which is to attain the highest rate percent on the capital invested in forest production. On the basis of survey and subdivision of working blocks composing a felling series, and with a rotation determined by financial calculations with interest accounts, he makes a periodic area division for determining the felling budget in general, and in addition employs the index percent, as explained for determining in each allotted stand the more exact time for its harvest. While these men pleaded for a strict finance calculation, such as is properly applied to any business making financial results the main issue, the defenders of the old regime, which thought the object of forest management mainly in highest material or value production, advanced as their financial program the attainment of the highest forest rent, as opposed to the highest soil rent. They neglected and derided the complicated interest calculations which have to take into consideration uncertain future developments, and were satisfied with producing a satisfactory balance a surplus of income over expenses, no matter what interest rate on the capital involved in soil and forest growth that might represent. At the present time, these financial propositions are still mainly under heated discussion. In actual practice, the various state forest administrations, with the exception of the Saxon one, continue to rely upon the older methods in regulating the management of their forest properties without reference to financial theories. This is largely due to momentum of the practical existence and application of these methods in earlier times, and the difficulty and impracticability of a change. Just now, however, several of the state administrations are preparing to radically revise their working plans. In Prussia, the instructions for working plans of 1819 formulated by Hartisch were improved upon by his successor, Oberland Forstmeister von Rus, 1836, and these instructions formed the basis of the work of forest regulation until the end of the 19th century. It is a periodic area allotment, with only a summary check by volume. The working plan is only to secure rational location and gradation of age classes. The calculations of yields and specific rules of management are lately confined to the first period and are revised every six years. In Saxony, 
Cotta's area method was systematically developed, and as the larger part of Saxon forest is coniferous, mainly spruce, the proper location of age classes forms a special consideration for the progress of fellings. The determination of volume and increment was left to summary estimates, and the area division became entirely superior. The original idea of Cotta that orderly procedure in the management is of more importance than the actual determination and equalization of yield still pervades the Saxon practice. Since 1860, an attempt has been made to calculate the rotation and determine the felling budget on the principle of the soil rent, at least as a corrective of the annual budget, and in general to lean towards Eudeich's stand management. In Bavaria, after various changes, a complete allotment method of area and volume had come into vogue in 1819, but at the present writing, 1911, an entirely new and modern reorganization has begun, in which most modern ideas, and especially much freedom of movement, even to deviation from the principle of sustained yield, is allowed. In Württemberg, where in 1818 to 1822, a pure volume allotment had been introduced. In 1862 to 1863, the combined allotment method was begun, the felling budget being determined in a general way for the next two or three periods, and more precisely for the first decade, without attempting more than approximate equality. In 1898, new instructions were issued which abandon the allotment method and restrict the yield regulation to designating felling areas for the first period. In Baden, where the forest organization began in 1836 upon the basis of volume allotment, a change was made in 1849 to an area allotment, simplifying to a greater extent than anywhere else the calculation of the yield. Finally, Heyer's method was adopted entirely in 1869. It appears, then, that the schematic allotment methods found the most general application in the earlier time of the period, being favored probably on account of their simplicity in application. The improvement in their present application over the original methods as designed by Hatish and Kota is that now they require no volume calculation for any long future, but are satisfied with making a sufficiently accurate calculation and provision for the proper felling budget for the present. End of section six. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section seven of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernal. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Germany. Six. Forest administration. About the middle of the 18th century, the recognition of the importance of forestry led to a severance of the forest and hunting interests, and it became the practice to place the direction of the former into the hands of some more or less competent man, a state forester, usually under the fiscal branch or treasury department of the general administration. Fully organized forest administrations in the modern sense, however, could hardly be said to have existed before the end of the Napoleonic Wars. 1815, which had undoubtedly retarded the peaceful development of this, as well as of other reforms. The present organization of the large Prussian Forest Department, in its present form, dates from 1820, when Hattish instituted the division into provincial administrations and differentiated them into directive, inspection, and executive services. The direction of the provincial management was placed in the hands of an Oberforstmeister, with the assistance of a number of Forstmeister, who acted mainly as inspectors, each having his inspection district consisting of a number of ranges. The ranges, a hundred thousand to hundred and twenty-five thousand acres, were placed in charge of Oberförster, or Revierförster, who, with the assistance of several underforesters, Förster, conducted the practical work. At first, only indifferently educated, these latter were allowed little latitude, but with improvement in their education, they became by degrees more and more independent agents. This tripartite system of directing, inspecting, and executive officers 
after various changes in titles and functions, finally became practically established in all the larger German states, in some rather lately, as for instance in Bavaria, not until 1885, and in Württemberg in 1887. With this more stable organization, the character and the status of the personnel changed greatly. The prior right of the nobility to the higher positions, which had lasted in some states until 1848, and the practice of making connection with military service a basis for appointment, were abolished. And instead of cameralists, educated foresters came everywhere to the head of affairs. The lower service, which had been recruited from hunters and lackeys, and which was noted for its low social, moral, and pecuniary status, was improved in all directions. The change from incidentals in the way of fees and natural instead of money emolument for the lower-grade foresters, which had been the rule and still play a role even to date, to definite salaries, and the salutary change of methods in transacting business, which Hottish introduced, became general, with the development and improvement of forestry schools, the requirement of a higher technical education for positions in state service could be enforced. Yet, only within the last twenty-five or thirty years has the ranking position of forest officers been made adequate and equalized with that of other public officials of equal responsibility, and still later have their salaries been made adequate to modern requirement. The central administration now lies in the hands of technical men, Oberland Forstmeister, with a council of technical deputies, Land Forstmeister, all of whom have passed through all the stages of employment from that of district managers up. This central office, or division of forestry, is either attached to the Department of Agriculture or to that of Finance, and has entire charge of the question of personnel, direction of forest schools, of the forest policy of the administration, and the approval of all working plans, acting in all things pertaining to the forest service as a court of last resort. The working plans are made and revised by special commissioners in each case, or, as in Saxony, under the direction of a special bureau, with the assistance of the district manager. Upon the basis of the general working plan prepared by these commissions, an annual plan is elaborated by the district managers with consultation and approval of the provincial and central administration. These plans contain a detailed statement of all the work to be done through the year, the cost of each item, and the receipts expected from each source. This annual working plan requires approval by the provincial administration, which is constituted as a deliberative council, consisting of a number of Forstmeister with an Oberforstmeister as presiding officer. The titles of these officers, to be sure, and the details of procedure vary somewhat in different states but the system as a whole is more or less alike. The district manager, or Oberförster, now often called Forstmeister, has grown in importance and freedom of position, although his district has grown smaller, mostly not over 25,000 acres. And being one of the best educated men in the country district, he usually holds the highest social position, although his emoluments are still moderate. He holds many offices of an honorary character, as, for instance, that of Justice of the Peace, and the position of State's Attorney or Public Prosecutor in all cases of infraction of the forest laws. These forest laws are still largely local, i.e. state laws, although the criminal code of the Empire has somewhat unified practice. Curiously enough, Wood on the stump is still not considered property in the same sense as other things, so far as theft is concerned. The stealing of growing timber is not even called theft, the word used in the laws being freffel, tort, and like other infractions against forest laws, it is punished by a money fine, more or less in proportion to the value of the stolen material or the damage suffered. This money fine may be transmuted into imprisonment or forest labor, but corporal punishment, which still prevailed in the first decades of the century, has been abolished. Wood stealing was very general and rampant during the beginning of the century, 
but improvement in the condition of the country population, and in the number and personnel of the forest officers since 1850, has now reduced it to a minimum. Formerly, and until 1848, the administrators and even the forest owners acted at the same time as prosecutor, judge, and executioner, and only in 1879 was this condition everywhere and entirely changed, and infractions against forest laws adjudged by regular courts of law, holding meetings at stated times for the prosecution of such infractions. Nevertheless, the court proceedings in forest matters still vary from the usual court practice, providing a simpler, cheaper, and more ready disposal of testimony and witnesses, and quicker retribution, which is largely rendered possible through having every forest officer under oath as a sheriff, and his statement, and perhaps the confiscated tools employed in the theft, being accepted as prima facie evidence of the infraction. The social position of the underforesters and the Forest Protective Service has also been improved until all charges of incompetency and immorality, which were not undeserved even until past the middle of the 19th century, have become reversed. The Forest Service being morally on as high a plane as all the departments of German administrations. 7. Forest Policy During the first half of the century, the old conception of Forsthoheit, superior right of the princes to supervise and interfere with private property, changed into the more modern conception of the police function of the state, and by 1850, after the revolutionary period, the seigniorage of the princes had passed away. The issue of forest ordinances, the last in 1840, was replaced by the enactment of forest laws, which, since the establishment of representative government, has become a function of legislatures. The tendency to restrict the exercise of private property rights had been assailed by the theories of laissez-faire and the teachings of Adam Smith, and, as a consequence, all the restrictive mandates of the older forest ordinances had been weakened and had more or less fallen into disuse. Especially the attempts to influence prices and markets had nearly, if not entirely, vanished during the first decade. Only for the state forest it was still thought desirable to predetermine wood prices, or at least keep rates low, because wood was a necessary material for the industries. This theory prevailed until perhaps under the lead of Hundeshagen, see above, the propriety of securing the highest soil rent was recognized as the proper aim, when the practice of selling wood at auction in order to secure the best prices became the rule. The regulations regarding export and import between the different states, which had been enacted under the mercantilistic teachings of the last century, see page 52, and the many tariffs which impeded a free exchange of commodities, lasted for a long time while into the 19th century, and were not all abolished until 1865, when under the lead of Prussia the Northern German Federation instituted the Zollverein Tariff Alliance, which abolished not only all tariffs between the states of the Federation, but also tariffs on wood products against the outside world. Import duties were, however, again established in 1879, and the policy of protecting the established organized forest management against competition by importations from exploiting countries has been again and again recognized as proper in the revision of tariff rates and railroad freight rates on the government railroads. During the first decades of the century, the supply question was uppermost, and although such men as File, 1816, laughed at the idea of a wood famine, there was good reason, prior to the development of railroads, of coal fields, of iron and steel manufacturers, etc., for discussing with apprehension the area and condition of supply and the extent of the consumption. Nevertheless, the attitude of the state toward private property was much more influenced by the economic theories than prevalent, which taught the ideas of private liberty, to which the French Revolution had given such forcible expression. With the change of municipal communities from mere associations with common material interests into units or parts of political or state machines, also independence in the management of their property was secured, and many of the old restrictions which had circumscribed this right fell away. Curiously enough, during the French domination under Napoleon, 
the new masters, forgetting the spirit of the revolutionary period, introduced the prescriptions of the old French Ordinance of 1669, which restricted the use of communal property to the extent of excluding the owners entirely from the management of their property, and placed it under government officers. After the French withdrew, this method of course collapsed, although it probably had an influence on the final shaping of forest policies in these respects. Altogether, there was such variety of historic development in the different parts of Germany that it is not to be wondered at that one finds a great variety of policies still prevailing not only in different states, but in different localities of the same state. At the present time, three different principles in the relations of the state to the corporation forests may be recognized, namely, entire freedom, excepting so far as general police laws apply, which is the case with most of the corporation forests in Prussia, Law of 1876, special supervision of the technical management under approved officials with proper education, which is the case in Saxony, most of Bavaria, the Prussian provinces of Westphalia, Rhineland, and Saxony, and in some of the smaller states, or lastly, the absolute administration by the state, which prevails in Baden, parts of Bavaria, provinces Hesse-Nassau and Hanover. The tendency, however, in modern times appears to be toward a more strict interpretation of the obligation of the state to prevent mismanagement of the communal property. Private forest property, which during the preceding century had been largely under restrictions, first under the application of the hunting right, and then under the fear of a wood famine, became in the first decades of the century under the influences already mentioned almost entirely free, all former policies being reversed. Indeed, Prussia in 1811 issued an edict ensuring absolutely unrestricted rights to forest owners, permitting partition and conversion of forest properties, and even denying in such cases the right of inter interference on the part of possessors of rights of users. This policy of freedom was also applied, although less radically, in Bavaria, except as to smaller owners. The result was, to a large extent, the increase of exploitation and forest devastation, creating wastes and setting shifting sand and sand dunes in motion. The reaction which set in against this unrestricted use of forest property resulted in Prussia, not in renewal of restrictive measures, but in the enactment of promotive ones. The law of 1875 saw improvement by encouraging small owners to unite their properties under one management. But the expectations which were founded on this ameliorative policy seem so far not to have been realized. This promotive policy has especially, since 1899, found expression in the institution in many provinces and information bureaus, which give technical advice, make working plans, secure plant material, and give other assistance to woodland owners. A new relation, however, of a conservative character arose by the establishment of the entail, i.e. a contract made by the head of the family with the government under which the latter assumes the obligation of forever preventing the heirs from disposing of, diminishing, or mismanaging their property. As a result of this arrangement, many of the larger private forest properties are forced to a conservative management, not as a direct influence of the law, but as a matter of agreement. The condition of the state supervision of private and communal forest property at present prevailing is expressed in the following statement of divisions by property classes of forest areas of Germany, which shows that at least 63.9% are under conservative management. Total forest, 34,769,794 acres. Crown forest, 1.8%. State forest, 31.9%. Corporation forest, 16.1%. Institute Forest, 1.5%, Association Forest, 2.2%, Private Forest, including 10.4% entail, 46.5%. Until the beginning of the present century, the protective function of the forest had played no role in the arguments for state interference. But just about the beginning of the century, cries were heard from France that, Owing to the reckless devastation of the Vosges and Jura Alps by cutting, by fires and overgrazing, brooks had become torrents, 
and the valleys were inundated and covered by the debris and silt of the torrents. A new aspect of the results of forest devastation began to be recognized, which found excellent expression in a memoir by Muro de Jonas, Brussels, 1825, on the question, What changes does denudation effect on the physical condition of the country? This being translated into German by Wiedemann was widely spread, being interestingly written, although not well founded on facts of natural history and physical laws. Nevertheless, sufficient experience as regards the effect of denudation in mountainous countries had also accumulated in southwest Germany and in the Austrian Alps, and the necessity of protective legislation was recognized. This necessity first found practical expression in the Bavarian Law of 1852, in Prussia in 1875, and in Württemberg in 1879. But a really proper basis for formulating a policy or argument for protective legislation outside of the mountainous country is still absent, although for a number of years attempts have been made to secure such basis. 8. Forestry Science and Literature the necessarily brief statements which are made under this heading presuppose knowledge of the technical details to which they refer. In this short history, it was possible only to sketch rapidly the development of the science in terms familiar to the professional man. The habit of writing encyclopedic volumes, which the Cameralists and learned hunters had inaugurated in the preceding centuries, continued into the new one, and we find Hattish, Kota, Feil and Hundeshagen, each writing such encyclopedias. Karl Heyer began one in separate volumes, but completed only two of them. Even an encyclopedic work in monographs by several authors was undertaken as early as 1819 by J. M. Beckstein, who with his successors brought out fourteen volumes, covering the ground pretty fully. While in the earlier stages the meager amount of knowledge made it possible to compress the whole into small compass, the more modern encyclopedias of Lorry, Furst, and Dombrowski arose from the opposite considerations, namely, the need of giving a comprehensive survey of the large mass of accumulated knowledge. Since 1820, monographic writings, however, became more and more the practice. Among the volumes which treat certain branches of forestry monographically, the works of the masters of silviculture, Cotta, Hattish, and Haya, based on their experiences in West and Middle Germany, and of file, referring more particularly to North German conditions, were followed by the South German writers Gewinna, 1834, and Stumpf, 1849. In 1855, H. Burkhardt introduced in his classic Zane und Pflanzen a new method of treatment, namely by species, and after 1850, when the development of general silviculture had been accomplished, such treatment by species became frequent. Of more modern works on general silviculture elaborating the attempts at reform of old practices, those of Gea, 1880, Wagner, 1884, Borgreve, 1885, Ney, 1885, all writing in the same decade, are to be especially mentioned. In this connection should be also noticed first the valuable collective work on nursery practice, Pflanzen Zucht im Walde, 1882. At present, the magazine literature furnishes ample opportunity to discuss the development of methods in all directions. The textbooks at present appearing seem to be justified by or intended mainly for the needs of the teacher, and rarely for the practitioner. Such a textbook is that by Weiser. But the latest contributions to silvicultural literature by Wagner, 1907, and Maya, 1909, are works of a new order, utilizing broader ecological knowledge. Other branches than silviculture were similarly first treated in comprehensive volumes and then in monographic writings on special subjects of the branch. The literature on forest utilization covering the whole field was enriched especially by Feil, König, Gaia, und Furst. The first investigation into the physical and technical properties of wood was conducted by G. L. Hattish himself, followed by Theodore Hattish, and the subject has been most broadly treated by H. Nerdlinger, 1860. In later years, Schwabach's investigations deserve special mention. The question of means of transportation 
gradually became also a subject capable of monographic treatment, and a series of books came out on locating and building forest roads. Brown issued such a book in 1855 for the Plains Country, and Kaiser, 1873, for the mountains. Also, Mühlhausen, 1876, who had been commissioned to locate a perfect road system over the demonstration forest at the Forest Academy of Münden. Only within the last quarter of the century were railroads introduced into the economy of forest management. The last comprehensive book on the subject of logging railroads was issued by Förster, 1885, and a later one by Runenbaum, Stutzer, 1903, furnished in his compact style the latest discussion on the subject of roads and railroads. A very comprehensive literature on the value of forest litter was brought into existence by the established usage of small farmers of supplying their lack of straw for bedding and manure by substituting the litter raked from the forest. Hartish and Hundeshagen were active in the discussion of this subject as well as almost every other forester, the discussion being, however, mainly based on opinions. But, after 1860, the subject became so important both to the poor farming population and to the forest, which was being robbed of its natural fertilizer, that a more definite basis for regulating its use was established by analysis and by experiments at the experimental stations. With the inauguration of the various methods of forest organizations described before, there naturally went hand in hand the development of methods of measurement. Better forest surveys developed rapidly, the transit generally replacing the compass and plane table. At this period, the necessity for books teaching the important methods of land survey was met by Barr, 1858, and by Kraft, 1865. This subject does no longer occupy a place in forestry literature, the knowledge of it being taken for granted. On the other hand, the subject of forest mensuration, which formerly was generally treated in connection with forest organization, has developed into a branch by itself, and has been very considerably developed in its methods and instruments, making a tolerably accurate measurement of forest growth possible, although many unsolved problems are still under investigation. Still, late into the century, it was customary to measure only circumferences of trees by means of a chain or band, although an instrument for measuring diameters is mentioned by Cotta in 1804 and by Hartish in 1808, Schoener and Richter are in 1813 mentioned as inventors of the first universal forest measure or caliper. The improvement of calipers to their modern efficiency has been carried on since 1840 by Karl and Gustav Haye, and by many others until now self-recording calipers by Rus, Viminala, etc., have become practical instruments. For measuring the heights of trees, Hosfeld had already a satisfactory instrument in 1800. A very large number of improvements in great variety followed, with Faustmann's mirror hypsometer probably in the lead. As a special development for measuring diameters at varying heights, Pressler's instrument should be mentioned, and a very complicated but extremely accurate one constructed by Bremann. Various formulas for the computation of the contents of felled trees had already been developed by Uttelt and others in the 18th century, and a formula by Huber, using the average area multiplied by length, was definitely introduced in the Prussian practice in 1817. The names of Smalian, Hosfeld, Pressler, and others are connected with improvements in these directions. The idea of form factors and their use was first developed by Huber, who made three tree classes according to the length of crowns, measured the diameters six feet above ground, and used reduction factors of 0 .75, 0.66, and 0 .50 for the three classes. But the first formula for determining form factors is credited to Hosfeld, 1812. Hundeshagen and Kernisch also occupied themselves with elaborating form factors. Smalian, 1837, introduced the conception of the normal or true form factor relating it to the area at one twentieth of the height. An entirely new idea has lately been introduced by Schiffel, an Austrian German, under the name of form quotient, placing two measured diameters in relation. Volume tables, giving the volumes of trees of varying diameters and height, were already in use to some extent in the 18th century. 
Cotta gives such for Beach in 1804, and in 1817 furnished a set of so-called normal tables, which were, however, based upon the assumption of a conical form of the tree. Koenig perfected volume tables by introducing further classification into five growth classes, 1813, published volume tables for beech and other species, and in 1840 published volume tables not for single trees but for entire stands per acre classified by species, height, and density, using the so-called space number which he had developed in 1835 to denote the density. It is interesting to note that these tables, which he called Allgemeine Waldschätzungsstaffeln, were made for the Imperial Russian Society for the Advancement of Forestry. In 1840 and succeeding years, the Bavarian government issued a comprehensive series of measurements and a large number of form factors, which were used in constructing volume tables. These were found to be so well made and so generally applicable that they were used in all parts of Germany and translated into meter measurement by BAME, 1872, are still generally in use, although new ones based upon further measurements have been furnished by Lori and Kunze. For arriving at the volume of stands, estimating was relied upon long into the 19th century, although Hossfeld in 1812 introduced measuring, and the use of the formula AHF, in which A was the measured total cross-sectional area of the stand, H and F the height and form factors, the latter being at that time still estimated. He first made form classes for the same heights, but in 1823 simplified the method by assuming an average form factor for the whole stand. Even in 1830, Koenig still estimated the form factor, although he introduced the measurement of the cross-section area and determined the height indirectly as an average of measurements of several height classes. But Huber, 1824, knew how to measure both the average height and form factor by means of an arithmetic simple tree. This method found entrance into the practice and held sway until about 1860, when the well-known improvements by Drought and Urish supplanted it. These last-mentioned methods have become generally used in the practice, while other methods like R. Hartish and Pressler's have remained mainly theoretical. The study of the increment of the making of yield tables, which had been inaugurated toward the end of the last century by Uttelt, Paulsen, Hartish, and others, was just at the end of that century placed upon a new basis through Spät, 1797, who constructed the first growth curves by plotting the cubic contents of trees at different ages, and through Sutter, 1799, by introducing stem analysis on which he based his yield tables. On the shoulders of these, Hossfeld, 1823, built, when he conceived the idea of using sample plots for continued observation of the progress of increment, and he also taught the method of interpolation with limited measurements, laying the basis for quite elaborate formulae. But the first normal yield tables based on the average trees of an index stand were published by Huber, 1824, and in the same year by Hundeshagen. From that time on, yield tables were constructed by many others, but only since the experiment stations undertook to direct their construction is the hope justified of securing this most invaluable tool of forest management in reliable and sufficiently detailed form. Even the newest tables are, however, still deficient, especially in the direction of detailed information regarding the division into assortments. The yield tables of Bauer, Kunze, Weisse, Lorry, and others are now superseded by those of Schwapach for pine and spruce, and Schuberg for fir. As a result of the many yield tables which gradually accumulated, the laws of growth in general became more and more cleared up, and finally permitted their formulation as undertaken by R. Weber, Forst Einrichtung, 1891. The idea of using the percentic relations for stating the increment, and of estimating the future growth upon the basis of past performance for single trees, was known even to Hattish, 1795, and Cotta, 1804, who published increment percent tables. The methods of making the measurements of increment on standing trees were especially elaborated by Kernish, Karl, Edward, and Gustav Heyer, Schneider, his formula, 1853. Jaeger, Borgreve, and especially by Pressler, 1860, 
who opened new points of view and increased the means of studying increment by causing the construction of the well-known increment borer, and in other ways. The most modern textbook which treats fully of all modern methods of forest mensuration, giving also their history, is that of Udo Müller, Lehrbuch der Holzmesskunde, 1899, superseding such other good ones as those of Bauer, 1816-1882, Kunze, 1873, Schwabach, Short Handbook, Last Edition, 1903. The many sales of forest property which took place at the beginning of this period naturally stimulated the elaboration of methods of forest valuation. Even the soil rent theory finds its basis at the very beginning, 1799, in a published letter by two otherwise unknown foresters, Bein and Ebert who proposed to determine the value of a forest by discounting the value of the net yield with a limited compound interest calculation to the 120th year. This idea was elaborated in 1805 by Nerdlinger and Hosfeld into the modern concept of expectancy values, and the now familiar discount calculations were inaugurated by them. Kolta and Hattisch participated also in the elaboration of methods of forest valuation, Cotta, writing his manual in 1804, recognizes the propriety of compound interest calculations, while Hartish, 1812, still uses only simple interest and exhibits in his book as well as in his instructions for practice in the Prussian state forests rather mixed notions on the subject. Altogether, even in the earlier part of the period, there arose considerable differences of opinion and warm discussions in which all the prominent foresters took part as to the use of interest rates and methods of calculation. But this warfare broke into a red-hot flame when Faustmann, 1849, with much mathematical apparatus, developed his formula for the soil expectancy value, and when Pressler and G. Haya transferred the discussion into statical fields, making the question of the financial rotation the issue. Then, the advocates of the soil rent and of the forest rent theories ranged themselves in opposite camps. This war of opinion, although abated in fervor, still continues and the issue is by no means settled. The discussion of what should be considered the proper felling age or rotation naturally occupied the minds of foresters from early times, a maximum volume production being originally the main aim. As early as 1799, Sutter had recognized the fact that the culmination of volume production had been obtained when the average accretion had culminated. Hartish, in 1808, made the distinction of a physical and economical and a mercantilistic, i.e. financial felling age, and Feil, considerably ahead of his time, is the first to call, 1820, for a rotation based on maximum soil rent. As, however, he had so often done he changed his mind, and while he first advocated even for the state a management for the highest interest on the soil capital involved, he later rejected such money management. About the same time, Hundeshagen clearly pointed out the propriety and proper method of basing the rotation on profit calculations, but it was reserved for a man, not a forester, to stir up the modern strife for the proper financial basis, namely Pressler a professor of mathematics at Tarant, who became a sharp critic of existing forest management and developed to the extreme the net yield theories. It was then that the danger of a shortening of the existing rotations, due to the apparent truth that long rotations were unprofitable, called for a division into the two camps alluded to. G. Heyer, Judeich, and Lehr elaborated especially the mathematical methods of the soil rent theory. Kraft, and Wegener came to the assistance of Pressler, while Burkhardt, Bolze, Bauer, Borgreve, Dunkelmann, Fischbach, and others pleaded for a different policy for the state at least, namely the forest rent with the established rotations. As in the previous period, the mathematical subjects, namely forest measurement and forest valuation, were more systematically developed than the natural history basis of forestry practice, the slower progress of the latter being caused by the greater difficulties of studying natural history and of utilizing direct observation. In botanical direction, descriptive forest botany was first developed and several good books were published by Walter, Borkhausen, Beckstein, Reum, the latter 
1814, of high value, and also by Balin, Givina, and Hartish. In the direction of plant physiology, Cota, early and creditably, attempted 1806 to explain the movement and function of sap, but remained unnoticed. Myers, 1805-1808 to 1808 essay on the influence of the natural forces on the growth and nutrition of trees, contains interesting physiological explanations for advanced silvicultural practice, but these sporadic attempts to secure a biological basis were soon forgotten. Not until Theodore Hartish, 1848, published his Anatomy and Physiology of Footy Plants, was the necessity for exact investigation of forest biology as a basis for silvicultural practice fully recognized. With the development of general biological botany or ecology, a new era for silviculture seems to have arrived. Perhaps in this connection there should be mentioned as one of the earlier important contributions of much moment, G. Heyer's Verhalten der Bäume gegen Licht und Schatten, 1856, in which the theory of influence of light and shade on forest development was elaborated. Among those who placed the study of pathology of forest trees on a scientific basis should be mentioned first Wilkom, 1876, followed by R. Hattisch. In zoology, the early writers began with a description of the biology of game animals. Next, interest in forest insects became natural, and in 1818, Beckstein, in his encyclopedia, devoted one volume by Schaffenberg to the natural history of obnoxious forest insects. Toward the middle of the century, with the planting of large areas with single species, insect pests increased. Hence, the interest in life histories of the pests grew and gave rise to the celebrated work by Ratzeburg, Die Waldbewerber und ihre Feinde, 1841. A number of similar handbooks on insects and on other zoological subjects followed, the latest, the most complete work on insects, being still based on Ratzeburg's work, is that of Judaic und Nietzsche, in two volumes, 1895. Of course, the general works on forest protection always included chapters on forest entomology. The first of these textbooks on forest protection was published by La Rope, 1811, and others by Beckstein, Feil, Kalschinger, and recently by Hess, 1896, and first, 1889. Knowledge of the soil was but poorly developed in the encyclopedic works of the earlier part of the period. Not till Liebig's epic-making investigations was a scientific basis secured for the subject. Then became possible the improvements in the contents of such works as Greber, 1886, Zenft, 1888, and of Gustav Heyer, whose volume, Lehrbuch der Forstlichen Bodenkunde und Klimatologie, 1856, well records the state of knowledge at the time, but only since then has this field been worked with more scientific thoroughness by Ebermeyer, Schroeder, Weber, Volny, and by Raman, whose volume on Bodenkunde, 1893, may be still considered the standard of the present day, newest edition, 1910. The question of the climatic significance of forests is one which first became recognized as capable of solution by scientific means when the movement for forest experimentation began to take shape and the systematic collecting of observed data was attempted. Most of the problems are still unresolved. With the aspects of political economy, in reference to forest policy, the foresters had occupied themselves but little, leaving the shape of public opinion to the cameralists, whose influence lasted long into the century. These produced a good deal of literature in the early years of the century when the question of retaining or selling state forests was under discussion, and, under the influence of the teachings of Adam Smith, their opinion was mostly favorable to sale. Only gradually was the propriety of the state forests recognized by them, till finally the leading economists, Rao, Rocher, and Wagner, took a decided stand in favor of this view. The foresters naturally were for retention of the existing state properties, but one-sided mercantilistic views regarding their administration persisted with them till modern times. Vedekind, as early as 1821, advocated the theory which is now becoming a practice, that the state should not only retain, but increase its present forest property by purchase of all absolute forest soil for the purpose of reforestation. 
The erratic and radical file alone was found with the Cameralists on the opposite side in 1816, but by 1834 he had entirely gone over to the side of the advocates of State Forest, declaring anyone who opposed them fit for the lunatic asylum. Division of opinions existed also regarding the supervision by the state of private and communal forests. The political economists were inclined to reduce, the foresters to increase supervision, excepting again file in his earlier writings. He modified his views later by recognizing supervision as a necessary evil. Cota, who was inclined to favor free use of forest property, sought to meet the objections to such free use by increasing the state property. The main incentive urged by the early advocates of state supervision was the fear of a timber famine. This argument vanished, however, with the development of railroads, and was then supplanted by the argument of the protective functions of the forest, a classification into supply forests and protective forests suggesting differences of treatment. Nevertheless, the belief that absolute freedom of property rights in the forest is not in harmony with good political economy a belief correct because of the long-time element involved, still largely prevails. The difficulty, however, of supervising private ownership and the advantages of state ownership find definite expression in the policy which Prussia especially is now following, in acquiring gradually the mismanaged private woodlands and impoverished farm areas for reforestation, making annual appropriations to this end, Many other states are also beginning to see the propriety of this movement. On the whole, the systematic study of the economics of forestry has been rather neglected by foresters. Although the subject was discussed by early writers, Meyer, Lorope, Feil, and in modern times by R. Weber, Lehr, und Schwapach, Forstpolitik, 1894. The latest comprehensive volume on this subject comes from Andres, 1905. 9. Means of Advancing Forestry Science During the century, the means of increasing knowledge in forestry matters have grown in all directions, schools, associations, journals, and prolific literature attesting the complete establishment of the profession and practice. The master schools which began to take shape at the end of the last century, and a number of which were found in the beginning of the century as private institutions, were usually either of short duration or were changed into state institutions. They became either middle schools for the lower service or else academies. For the higher education, the chairs of forestry at the universities continued to do service, as at Heidelberg, Gießen, Leipzig, Berlin, etc. But as these were mostly occupied by Camaralis, although Hartisch in 1811 filled a chair at Berlin, and were intended for the benefit of such rather than of professional foresters, the education of the latter was somewhat neglected. Most of the existing institutions had their beginnings in private schools. Both these and the state schools passed through many changes. The first high-class forestry academy was established at Berlin, directly by the state, in 1821, in connection with the university. Here, Weil was the only professor of forestry subjects, the other subjects being taught by other university professors. The fact that in the absence of railroads a demonstration forest was not easily accessible, and perhaps the friction between Feil and Hartisch, brought about a transfer to Neustadt Eberwald in 1830, with two professors till 1851 when a third professor was added, now sixteen with eight assistants. At the same time, the lectures at Berlin were continued by Hartisch until 1837. In Saxony, Cotta's private school became a state institution in 1816, the Forest Academy of Tarant, with six teachers, now thirteen, and later in 1830 an agricultural school was added to it. In Bavaria, a private school was begun in 1807 at Aschaffenburg. It was made a state institution, divided into higher and lower school, in 1819, but was closed in 1832 on account of interior troubles and inefficiency. It was reopened and reorganized in 1844 with four teachers, and was intended to prepare for the lower grades of the service. Meanwhile, the lectures at the University of Munich, supplementing this lower school, were to serve for the education of the higher grades. A reorganization took place in 1878, when a special faculty for forestry was established at Munich, with Gustav Heyer as head professor. 
This was done after much discussion, which is still going on throughout the empire as to the question whether education in forestry was best obtained at a university or at a special academy. The present tendency is toward the former solution of the question, since railroad development has removed the main objection, namely, the difficulty of reaching a demonstration forest. Nevertheless, Prussia retains its two forest academies, Eberswald and Münden, since 1868, for the education of its forest officials, the other state academies being at Tarant and Eisenach, while chairs of forestry are found at the universities of Tübingen, since 1817, Gießen, since 1831, and Munich, and for Baden at the Polytechnicum in Karlsruhe, 1832. For the lower grades of forest officials, there are also schools established by the various governments, three in Prussia, five in Bavaria. In 1910, the school at Aschaffenburg was discontinued and the entire education of foresters for Bavaria left to the university. Although as early as 1820, Hundeshagen had insisted upon the necessity of exact investigation to form a basis for improved forest management, and especially for forest statics. And although, in 1848, Karl Heyer elaborated the first instruction for such investigations which he expected to carry on with the aid of practitioners, the apathy of the latter and the troublesome times prior to 1850 retarded this powerful means of advancing forestry. During the decade from 1860 to 1870, however, the movement for the formation of experiment stations took shape, the first set being instituted in Saxony, 1862, by establishing nine stations for the purpose of securing forest meteorological data, the next in Prussia in 1865 to solve the problems of the removal of litter, and in Bavaria, 1866, also for the study of forest meteorology by Ebermeyer, and of the problem of thinnings. But not until Bauer, 1868, had pointed out more elaborately the necessity of systematic investigations, and a plan for such had been elaborated by a committee instituted by the German Foresters Association, was a system of experimentation as organized in modern times secured in 1872. The various states established independently such experiment stations, but at the same time, a voluntary association of these stations was formed for the purpose of coordinating and planning the work to be done. Forestry associations, instituted merely for the purpose of propaganda, were apparently not organized. The first association of professional foresters appears to have been formed as the result of Beckstein's conception, who proposed in connection with his school, 1795 at Golta, 1800 at Dreisickaga, the formation of an academy of noted foresters. As a result, the Société der Forst und Jagdkunde was formed, in which all the noted foresters joined with much enthusiasm, and in 1801 a membership of 81 regular and 61 honorary members was attained. At the same time, the official organ Diana was founded, 1797, in which the essays of the members were to be printed, after having passed four censors. Two sessions were to be held annually, this much too elaborate plan for, then, rather undeveloped education and deficient means of transportation, defeated to some extent the great object. But 1812, it was thought necessary to divide the academy at least into a northern and southern section, and for the latter, an additional journal, edited by La Rope, was instituted. The interest, however, decreased continually, and by 1843, at Beckstein's death, the academy was abandoned. At the same time, there had sprung up a number of local associations in the modern sense, the first in 1820 composed of the foresters and agriculturalists of Nassau, the next in 1839 of the foresters of Baden, and by 1860 nine such local societies of foresters were in existence, and they have since increased rapidly until now some thirty may be counted. The desire to bring these local associations into relation with each other led to the first forestry congress in 1837, Congress der Land und Forstwirte, meeting at Dresden. At that time, and in the Congresses following, the agriculturalists played a reading part, so that in 1839 the South German foresters separated, and peripatetic Congresses were held every one or two years. In 1869, a general organization was determined upon, and in 1872 the first General German Congress of Foresters met, holding yearly meetings thereafter. 
a rival association having been organized in 1897, two years later an amalgamation of the two was effected in the Deutsche Forstverein, now over 2,000 members. The most striking feature of this forceful means of advancing forestry is the institution of the Forstwirtschaftrat, 1890, a permanent committee of about 50 members, which is to look after the political and economic interests of forestry, forming a semi-official national council. There also exists an international association of forest experiment stations. The magazine literature, the Cameralis, dominated until the 18th century. The first journal edited by a forester was Reiter's Journal for Forst und Jagdwesen, which ran from 1790 to 1797. During the first part of the century, many others were started, especially after 1820, usually failing soon for lack of support. Hottish himself participated in this literature with five volumes, until 1807, of Journal de Forst, Jagd und Fischereiswesen, and later, 1816-1820, with the semi-official journal Forst und Jagd Archive. Files, Kritische Blätter, were continued by him from 1823 to 1859, when Nerdlinger had the editorship till 1870. An irregular publication of much note was Burkhardt's Aus dem Walde, 1865 to 1881. Some of the journals founded in earlier times have continued, with changes in title and editorships, to the present day. Of these, it is proper to mention as the oldest, Allgemeine Forst und Jagdzeitung, founded by von Behlen, 1825, later conducted by G. Haye. Forst Wissenschaftliches Centralblatt, 1828. Zeitschrift für Forst und Jagdwesen, founded in 1869 by Dunkelmann. Forstliche Blätter, founded 1861 by Grunert, continued by Borgreve until 1890. The Tarante Forstliche Jahrbücher were begun in 1842, and the Mündener Forstliche Hefte in 1892. In 1893, the Forstliche Naturwissenschaftliche Zeitschrift was established to discuss mainly the biological basis of forestry, changed in 1903 to Naturwissenschaftliche Zeitschrift für Land und Forstwesen. For the lower grades, there has been published, since 1872, Zeitschrift der Deutschen Forstbeamten. Several lumber trade journals also discuss forestry matters. A weekly journal, Silva, was begun in 1908. To assist in keeping track of the historic and scientific development of the art, an annual summary of magazine literature is being published. The first effort in this direction was made in 1876 by Bernhardt's Chronik des Deutschen Forstwesens, which was continued for several years, but is now supplanted by Jahresbericht über die Leistungen und Forschritte der Forstwirtschaft since 1880. Besides this more scientific magazine literature, pocket books and calendars have been published from early times, the regular annual appearance of the latter, giving detailed statistics, personalia, tables useful in the practice, etc., dates from 1851. With the accomplishment of the unity of the empire in 1871, with the establishment of the experiment stations and their association in 1872, and with the organization of the Society of German Foresters, which dates from the same year, a new and most active era in the development of forestry science may be recognized, the tendency of which is to lift the art out of the shackles of empiricism and place it on a more scientific basis. End of section 7. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 8 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Austria Zur Fortgeschichte Österreich by Binder von Kriegelstein in Verhandlungen der KK Landwirtschaftsgesellschaft, 1836. Geschichte der österreichischen Land- und Forstwirtschaft und ihre Industrieren, 1848-1898, five volumes, 1902, Parts Referring to Forestry, Volumes 4 and 5, by Dr. von Gutenberg and 15 others. A unique and most comprehensive work, magnificently published as a jubilee of the semi-centennial of the coronation of Emperor Franz Josef. Die Forste der Staats und Fortsgüter, by Karl Schindler. 
1885 and 1889, two volumes, pages 487 and 742, contains in greatest detail, with historical data, a description of the state and fund forests and their management. Jahrbuch der Staats und Fondsgüter Verwaltung, nine volumes, L. Dimitz, 1897-1904, continued. Erkunden Sammlung zur Geschichte der ungarischen Forstwirtschaft by Albert V. Bedeu, 1896, in Magyar. Die wirtschaftlichen und kommerziellen Beschreibungen der Wälder des ungarischen Staates by A. von Bedeau, 2nd edition, 1896, 4 volumes, 2,242 pages, 4th, published as a jubilee, of the ten centennial existence of Hungary. First volume contains the general description, third volume the details of government forests. A magnificent work describing in detail the forests and forest management of Hungary. This is briefed by the same author in the chapter in The Millennium of Hungary and Its People by Jakob Folosi, 1897. Germany's neighbor to the southeast, and until 1866 a member of the German Empire or Federation, largely settled by Germans and hence swayed by German thought, developed forestry methods on much the same lines as the mother country. Yet there are differences to be found due to difference in economic development, and there is for the United States perhaps more to be learned from Austria in the matter of introducing forestry methods, especially as lately practiced in Bosnia-Herzegovina, than from any other country, for economic conditions are in several respects alike. The interest in the forest history of Austria lies especially in the fact that private forest property in large holdings is predominant, and that large areas are still untouched or just open to exploitation, so that Austria is still in the list of export countries, although in some parts intensive management has been long in existence. In the main, although movements for reform in forest use date back to the Middle Ages, the condition of forestry in Austria was past the middle of the 19th century still most deplorable, and in a stage of development which most of the German states had passed long before. But in the last fifty years such progress has been made that both science and practice stand nearly, if not quite, on the same level with those of their German neighbors. If Germany exhibits in its different parts a great variety of development, political and economic, Austria, although long under one family of rulers, since 1526, exhibits a still greater variety due to racial, natural, and historical differences within its own borders. It is indeed an extraordinary and singular country, without an equal of its kind, except perhaps Turkey, in that it is not a national but a dynastic power, composed of unrelated states or lands, with people speaking different languages, mixed races widely different in character. These were gradually aggregated under one head or ruling family, the Habsburgs, who as Archdukes of Austria occupied the elective position of German emperors for several generations. And after the collapse of the empire in 1806, retained the title and called themselves emperors of Austria. The kingdom of Hungary alone, which was joined to the Habsburg dominions by election of its people in 1526 and under new relations in 1867, with at least 50% Hungarians is a national unit with a national language, Magyar, while all other parts have in their composition a preponderatingly Slavish population, although German elements have the ascendancy more or less everywhere. Not less than ten different languages are spoken among the forty-odd million people, of whom the Germans comprise about one quarter, the Hungarians one-third, the balance being Slavs. Originally this section of the country was occupied by Germans with the German institution of the Mach, but when the Slavish and Magyar tribes pressed in from the east, it became the meeting ground of the three races, and during the first one thousand years after Christ, the East Mach formed the bulwark of the German Empire against the Eastern invaders, who were in succession the Slavs, the Huns, the Turks. With the unexpected election of Rudolf of Habsburg, 
a little-known prince of small possessions to the dignity of German emperor in 1272, the foundation of the Austrian Empire was laid. The Archduchy of Austria he secured by conquest in 1282, and around this nucleus all the other territories were from time to time aggregated by the Habsburgs through marriage, conquest, or treaty. At one time their rule extended over Spain, the Netherlands, Switzerland, Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia. The abdication of Francis II in the year 1806 prepared the separation from Germany, although Austrian influence persisted in Germany until 1866 when, by the crushing defeats suffered at the hands of Prussia, its place and voice was permanently excluded from German councils. By arrangement with Hungary, the new dual empire of Austria-Hungary came into existence and gave a new national life and new policies to the coalition, which is to amalgamate these southeastern territories into a homogeneous nation. By the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, this territory of 241,942 square miles, with over 45 million people, was further increased by the addition of the Turkish provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, with 1,250,000 inhabitants and 23,262 square miles. First, merely placed under Austria's suzerainty and administration, in 1908 incorporated as an integral part. It is natural that, corresponding to this great diversity of ethnological elements and historical development, we should find a great variety of forest conditions and uneven development of forestry. While in Bohemia, Moravia, and Silesia the most intensive management has long been practiced, in the Carpathians of Galicia and in Hungary rough exploitation is still the rule, and in other parts large untouched forest areas still await development. We can distinguish at least seven regions thus differently developed. The northwest, with Bohemia, Moravia, and the remaining part of Silesia, settled the longest, and the longest under forest management. The northeast, Galicia, with the Carpathian Mountains, still largely either exploited or untouched. The Danube lands, or Austria proper, with the Vienna forest and the forest connected with the salt works in Upper Austria and Styria, under some management since the 12th and 16th centuries, respectively. The Alp territory, including Tyrol and Salzburg, parts of Styria, Carinthia, and Crane, much devastated long ago and offering all the problems of the reboisement work of France. The coastlands along the Adriatic with Dalmatia, Istria, and Trieste, which from ancient times under Venetian rule bring with them the inheritance of a mismanaged limestone country, creating the problems of the cost reforestation which has baffled the economist and forester until the present time. The two new provinces east of this region, Bosnia and Herzegovina, with rich forest areas have only lately begun to be treated under modern conservative ideas, and finally Hungary, with a great variety of conditions itself. The large forest percent, a little over 24 million acres, or over 32% of the land area, is due to the mountainous character of the country the Alps occupying a large area on the west and southwest, the Carpathians stretching for 600 miles on the northeast, various mountain ranges encircling Bohemia, the Sudetes forming part of the northern frontier and the Wienerwald and other lower ranges being distributed over the empire and bounding the fertile valleys of the Danube and its tributaries. At least 20% is unproductive. The climate in the northern portion of Austria is similar to that of southern Germany, in the southern portions to that of Italy, while Hungary partakes of the characteristics of a continental plains climate with low rainfall and extreme temperature ranges. In addition to the tree species found in Germany, there are of economic value four species of pine, Pinus austriaca, Sembra, Penea, Halepensis, two oaks, Cacus ilex and suber, and the chestnut Castanea vesca. Conifer forest is prevailing in Austria with 82%. Deciduous forest in Hungary, mostly beech and oak, with 75%, 27% being oak in pure stands. 
The following pages refer to Austria proper, Hungarian conditions being treated separately further on. The value of the total raw product exported from the Austrian forests, some 180 million cubic feet, may be estimated at over $50 million annually. 1. Property Conditions on the whole, property conditions developed not unsimilarly to those of Germany. There were free men and serfs to start with, developing into barons, peasants, burghers. There were ban forests, royal domain, forests of the mock, and private properties, rights of users or servitudes, and all the methods and conditions that were developed in other parts of Europe are also found here only perhaps differing in time and rate of progress in their development. As a result of gradual changes, the present distribution of property resulted, in which the state ownership is comparatively small, namely, in Austria proper, not more than 7.3%, with 2.8 million acres of which nearly one-third is unproductive land, while private ownership represents over 58.6%. Of this, 34% is in large landed estates, among which those of the princes of Liechtenstein and of Schwarzenberg, with round 350,000 acres and 290,000 acres respectively, are the largest. And 25 others, with from 50,000 to 230,000 acres, may be named. By the middle of the 19th century, at least 75% of the forest area was in large compact properties a guarantee for the possibility of forest management. The industrial development of the last decade has, however, led to considerable exploitation. In Upper and Lower Austria, and in the Alpine region, small private ownership prevails. The communal forest comprises 13%, entailed forest 8%, and the rest belongs to church and other institutions. These so-called Fons Forsta are in part under government administration. 2. First Attempts at Forest Control The oldest record of attempts at an orderly management in any part of the empire seems to date back to the 12th century, when the city forest of Vienna had been placed under management. During the 16th and 17th century, this property appears to have been managed upon the basis of careful surveys and estimates. We also find a definite forest organization in the forest attached to the ducal salt mines in Styria by 1524, and the dams, canals, and waterworks for floating timber developed by 1592 through Thomas Seauer were the wonder of the times. In 1524 also, Archbishop Matthias Lang of Wellenberg issued a forest ordinance which was full of wise prescriptions, probably a little heated, a forest ordinance of 1599 refers to burning of tops and care of young growth in fellings. Generally speaking, as in Germany proper, forest ordinances were issued from time to time by the dukes under the theory of the Forsthoheit, applying to limited territories and attempting to regulate forest use. No uniformity existed. The iron industry in the more northern provinces had led early to a more conservative use of forest properties for fuel, and since the mines were regal property, the dukes had a special interest in their conservation. In the Alp territory, especially in Styria, the regal right to the mines combined with the forced whole height led early to the reservation by the dukes of whatever forest was not fenced or owned by special grant for the use of the mines. In addition, a superior right was asserted by them in some of the private forests to all the forest produce beyond the personal requirements of the owners, for use of the mines at a small tax, and what other private property existed was burdened by innumerable rights of user. The exercise of these rights and the warfare against irksome restrictions led to widespread illegal exploitation and devastation, which as early as the 15th century had proceeded to such an extent that in Tyrol associations for protection against the torrents were already then in existence. Yet in this province scantily populated, with one-third of its area unproductive and one-third forested, wasteful exploitation continued until recent times. In Crane, which was unusually well-wooded, forest reservations were made for the use of the mines and furnaces in 1510 and 1515. 
these reservations comprising all forest lands within a given radius. The balance was mostly divided among small owners whose unrestricted, unconservative exploitation continued until the latter half of the 19th century. In Styria, nearly one-half wooded and one-third unproductive, a regulated management was attempted as early as 1572 and by subsequent forest ordinances of 1695, 1721, and 1767, devastation was to be checked. But the resistance of the peasants to the regulations and the efficiency of the forest service were such that no substantial improvement resulted. In Galicia, unusually extensive rights of user in the crown forest led to their devastation, and the attempts to regulate the exercise of these rights by ordinances in 1782 and 1802 were unsuccessful. The forest area along the coast of the Adriatic in Istria and Dalmatia had furnished ship timber even to the ancients. The Venetians becoming the owners of the country in the 15th century declared all forests national property, reserved for ship timber, and placed them under management. They instituted a forest service, regulated pasturing, and forbade clearing. The oak coppice was to be cut in eight- to twelve-year rotation, with standards to be left for timber, etc. A reorganization of this service with division into districts is recorded in the 16th century, when Charles V in 1520 instituted a forest college, i.e. administration. But the district officers, Capitani ai Boschi, being underpaid, carried on a nefarious trade on their own account, and by 1775 the whole country was already ruined in spite of attempts at reform. The cost problem remained unsolved, and when Austria secured Dalmatia in 1897, that country was too found in the same deplorable condition, the forest area there in the hands of the peasants having suffered by pasture and indiscriminate cutting. It was the work of Maria Teresa to reform the administration of the various branches of government, and wholesome legislation was also extended to the forest branch by her forest ordinance of 1754, which remained in force until 1852. It relieved the private owners who held most of the forest area from the restrictions hitherto imposed, except in the frontier forests. These, for strategic reasons, were to be managed according to special working plans prepared by the Patriotic Economic Society. The management of communal forests also was specially regulated. Otherwise, the ordinance merely recommended in general terms orderly system and the stopping of abuses. In 1771, another forest ordinance proposed to extend the same policy of private unrestricted ownership to the karst forests, with the idea that thereby better conditions would most likely be secured. But, since here the property was not as in Bohemia in large estates, but in small farmers' hands, the result was disastrous, as we shall see later. It merely led to increased devastation. The same result followed the increase of private peasant ownership which came with the abolishment of serfdom in 1781. In 1782, an ordinance full of wise prescriptions against wasteful practice intended for the Northwest Territory sought to check the improvident forest destruction. A further wholesome influence on private forest management was exercised by the Tax Assessment Reform in 1788, when not only a more reasonable assessment, but for the first time a difference was made in taxation of managed as opposed to unmanaged woods, and the epic-making fertile idea of the normal forest was announced. See page 115. At the same time, the hunting privileges and other burdens hampering forest properties were abolished and measures for the extinguishment of the rights of user enacted. 3. Development of Forest Policy As appears from the foregoing sketch of early attempts at forest control, no uniformity existed in the empire, each province being treated differently, and the regal rights being applied differently in each case. Originally, the regular circuit or district governments had charge not only of the management of state forests, but also of the forest police and the regulation of the management of communal forests. This supervision was exercised by the political administration, often without technical advisers, and the different provinces had developed this service very variably. While in some provinces no special effort was made to look after these interests, 
the laws remaining mainly dead letters, in others a better system prevailed. In Styria, for instance, in 1807, five forest commissioners and twenty district foresters were employed, but this organization was of short duration. A loose administration of the forest laws was most general. The movement for reform and to secure general law for the empire controlling forest use dates from the year 1814. But only after the political reaction of 1848, and when the severe floods of 1851 had forcibly called attention to the unsatisfactory state of things, was the necessity of change recognized. In 1852, such a general law was enacted, supplanting all the forest ordinances with minor exceptions. This law, which in the main is still in force, distinguishes between banned forests and protective forests. The former are such as require in their management consideration of their protective value to adjoining private or state property and personal safety, e.g., to prevent landslides, snowslides, avalanches, etc., Protection forests are specifically located forests which, for their own continuance as well as for that of neighboring ones, must be managed under special restrictions, e.g. on sand dunes, shores of waters, steep slopes. The dangers which they are to prevent being more of an indirect or hidden nature, and only produced by their mismanagement. The control also is of a more general nature, the owner being allowed to manage his property within general prescriptions while the banned forests are protective forests of a higher order and are more strictly and more directly controlled by the authorities. The declaration of a banned forest and the prescription for the conservative management depend on the findings of a commission assisted by experts since 1873. The execution of the law, however, being left to the political administration of the provinces, jealousies between imperial and provincial governments, and fear of resistance and ill will of forest owners, prevented a strict and uniform application of the law. Hence, from time to time, we find ministerial rescripts and special provincial legislation to secure a more energetic enforcement of the law. At first, the reform had reference mainly to the Alp districts, which had suffered the most, and in Tyrol, at least, an organization was created in 1856, which was to manage the state forests, supervise the management of corporation forests, and exercise the forest police. Not until the years 1871-74, to 74, however, was a similar service extended to other portions of the empire. But at the end of that period, the entire empire had been placed under the administration of a forest protective service, an organization quite distinct from the state forest administration. In 1900, there were placed under this service nearly two million acres of protective and somewhat over 150,000 acres of banned forests. But some five to six million acres of private or communal forest was under some other restrictive policy. In 1888, this service consisted of 14 forest inspectors, 56 forest commissioners, 63 forest adjuncts, and 80 assistants and forest guards. In addition, 252 special appointees and officers of the State Forest Administration were doing duty in this service, so that altogether, nearly 500 persons were then employed in carrying on the protective forest policy of the state. In 1910, there were 388 technical attachés to the provincial authorities employed, and 124 on reboisement work, while the state administration employed only 297 officials of the higher grade. The law declares the function of this technical service to be, quote, to assist the political government by technical advice and observation in supervising forest protection and in the application of the forest laws." Unquote. In 1883, the functions of this organization were extended quote, to instruct and encourage forest owners in forest culture and to manage forests designated to be so managed. Unquote. The service has been so satisfactory that, while at first much complaint against the enforcement of the regulations was heard, Owners now ask constantly for its extension. The details of the duties devolving upon this organization are found in a series of laws, applicable to different parts of the empire, which are based upon the recognition of protection forests in which sanctioned working plans regulate the management. Forcible reforestation and employment of competent foresters in these are obligatory. Now, 
Altogether, about 60% of the Austrian forest area is managed under working plans. A special reboisement law for the extinction of destructive torrents was the result of unusual damage by floods in Tyrol and Carinthia in 1882. The basis for this legislation was laid by a translation from the French of de Montsay's great work on the reboisement of mountains by Van Seckendorf in 1880, and a subsequent report by the same author in 1883. A law similar to that of the French was enacted in 1884 for the regulation of torrential streams. A special fund for the work was created to which the interested parties are required to contribute, assisted by annual subventions from the state. The contributions of the state have averaged from 40 to 60 percent, of the provinces 20 to 50 percent. The interested parties having contributed 30 percent of the round $5 million expended on this work by 1901. In 1910, the contribution to the Amelioration Fund by the state had grown to $1.6 million. At the same time, for the regulation of the lower rivers, an appropriation of $1,350,000 was made, of which $400,000 was to be used for reforestation work. This work, as well as the reforestation of the cost, see page 173, under the laws of 1881, 1883, 1885, is carried on by the Forest Protective Service. On the whole, the forest policy of Austria tends toward harmony with forest owners and liberation of private property. By reduction of railroad freights which are under government management, by abolition of export duties, by reasonable tax assessments, etc., the wood export trade, now exceeding $30 million, is favored. By the extinction of rights of user under liberal laws, improvement in forest management is made possible. The emperor setting a good example by having renounced in 1858 his superior right to forest reservations in the Alp districts. The best exemplification of the spirit of the Austrian forest policy and of the methods of forest organization and administration is to be found in the administration of the provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, described in a volume published in 1905 by the veteran Austrian forester Ludwig Dimitz. Die forstlichen Verhältnisse und Einrichtungen Bosniens und der Herzegovina, Ludwig Dimitz, Vienna, 1905, page 389. See Forest Quarterly, volume 3, page 113. Here, the Austrian government has, in the short time of 25 years, succeeded in bringing orderly conditions into the forest management. Until 1878, these countries were provinces of Turkey and were placed under Austrian suzerainty as a result of the Russo-Turkish War. The Turks had already attempted a management of the forest lands which were in their entirety claimed by the Sultan. Property conditions being entirely unclear when the Austrians assumed the administration, these questions had first to be settled by a survey. This survey resulted in showing a forest area of 6.3 million acres, 51% of the land area, of which probably all but about 1.5 million acres is private or communal property. Half of the state property is fully stocked, and it is estimated that about 100 million cubic feet is the annual increment. 4. State Forest Administration the state domain in the first half of the 19th century had been reduced by sales from nearly 10 million acres to 4.5 million acres, and to a little over 3 million acres in 1855. In that year, about one-half of this property was handed over to the National Bank to secure the state's indebtedness of $30 million, and between 1860 and 1870, further sales reduced the domain to about its present size of 1.8 million acres productive forest. In 1872, however, a new policy and the present organization were instituted. Before 1849, the forest properties which the Crown or State owned in the various territories were not managed as a unit or in any uniform manner, but a number of separate provincial or territorial forest administrations existed, which were often connected with mining administrations and were placed under the Minister of Finance. These, under the influence of the educated foresters issuing from the newly established forest school, had, to be sure, been much improved. Nevertheless, the Camaralis, as in Germany, were at the head of affairs and kept the technical development back until after the revolution of 1848, 
when the accession of Franz Josef I brought many reforms and changes in methods of administration. A ministry of soil culture and mining was created in that year, and as a branch of it a forest department, separated from the department of the chase. To the head of this forest department was called a forester, Rudolf Feistmantel, who elaborated an organization. But before much had been accomplished, the ministry and its forest department were abolished, 1853, and the forest domain again transferred to the Ministry of Finance. Feistmantel returned in 1856 as chief of the forest division in that ministry, and his organization of the forest property of the state into forest districts, under forest managers, and into provincial forest directions, was perfected. Matters, however, did not thrive, and only when public attention and indignation had been aroused by a policy of selling state property, a change of attitude took place in 1872, which led to the present organization. This places the State Forest Administration in the Department of Agriculture, with an Oberland Forstmeister, and two assistants as superior officers, and the rest of the organization is also very nearly the same as that in vogue in most German states, each province having a directive service of Oberforstmeister with Forstmeister as inspectors, and Oberförster with the assistance of Forstwarte as executive officers. In addition, a special corps of forest engineers and superior forest engineers is provided for the elaboration of working plans. Lately, 1904, a reorganization of the central office, provided, besides the Department of Administration of State and Funds Forests, a Department of Reboisement and Correction of Torrents, and a Department of Forest Policy charged with the promotion of forest culture, including the education of foresters and similar matters. Most of the state property is located in the Alps and Carpathian Mountains at an elevation above 2,000 feet. Hence, financial results do not make a good showing. Since 1885, it has been the policy to add the state forest area by purchase, and by 1898, over 350,000 acres had been added to it. 5. Progress of Forest Organization since 1873, working plans according to unified principles have been prepared for most of the state property, so that by 1898, about 82% was under regulated management. The progress made in bringing forest areas under organized management varied greatly in the different provinces. In northeastern Austria, the first methods of regulated management consisted, as in the neighboring territories of Germany, in a simple division into felling areas. The example of the neighbors was also followed later in the northwestern provinces, and in both regions this method was improved upon by allotment according to the propositions of Hartisch and Cotta. In addition, since 1810, the method of Austrian Kameraltaxe, with the new and fertile idea of the normal forest, began to be employed. See page 115. The new method now largely employed is an area allotment checked by the normal forest formula. Especially in Bohemia, most of the large baronial properties had by 1848 been put under a regular system of management according to Saxon and Prussian precedent. The influence of the former was especially strong, and Saxon foresters were largely employed to regulate the management. Most prominent among these was Judeich who became the director of the Austrian Forest School at Weisswasser, afterwards of Tarant. By 1890, over 83% of the total forest area of Bohemian, capable of such management, had been placed under rational working plans according to the most modern conception, and nearly the same proportion in the neighboring provinces of Moravia and Silesia. In the Alps territory and in the Danube provinces, the regulation of forest management has not progressed with the same rapidity, partly owing to the existence of the many hampering rights of user. Only here and there are properties managed intensively. By 1890, only 23% were managed under rational working plans, 40% state and 60% private and communal property, mostly regulated by a combined area and volume method. In Styria, in the forests attached to the mines, we find already in 1795 quite a remarkable effort in the manner of working plans. Such a plan by an unknown author deals with volume tables and sample area methods for determining the stock. But 
The fine plan was stowed away in a cupboard, and when, in 1830, Forest Councillor von der Baldinger proposed to apply a similar plan, he had to wait seven years before permission for a trial was granted. He continued, however, the organization of these forests until 1848, using Hundeshagen's use per cent in the selection forest, and volume allotment for the woods managed under clearing system. In Lower Austria, the Vienna State Forest of 70,000 acres had for a long time received attention, the first thorough forest survey and yield calculation being made in 1718-20, to 20, revised in 1782-86, to 86, and regulated for the shelter wood system in 1820. Within the last 50 years, the method has been changed again and again until, in 1882, the present Austrian method based on normal stock principles was applied. Since in this province 50% of the forest area is small peasant property and communal forest, which are usually managed without systematic plans, the 33% under working plans represents more than half of the area capable of such management. In Upper Austria, where the salt works are situated, the attempts at regulated management in connection with these date back to the middle of the 16th century, and, after various changes, these forest areas were, by 1888, placed under working plans of modern style. Over 50% of the forest area of this province is so regulated. One of the most modern working plans, based upon Pressler's soil rent theory and a most intensive silviculture, is that of Baron Mayer Melnhoff on his estate Kogel. These details are merely brought forward to illustrate the great variation both in the progress of development and in the present conditions in different parts of the empire, similar differences being found in other portions. Suffice it to say that in round numbers about 1,500,000 acres are managed under more or less intensive working plans, and of the balance, 7 million acres are farmers' woodlots, on which only silvicultural treatment is necessary. 6. Development of Silviculture The necessity for conservative forest use and reforestation did not arise as early in Austria as it did in Germany. It was not until the middle of the 19th century that this necessity became apparent in most of the provinces, when German experiences in silviculture could be readily utilized. In Bohemia, the clearing system with artificial reforestation, mostly by seed, had been introduced at the beginning of the century for the conifer forests, planting as a rule being resorted to only in fail places. For this planting, wildlings were mostly used in the broadly forest the selection system and to some extent the shelterward method were largely followed. The strip system was also much employed and as the felling areas were often made too large, undue increase of undesirable softwoods resulted. During the last fifty years, silvicultural theory and practice developed very much on the same lines as in Germany, more intensively in the densely populated and more accessible regions and less so in the more distant and thinly settled mountain districts. The most noted work of reforestation, which has occupied Austrian foresters for the last forty years or more, is that of the cost, a name applied to the wastelands in the mountain and hill country of Istria, Trieste, Dalmatia, Montenegro, and adjacent territories skirting the Adriatic Sea. It is a dry limestone country of some 600,000 acres in extent, stony and rough, and over-drained. Originally well forested with conifers and hardwoods, it had furnished for ages ship timber and other wood supplies to the Venetians. Through reckless cutting, burning, and pasturing by the small farmers, it had become almost entirely denuded, natural reforestation being prevented by these practices, combined with the dryness of the soil intensified by the deforestation. For centuries, Countless laws were passed to stop the progress of devastation, but without effect. The first attempt at planting was made by the city of Trieste in 1842, and found some imitators, but with meager result. In 1865, the Austrian government, acting upon representations of the Forestry Association, undertook to encourage and assist private landowners in reforesting their karst lands by remitting taxes on reforested lands for a period of years, by technical advice and by assistance with plant material and money. By this move, so much land was withdrawn from pasture and taxation that opposition was aroused among the cattle owners, which led to additional legislation during the years 1882 to 1887, 
and finally to the creation of a commission charged to select the lands, which in the interest of the country required reforestation, and empowered to enforce this improvement within a given time, the state expropriating the lands of objecting owners. At the same time, the commission brought about the division of pasture lands which were held in communal ownership. By 1909, of the 75,000 acres selected by the commission as of immediate interest, 15,000 acres had been planted, mostly with Austrian pine, at an average cost of $8 to $16 per acre. The cost including stone enclosures for the plantations to protect them against cattle and fire, and the repairs which sometimes equaled the original expense. In addition, some 50,000 acres of natural growth were brought into productive condition merely by protection. While this activity refers to the northern portion of the coast region, the cost of Dalmatia farther south, being oak country, was mainly recuperated by protective measures. Here, in 1873, the pasturing of goats was forbidden on areas of over one million acres in extent which were found capable of reforestation. In 1876, the partition of communal holdings was ordered, and portions were designated for forest use to be planted. As a result of these measures, nearly 400,000 acres have been recuperated. 7. Education and Literature The first forest schools in Austria were established through private effort, namely one in 1800 in Bohemia by Prince Schwarzenberg, and another one in Moravia by Prince Liechtenstein, these two being the largest forest owners in Austria. In 1805, another private forest school was opened in Bohemia, and at the same time, the State Institute near Vienna came into existence. This was, in 1813, transferred to Maria Brun, and after various changes in the character of the teaching, was in 1867 raised the dignity of an academy with a three years course. In 1875, it was transferred to the Hochschule für Bodenkultur at Vienna, an agricultural school, which had been instituted in 1872, intended to give the higher scientific education in both forestry and agriculture by a three years course. The course was, in 1905, increased to four years. During the years from 1875 to 1904, over 2,600 students in forestry alone had attended this excellent school, at which over 70 professors and instructors were employed. For the lower grades of foresters, Schools were, from time to time, opened in addition to the private ones first mentioned. Such so-called middle schools were founded at Uhlenberg, 1852, Weisswasser, 1855, transferred to Reichstadt, and Lemberg, 1874, at which latter the course is two years in the Polish language, and one at Brook, 1900, where the course is three years. At present, there are five middle schools in operation. For the education of guards, three Forstwart schools were instituted in 1881 and 1883, one each for Tyrol, Styria, and Galicia, where, in an 11 months course, 15 forest guards at each receive instruction. In addition, there are five schools of silviculture where the course is one year. Besides these schools, courses in forestry of shorter duration are given at three other institutions. Besides these schools, the promotion of forestry science is, as in Germany, secured by forest experiment stations, which came into existence as a result of the earlier deliberations of the German foresters. The first proposition to establish such a station was submitted in 1868, but its establishment was delayed until 1875, when such a station was instituted at Vienna, in connection with the school there. The results of the investigations are published from year to year, and have enriched the forestry literature in the German language with many important contributions. Very active association life exists in Austria, largely due to the influence of the many large private forest owners. Curiously enough, the first attempt at forming a society of foresters in Bohemia was suppressed by the authorities, probably for fear of revolutionary tendencies and the effort simply resulted in a literary or reading association to obviate the need of private purchase of books. Not until 1848, the very year of the revolution, did the Bohemian Forestry Association become a fact. And under the leadership of the large forest owners among the nobility, it has become the strongest in Austria, issuing a bi-monthly association journal from the beginning. 
Another strong local association which dates back its beginning as a society for agriculture to 1770 is the Moravian Silesian Forestry Association, which segregated from the Mother Society in 1850, first as a section, and having by 1858 attained a membership of 1,000, it constituted itself as a separate association in 1886. Besides these, many smaller ones exist in Austria. In 1852, a general Austrian forestry association was founded, which, in 1854, began the publication of a quarterly journal and held sessions in various parts of the empire. But, by and by, the interest seemed to flag. The attendance at the meetings became smaller and smaller. And finally, the association was abandoned after a rival, the Austrian Forestry Congress, had been organized in 1874, which later became the Österreichisches Reich Forstverein. In Galicia and in Bukwina, the foresters met as a section of the Society for Soil Culture. The same method of forming forestry sections of the agricultural societies is followed in other parts of the empire, and at least a dozen or more other local foresters' associations might be mentioned, in which owners of forest properties are as fully represented as professional foresters, and their activity is not only to be found in literary labors, but also in practical work. In addition to the meetings of these local societies, representative congresses have met annually at Vienna since 1876, and have become powerful agents for improving legislation and practice. Although, as was natural, owing to the difference in conditions, the forestry literature in Austria began much later than that of Germany, a very active progress is noticeable since the middle of the last century. And the Austrians are vying successfully with the Germans in this direction. The names of Fiacelli, Bacorni, Berm, Weissner, Molisch, Wilkom, Hempel, and Kerner in the direction of Forest Botany, Vesely, von Lorenz Le Bernau, Feistmantel, Dimitz, Wachtel, Entomology, Dombrowski, Encyclopedia 1886, Axner, Janke, Wood Technology, Gutenberg, Forest Mensuration and Regulation, von Seckendorf, Schiffel, Forest Mensuration, Sisla, Rus, Burmerle, Hufnagel, Mache, and many others are familiar to all German readers. In addition, a very considerable literature in the Bohemian language is in existence, some in the Italian by Austrian authors, and some in the Slavonian. The magazine literature began with publications by various forestry associations, which became active after 1848. At the present time, weekly, monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, yearly, and irregular publications to the number of not less than 14 in German, in addition to several in Bohemian, may be counted, among which the monthly Centralblatt für das gesamte Forstwesen, in existence since 1875, and the weekly Österreichisches Forstzeitung since 1883 are perhaps the most widely known. End of section 8. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 9 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Hungary. Hungary is mainly a fertile plain traversed by the Danube and Theis, an agricultural country with the forest confined to the hilly portions, to the mountainous southern provinces of Slavonia and Croatia, and to the Carpathians which bound it on the north and east. Nevertheless, while wood in the plain is scarce, the total forest area, including that of the two mentioned provinces, is but little less than that of Austria proper namely 23 million acres, or 28 percent. Large areas of shifting sands and along the Danube and Tice rivers, swamps, partly created by deforestation, are interspersed with the heavy black prairie and compact clay soils. At present, of the 23 million acres of forest, the state owns 16 percent, corporations somewhat over 20 percent, churches, cloisters, and other institutions 7.5 percent, and the balance over 13 million acres, is owned privately. The administration of the state forests is in the Department of Agriculture, but some are still under the control of the military and railroad departments. All but the private forests are under state surveillance. Of the private properties, the majority consists of large holdings, and about 10% are entailed, 
a hopeful condition for conservative management. Yet, with an export of ten to twelve million dollars or more, exploitation would appear still to be general, and devastated areas abound. It is claimed that half the area is under working plans, and that the one thousand million cubic feet of annual cut do not approach the annual increment. The state forests yield now in the neighborhood of six hundred thousand dollars net. Although naturally influenced by Austrian precedent, forestry matters in Hungary, like all matters of administration, are largely independent of Austria, the connection being only in the identity of the ruler. The forests, which had been for the most part the property of the kings of the Arpad dynasty, had by them been turned over from time to time in donations to the churches, cloisters, and to colonists, so that when the Habsburg succeeded to the throne in 1526, only a small portion remained undisposed, and this became state property. In the forests, which were necessary for the working of the royal mines and furnaces, an attempt was early made to secure systematic treatment under an ordinance, 1565, which gave instructions as to the order of fellings, the reservation of seed trees, etc. But otherwise the government did not make much effort at regulating forest use until the middle of the 18th century. And then, largely owing to military considerations urged by General von Engelshofen, commanding on the frontier against the Turks. The planting of forests for defense was ordered in 1743 by Maria Theresa, but this order was probably never executed. About this time, however, movements of reform in various directions are noticeable. Complete working plans were made for the Kremnitz forest in 1750 and for the Chemnitz forest in 1763. The forest ordinances of 1770 and 1781 and the law of 1791 attempted to regulate the use of communal forests and ordered the reservation of devastated forest areas. Other legislation followed in 1807 designed to arrest the further extension of shifting sands. Although since 1809 forest inspectors had been employed to look after the execution of the forest laws, Mismanagement and forest destruction by promiscuous cutting, pasture and fire, remained the rule, and with the advent of the railroads in 1850, increased apace. Political troubles prevented any attempts at improvement until, in 1867, comparative peace and the new regime had arrived, and finally, in 1879, it became possible to pass a reform law which is the basis of present conditions. A general forest law had been enacted in 1807. This was superseded in 1858 by the adoption of the Austrian law of 1852. But in 1879, a new law reorganized forest policy and forest service. In that year, the state interests were placed under the administration of the Department of Agriculture with a technical forester at the head, Oberland Forstmeister, assisted by four section chiefs, one in charge of the state forest administration, one for the administration of corporation forests, one for the elaboration of working plans, and one with the assistance of twenty forest inspectors having supervision of the execution of all forest laws. Otherwise, the general features of German administration methods prevailed, except that for purposes of executing the protective forest laws, committees composed of three members chosen from the country officials cooperate with the government service. The law of 1879, modified and intensified in 1898, provides government supervision of the management of corporation and of protection of forests, and prescribes that land unfit for farming, i.e. absolute forest soil, three-quarters of all forest land, no matter by whom owned, is to be reforested within six years after having been stripped, and no new clearings may be made on such soils. Mountain forests, which are classed as protection forests, around 1 million acres or 5.4% of the forest area so classed, as well as entailed properties must be managed according to working plans approved by the Forest Department. The declaration of protective forests was to be made by a commission within five years of the enactment of the law. New planting for protective purposes could also be ordered, and this under certain conditions may be done by the interested or protected parties, which may associate themselves for this purpose. Violations of this law are liable to be punished by a fine for each acre imposed annually as long as the offense continues. 
two-thirds of the whole forest area is thus more or less under state supervision, and working plans for over twelve million acres have been, or are to be prepared, by the government. An area allotment method with a normal forest formula as a check has been mostly employed in this work, which is by no means as yet completed. To promote forest planting, several nurseries have been established by the government, from which around ten million plants are annually distributed free of charge, and subventions for reforestation of wastes are also granted annually. It is interesting to note in this connection that more than 170,000 acres have been planted to black locust, which is managed as coppice for vineyard stakes. In 1884, a special fund for the purchase of forest land by the state was instituted by turning all monies received from eventual sales of forest land into that fund. Another fund for forest improvement is accumulated by placing four-fifths of all penalties collected for forest trespasses into a separate account for that purpose. These funds have not accumulated very fast, the Forest Improvement Fund in 1896 being only about $120,000. Similar to the lands in France, there exist in various parts of Hungary extensive sand wastes and shifting sands, partly caused by deforestation. Ever since 1788, legislation has attempted to secure a rehabilitation of these waste areas, which cover in all some 600 square miles. In 1817, a first systematic beginning was made in the Benat, on the Alfeld of the Magyars, under the forest dictator Pachofen, similar to Bramantier's undertaking in France. By 1842, the total plantations amounted to about 12,000 acres, and by 1869, some 20,000 acres had been reforested, and parts of the plantations had begun to yield profits. But even today, there are still large areas in a desert condition. A classic volume in German by Josef Vesely, Hungarian forest director, Der Europäische Flugsand und seine Kultur, describes in detail the principles and methods of reclamation of shifting sands. Most of the Hungarian forestry literature being written in the Magyar language is inaccessible to the rest of the world. Efforts by private endeavor to promote forestry education date back as early as 1796, when forest inspector Visner opened an elementary forest school and wrote a forestry catechism. This effort was followed in 1806 by introducing the subject in the agricultural school at Kesteli, and in 1808 in the school of mines in Schemnitz. Salmitz Banya, a German forester, Wilkins, filling the chair, while a special forest school was established in Hermannstadt in 1817. The forestry courses at Schemnitz were enlarged and the school reorganized in 1846 and again in 1872, one of the changes being the use of the Hungarian language in its instruction, which had originally been in German. In 1904, the course, which was three years and only optionally four, one year for engineering education, was made four years for all, and is obligatory for all higher-grade state officials. In Croatia, Slavonia, which is in many respects separately administered, an agricultural and forestry school exists at Kreutz, Kuros, with a three-year course. For the lower service, four schools of two-year courses have been established by the government, the instruction being given by practitioners, and some of the students receiving free tuition. A forest experiment station was established in 1898. It issues a quarterly magazine, Erdetzedi Kizerletek, in which its results are recorded. A Hungarian forestry association was formed in 1866. It issues a monthly journal, distributes pamphlets, gives prizes for literary effort, etc., and is, with over 2,000 members, an active agent in the work of reform. A separate forestry association, which also publishes a monthly in the Slavish language, exists in Croatia. End of section 9. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 10 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Switzerland. A very good brief statement of present conditions of forestry in Switzerland, with some historical references, may be found in Handwörterbuch der Schweizerischen Volkswirtschaft, Berlin, 1903, 
with two chapters by Dr. J. Coates and Professor C. Bourgeois. F. Funkhauser, Geschichte des Bernischen Forstwesens bis in die Neuere Zeit, Bern, 1893, gives insight into the developments in one of the cantons beginning in 1304. Landolt, Über die Geschichte der Waldungen und des Forstwesens, Zürich, 1858. L'Evolution forestière dans le canton de Neuchâtel, Histoire statistique, 1896. Paris, die Kulturgeschichtliches Entwicklung und wirtschaftliches Bedeutung des Schweizerischen Waldbezahns. Luzern, 1898. Meister, die Stadtwaltungen von Zürich, 2nd edition, 1903. Exhibits on 225 pages in great detail the history and methods of management of this remarkable city forest of only about 3,000 acres. Report of the British Foreign Office on Swiss Forest Laws by Conway Thornton, 1888, gives a very satisfactory expose of the earlier legislation. The interest which we have in the development of forestry in this small territory, of somewhat less than 16,000 square miles, with over 3 million people, lies in the fact that it is a republic, or rather an aggregation of republics, the oldest in existence, and that, occupying an alpine mountain country, it has developed a unique cooperative policy of forest protection. Being largely German by origin and sentiment, German influence on the development of forestry methods, outside of the administrative measures, has here been as strong as in Austria. Switzerland did not exist as a power in name until the 17th century, and as a unit not until the reconstruction of 1815, and in its present settled condition and constitution not until 1848, although the nucleus of its political existence dates back at least 600 years when, in 1291, the people of the three forest cantons, Schwitz, Uri, and Unterwalden, formed their first league to resist encroachments on their rights by the church and by the feudal barons. The country became settled, similarly to Germany, by Germans, and especially Burgundians, a free people. But when the control of the Obermarker over the free communities began to ripen into feudal superiority, it found resistance in the forest cantons, and these formed a league to fight the Duke of Habsburg, who partly as feudal lord, partly as Reichswacht, the emperor's representative, claimed obnoxious rights. Through admission of neighboring lands and cities to the League, the number of confederates had by the middle of the 14th century grown to eight, and when by the battles of Sempach, 1386, and Neffels, 1388, the Austrian Habsburg supremacy had been permanently destroyed, the number of allies grew, and by conquest and annexation and otherwise, their territory attained nearly the present size by the middle of the 15th century the war against feudalism being the cause for this growth. These various small republics, however, always formed a part of and owed allegiance to the German Empire, although they resisted the arms of the emperor as Archduke of Austria until, with the peace of 1499, this connection became entirely normal. The final separation from the German Empire and acknowledgement of independence was not pronounced until the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. The League of Cantons was only a very loose confederation, without any central power, although a diet, to which each canton sent a delegate, had deliberative functions. Almost immediately after the alliance was formed, it became fatally divided, especially when religious differences arose, and throughout the sixteenth and first half of the seventeenth century, continuous warfare existed between the different allies. It must not, however, he understood that the peasants in the different cantons were entirely free from the ancient tyrannies, with the exception of the three forest cantons, which were truly democratic republics. The majority of the Swiss peasants, free in the eyes of the outside world, were mere serfs until the beginning of the 18th century, and secured their freedom only after many revolts. After nearly 500 years of this loose federation, it was reserved to Napoleon to proclaim the Helvetian Republic one and indivisible in 1798 after a short struggle of 74 days. 
This constitution fell with the fall of Napoleon and gave place in 1815 to a reorganized federation, in which the former sovereignty of each canton was re-established, the inviolability of the territory being guaranteed by the European powers. Finally, in 1848, the seventh and last phase of Reconstruction brought into existence the Bund, the Confederation of Switzerland, very much after the pattern of the United States, the Constitution then adopted being once more revised in 1874. The country is divided into nineteen entire and six half-states or cantons, which are a unit towards foreign powers, but have as much independence among themselves as each of the United States, each self-governing. A parliament, Bundesversammlung, of two chambers, the Nationalrat, of 145 members, corresponding to the House of Representatives, the Standesrat, with 44 members, equivalent to the Senate, represent the interests of the whole federation. The administration of the cantons lies in the hands of the great and small councils, with an executive ministry of three members chosen for two years by the former council. The administration of the Bund is in the hands of the Bundesrat, of seven members elected by the parliament, which also elects one of the members as president for one year. The referendum, which, if 30,000 voters demand it within three months, requires reference of any law to direct vote of the people, is used as a check on legislation. Although the larger part of the population of three million people is German, parts of Switzerland are French and other parts Italian. From this brief statement of the political development of the country, it will appear that the development of forestry must also have varied. 1. Forest Conditions and Property Rights Topographic and soil conditions necessarily had also their influence on this development. In the plains, the plateau, and the hill country, the distinction of forest and field as it now exists had been in general attained in the 15th century, while in the mountain country, Forest destruction began only in the 18th century and continued till the middle of the 19th century, stimulated by the development of the metal industry and the improvement in means of communication. The clearings made here were turned into pasture, and being overpastured became wastelands. Thus, owing to topographic and soil conditions, a very uneven distribution of forest has resulted, and we find a variation in forest area from 9% Genf to over 39% in Jura, of the total land area of the different cantons, the average being 20.6%, leaving out of consideration the area above timber limit, 5,000 to 7,500 feet, and the waters and rocks below. This is less than in Germany and Austria, more than in France, but if allowance is made for unproductive soil, which is included in the German area statements, the percentage of forest area on productive soil would about equal that of Germany. In the last 25 years, the area has increased by 10% to 2,140,000 acres. This area is insufficient to supply the demand, from 15-25% to 25 of it being imported. In 1907, the imports had risen to nearly 25 million cubic feet, valued at $9 million. Property rights developed at first similarly to those developed on German soil except that, as we have seen, feudal conditions were not allowed to gain foothold to the same extent, and liberty from serfdom was secured earlier. In 1798, seniorial rights had pretty much nearly been extinguished. At present, ownership is still largely communal. Nearly 67% are so owned, making this property of highest forest political importance. Private owners hold only 28.5%, and the cantonal forests represent but 4.6%, the Bund as such owning none. It is also to be noted that communal property is constantly increasing by purchases from private holdings. 2. Development of Forest Policy No doubt, in some parts, the first beginnings of care for forest property and forest use date back even to Roman times. Charlemagne had his forest officials here as elsewhere, and the number of ban forests seems to have been especially great, some 400 banbriefe, documents establishing them having been collected at Bern. The first forest ordinance regulating the use of a special forest area in Bern dates from 1304. But the first working plan seems to have been made for the city forest of Zurich, 
the so-called Silvalt, in 1680 to 1697. And to this day, this corporation property, with its intensive and most profitable management, is the pride of all Switzerland. The Bernese cantonal forests were first surveyed and placed under management from 1725 to 1739, and fully regulated by 1765. An excellent forest code for Bale was drawn up in 1755 by Bishop Joseph William, and in 1760, through the propaganda of the two scientific societies of Zurich and Bern, the teaching of forestry was begun, and forest organization in the two cantons secured in 1773 and 1786. The canton of Solur, Soliturn, was the first to start a regular system of instruction, two citizens from each woodland district being given the opportunity to qualify themselves as foresters. Each canton had, of course, its own laws protecting forest property against theft and fire. In the latter respect, especially great care was exercised, and burning of brush could only be done by permit and under a force of watchers. The example of Zürich and Bern in organizing the management of their forest areas was followed more or less by other cantons. But a real serious movement is not discernible until the beginning of the 19th century, when, with the impetus of modern life and trade, the value of forest property increased, and most cantons issued regulative forest laws. Forest ordinances had from time to time attempted to prevent the decrease of forest area by forbidding clearings, regulating pasture, and forbidding wood export to other villages or cantons, a local timber famine being dreaded. But... Only when a severe flood in 1830 had accentuated the protective value of forest cover were the forest ordinances more strenuously enforced, and a general movement for better management began in the various cantons. This was partly signalized by sending young men to the forest schools of Germany. Largely through the influence of a lively propaganda carried on by such men as Landolt and Coates, backed by the Swiss Forestry Association founded in 1848, and through the increase of torrential floods, especially in 1834 and 1868, was it made clear that a central power would have to be clothed with authority to regulate the use, at least, of the alpine forest. In 1857, the Bund ordered an investigation of the mountain forests in all parts. This was made by Landolt. But opposition by the cantons against restrictive measures prevented any legislative result. At the same time, an annual vote of $2,000 was made to the Forestry Association for reforestation and engineering works in the Alps. This grant was changed in 1871 by voting an annual credit of $20,000 to be expended by the Bundesrat for similar purposes. The floods of 1868 brought such distress in certain cantons that contributions from all other parts were required to assist the flood sufferers and $200,000 of the collections were appropriated for reforestation. Finally, in 1874, through the effort of the Forestry Association, it was determined to create a Central Bureau of Forest Inspection for the whole Bund in the Department of the Interior, and an article was inserted in the Constitution declaring the superior right of oversight by the Federation over the Water and Forest Police in the High Alps. At the same time, proposing to aid in the engineering and reboisement work necessary to correct the torrents and to take measures for the preservation of these works and forests. The result was the installation of a federal forest inspector with one assistant in 1875, and the enactment of a law in 1876 which determined the area within which the federal government was to exercise supervision. The execution of the law was, however, left to the cantons, the jealousies of state rights as against federal rights being even more strongly developed in Switzerland than in the United States. Each canton proceeded in its own way, or neglected to proceed, and hence no uniform progress in applying the law was made. Indeed, not a single prescription of the law was applied within the prescribed time, although again and again extended, and even today some cantons have not yet complied. Stubborn opposition to the law continues even to date in some cantons. Besides the unwillingness to submit to federal authority, the lack of technically trained foresters, their employment being a requirement of the law, and the objection to their employment by the cantons, who looked on them as disguised policemen, impeded the progress of the reform. 
Until 1884, each canton held its own examinations for forest officials, but in that year a standard was enacted for employment within the federally supervised territory. The most frequent quarrel was as to what was to be considered forest and what pasture, so that finally, as a compromise, a classification between the two, called pasture woods, was introduced. It will be noted that the federal surveillance was to extend only to the high Alps above a certain limiting line. This limitation was removed in 1898 by resolution of the Council and change of the Constitution, by which the federal exercise of water and forest police was extended over the whole country, and a bill to carry this into effect was introduced. Finally, in 1902, a revised law was passed establishing fully the present federal forest policy. This law places the surveillance of all forest police in all forests of Switzerland in the Bund, the private forests as well as the public, i.e. state and communal or corporation forests. But, as there are distinctive differences in the manner of this surveillance, a differentiation of ownership conditions and forest conditions was to be made by the cantons within two years. The forests are to be divided into protection and non-protection forests by the cantons with sanction of the Bund the former being such as are located at headwaters or furnish protection against snowslides, landslides, rock falls, floods, and climatic damage. Most of this segregation had already been made and mapped in consequence of the law of 1876. In 1904, 71% of the total forest area had been classed as protective forest, nearly 80% of the communal and over 50% of the private forest property. All public forests are to be surveyed and their corners permanently marked by the cantons according to the instructions by the Bund, the latter furnishing the needed triangulation survey and inspecting and revising any older surveys free of charge. The surveyed public forests are to be fully regulated according to a sustained yield management under working plans made according to instructions by the cantons, to be sanctioned by the Bundesrat. For the unsurveyed forest areas, at least a provisional felling budget is to be determined, as nearly as possible, representing the sustained yield. In protection forests, the working plans must conform to the objects of these forests, and clearings in these are as a rule forbidden. The fellings are to be made under direct supervision of foresters, and after being cut, the wood must be measured. Sale on the stump is forbidden. Otherwise, no interference in the management is intended. Up to 1902, under the law of 1876, working plans for 540,000 acres had been made. In 1907, 90,000 acres of state forests and over 1 million acres of corporation forests were under working plans. For other than protection forests, the law provides a number of restrictions, such as the following. Pasture woods may not be decreased in area except by permission of the cantons. Communal forests are not to be subdivided without consent of the cantonal government, except where two or more communities have joint ownership, nor are they to be sold except with such permissions. Rights of user in public forests, especially in protection forests, may be forcibly extinguished by the cantonal government, but under appeal to the Bundesrat. Money equivalents are to be the rule territorial equivalents to be given only by special permission. By 1902, over $300,000 had already been spent in extinguishing 2,842 different rights of user. The establishment of means of transportation, roads, etc., is encouraged by subventions from the Bund and in other ways. Private forests, as far as they fall under the classification of protection forests, are subject to the same supervision and rules as the public forests as regards their survey, the prohibition of clearings, except by permission of the federal government, of diminishing pasture woods, the extinguishment of rights of user, the prevention of damaging use, and assistance in establishing means of transportation. The cantonal government is obliged to ensure the execution of these laws. In addition, while the law encourages cooperative forest management of small holdings as larger units, the Bund, paying for the cost of effecting such cooperation, it empowers the canton or the Bund to enforce such cooperative management of protection forest areas in specially endangered localities, as at the headwaters of torrential streams. Otherwise, in the non-protective private forests, 
only the prohibition of clearing except by permission of the cantonal government, the obligation of reforesting felling areas within three years, and of maintaining existing pasture woods is ordered. Wherever on private properties conversion of forest into farm or pasture is permitted, after report of the Forest Administration of Canton or Bunt, an equivalent reforestation of other parts may be ordered. Wherever, by the reforestation of bare ground, protective forest areas can be created, this may be ordered, the federal or the cantonal government contributing towards such work. Or else, if the owner prefers, he may insist upon having his ground expropriated by the canton or other public corporation, the federal government assisting in the first case to the extent of thirty to fifty percent of the cost, and in establishing new protection forests to the extent of fifty to eighty percent. Before 1902, under the law of 1876, some 16,000 acres had been reforested and put in order at an expense of over $1 million, the federal government contributing just about 50%. In 1910, the area of planted protection forests had grown to 25,000 acres. Besides the various restrictions with provisions of penalties for disobedience, from $1 to $100 for each transgression, an enforced execution by cantonal government there are a number of directions in which the federal government makes contributions for the purpose of encouraging conservative management. For the salaries of the cantonal higher forest officials, 20 to 35 percent are contributed. For the higher corporation and cooperative association officials, 5 to 25 percent. For the lower forest service, 5 to 20 percent. The federation participates to the extent of one-third in the accident insurance of forest officers, a minimum salary of the officials and also their proper education being made conditions. To secure the latter, the Federation pays for teachers and demonstration material under prescribed conditions. In 1901, the federal contributions amounted to $100,000 in all. In 1903, the total appropriation was $126,000, namely 9000 for the Inspector General's office, 26 towards salaries of cantonal foresters, 80,000 towards reboisement, 8,000 towards survey, and the cantonal governments contributed about the same amount outside of the cost of their forest administrations. It is estimated that the budget will have to be increased by $50,000 annually for some time to come. By 1910, the federal government had altogether contributed $2 million in the 35 years toward the execution of the law outside its administrative office. The organization which is to carry out this forest policy is still the one which originated with the law of 1876, somewhat modified by the law of 1892, namely, a forestry division in the Department of the Interior with one superior forest inspector and three assistants. The cantons have their own administrations, mostly under one forester of higher grade, called variously Oberforster, Forstinspector, Forstmeister, Oberforstmeister. Bern has three coordinate forest inspector. The cantons are, or are to be, districted into forest circles, forest kreise, the subdivision to be approved by the Bundesrat, and some are further subdivided into ranges, unterfersterei. The forest districts, from 7,500 to 45,000 acres each, are to be managed by properly educated and paid foresters elected by the people. The eligibility depends upon an examination, the theoretical part of which is conducted by the forest school. The practical part, after a year's practical work, is conducted by a commission of foresters, after completion of which the candidate becomes eligible, the election being for three years, and re-election being usual unless there are good reasons against it. In 1903, there were employed as administrators or managers 119 state, or cantonal, foresters, and 33 communal foresters, besides 11 federal forest officials. In 1909, the total number had grown to 193, besides 1,091 under-foresters to whose salaries the Bund contributed. The state foresters are allowed to manage neighboring communal properties. 3. Forest Practice The timber forest is the most general form of silvicultural management. Selection forest with 150 to 200 year rotations is practiced in the Alps, and in the smaller private forest areas. 
Shelter wood system in compartments is in use in other parts, with a rotation of 60 to 80 years in the deciduous and 80 to 120 years in coniferous forest, supplanting largely the clearing and planting system which had found favor during the middle of last century. In corporation forests, large areas are still under coppice with standards, but will probably soon be converted into timber forest, a policy favored by cantonal instructions. Pure coppice is only rarely met, usually confined to the overflow lands and small private holdings. In some of the public forests in the French territory, it is practiced with a double rotation, fiertage, according to French pattern. Artificial means to secure complete stands and natural regenerations is favored by the cantonal regulations, but thinning operations are still mostly neglected, except where local market for inferior materials makes them advisable which is mostly in the plains country where the annual yield from thinnings may represent 30% of the total harvest yield. Conversion from coppice and coppice with standards into timber forest and change from the clearing system to natural regeneration, proper for mountain forest, and from pure to mixed forest have become general provisions of the working plans. The average cut in the state forest during four years prior to 1893 was over 64 cubic feet per acre, and 42 cubic feet for the corporation forest, an average for all the public forests of around 45 cubic feet, not a very good showing as yet. So far, the collection of material for yield tables and for a statement of increment and stock on hand in the country at large are still insufficient. Although, in 1882, Professor Landolt estimated the annual product at little less than 500 million cubic feet, or 50 cubic feet per acre. Only for the intensively managed city forests of Zurich and the cantonal forests of Bern are more accurate data available. In the latter, the state forests yield 50 cubic feet in the plateau country, 73 cubic feet in the middle country, and 76 cubic feet in the Jura, while the communal forests of that country yield 15, 66, and 56 cubic feet respectively. Prices for wood are higher in the low country than the average in Germany, and have been steadily rising for the last 40 years, especially for a coniferous saw material, which at present brings stumpage prices of 12 to 15 cents. Owing to these high prices, the gross yield of some Swiss forests is the largest known in Europe, the city forest of Zürich exhibiting yields of $12, and the city forest of Aarau as much as $14 per acre on the average, Although in the Alps forests the gross yield sinks to three and four dollars. The more intensively managed city forests mentioned spend on their management six dollars and even seven dollars per acre, while most of the state forests keep their expenditures within two dollars fifty cents to three dollars and fifty cents, and in some places down to a dollar and fifty cents per acre. The net yields vary, therefore, for the state and communal forests of the plateau country between $3 and $6.50, for some of the city forests from $6.50 to $8 and $9. Switzerland has long ago ceased to produce its wood requirements and imports from $8 to $9 million annually of wood and wood manufactures. 4. Education and Literature for the education of the higher forest officials, the federal government instituted a two-year course at the Polytechnicum at Zurich, which was founded in 1885, the course being in 1884 increased to three years. Three professors of forestry besides the faculty of the institution in fundamental and accessory branches are active here, the number of students averaging in the neighborhood of 35. Two examinations, a scientific and a practical one, the latter taken before a special commission, test the eligibility of candidates, foreigners not excluded, for positions. For the education of the lower-grade foresters, the canton themselves are responsible, the Bund only contributing by paying for teachers and demonstration material, about $1,250, to carry on cantonal or intercantonal forestry courses. The courses usually last from two weeks to two months, in succession or divided into spring and fall courses. They are mainly practical and require candidates to be not less than 18 years of age and to possess a primary school education. Their number must be at least 15 and not more than 25. There have also been instituted specially conducted excursions and progressive under-foresters courses, as well as additional scientific courses which the Bund subsidizes. In connection with the Zurich School, 
Forestry science and art are furthermore advanced by a well-endowed central forest experiment station, with several substations and an annual budget of $10,000. The greatest credit for the advancement of forestry and forest legislation is due to the Swiss Forestry Association, 365 members in 1911, which was founded in 1843, meeting annually in various places, managed by a committee of five elected for three years. This association is subsidized by the Bund for its educational work, a Schweizerische Zeitschrift für das Forstwesen, begun 1850, and its organ, with Dr. Frankhauser as editor. In 1898, an association of underforesters with a special organ, der Forstwirt, came into existence, 526 members in 1902, and several cantonal foresters associations are also active. In the literature, which is largely in German, with some French and Italian volumes, notable works have appeared and real advances in forestry science, especially with reference to management of mountain forests, are due to Swiss writers. In 1767, the Société d'Economie de Zurich published a forester's manual, and during the first quarter of the 19th century, Zorke and Kasthofer developed silviculture in the Alps. Landolt, in 1860, published the results of his investigations under the order of the Bund in 1857 into the forest conditions of the Alps and contributed other volumes along similar lines. He was succeeded by the now venerable Dr. J. Coates as Inspector General of the Bund, still active at 90 years of age, who also contributed to the science of mountain reboisement and in other directions. The work on the management of the city forest of Zurich by its longtime manager, Meister, is classic. Under the active direction of Anton Bühler for many years, the publication of, now under Dr. Engler, Mit Heilungen der Eidgenossischen Zentralanstalt für das Forstliche Versuchwesen since 1891 have become important contributions to forestry science. In the direction of wood technology, the name of L. Tetmeyer, who is conducting timber tests, should be mentioned. End of section 10. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Section 11 of A Brief History of Forestry by Bernard Fernau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. France. No complete monographic history of forestry in France is in existence, and mainly incomplete notes scattered through various volumes were at the disposal of the writer. The work, which contains the largest amount of historic information, is G. Huffel, Economy Forestia, three volumes, 1904-1907, pages 422-44-510. Perhaps the most ambitious work in the French language, which has been largely followed in the account here given. It is a collection of ten studies, historical data being interspersed throughout the three volumes, the third volume containing one study entirely historical. L. F. A. Maury, Les Forêts de la Gaule et de l'Ancien France, 1867, 501 pages, is mainly descriptive but full of interesting historic data and detail up to the revolutionary period. Jules Clavet, Etudes sur l'économie forestière, 1862, 377 pages, 12 degrees, while mainly a propagandist essay rehearses to some extent the history of forest practice, policies, etc., and gives a good insight into conditions at that time. Die Forstlichen Verhältnisse Frankreich by Dr. A. von Seckendorf, 1879, 228 pages, furnishes a few historical notes. Three English publications by John Crombie Brown, Pine Plantations in France, Reboisement in France, 1876, French Forest Ordinance of 1669 and 1882, are profuse and not entirely accurate, but give hints of historic development. C. H. Guillaume, L'Enseignement Forestier en France, 1898, 398 pages, gives an insight into the development of forestry education and a complete history of the school at Nancy, and throws much light on other developments. Code de la Legion Forestier par Pouton contains all the legislation having reference to forests. An article on l'idée forestière dans l'histoire by L. F. Tessier in Revue des Eaux et Forêts, 
1905, January and February, gives on 26 pages an interesting brief survey of the history of forest policy in France. Forestry in France by F. Bailey in The Indian Forester, 1886, 61 pages, describes well conditions at that time. France is one of the countries in which forestry has been practiced for a long time, and forestry practice has been almost as highly developed as in the preceding Teutonic countries. Germany's neighbor to the west has evolved, however, forest policies and practices which are different in some respects from those of Germany, although the early history of forestry in France was largely analogous to that of Germany. Indeed, until the end of the ninth century, the two countries being undivided, the same usages existed more or less in both, except that in the Gallic country Roman influence left a stronger imprint, Gallia having been long under the dominion of Rome. The fact that France has for nearly a thousand years been a unit, while Germany has until recently been split up into many independent principalities, did much for uniform, albeit less ambitious, development in forestry matters. Most of the forest policy as it exists today was inaugurated during the monarchical regime, which came to an end in 1871. Since that year, a republican form of government, with an assembly of 584, a senate of 300 members, under a president elected by the legislature for seven years, has been in existence. The country is principally a plain, mostly below 1,200 feet in altitude, sloping to the north and west. The mountain ranges, Pyrenees, Alps, Jura, and Vosges, are confined mainly to the south and east boundaries, with secondary ranges, Cévennes, Côte d'Or, Auvergne, etc., in the southeastern part of the country. Of the 204,000 square miles of territory, just about 18% is wooded, which, with a population of nearly 40 million, leaves only about 0.6 of an acre per capita. In its present condition, this area does not produce more than one-third of the home demand, which requires on the average an import, an excess over export, to the amount of about $25 million, 33 million in 1902, representing over 110 million cubic feet annually, mostly woodwork, while the export is of mine props and railroad ties at about half the value of the imported wood. Since in 1892 there were still nearly 12%, or over 15 million acres, wasteland, opportunity for enlargement of the forest area seems to exist. It appears that about two-thirds of this wasteland is capable of bearing forest, and the existing forest area is capable of much larger production than the present, three-quarters of the production being fuel wood. The distribution of forest area is very uneven, varying from 3.5 to 56 percent in the various departments. Only about 20 percent of the area is located on the mountains, 19 percent in hill country, and 60 percent in the plains. Six forest regions may be differentiated according to Huffel, which, however, are mainly geographical divisions. The northeast, valleys of Seine and Loire, northwest and central, southwest and Pyrenees, Mediterranean and pre-Alps, Alps. Hardwoods, oak, 40%, beech and ash, etc., occupy fully 80%, while pine, the two species Sylvestris and Maritima, largely planted, represents the bulk of the 20% of coniferous forest area, fir, spruce, and larch in the mountains forming a very small part. Only 25% of the forest area is timber forest, 38% is coppice, and 35% coppice with standards, 2% being in process of conversion into timber forest. In the state forests alone, however, 68% are timber forest or in process of conversion to that form. Of the 227 million acres, hardly more than one-third belonging to state and communities are placed under the régime forestier, i.e. supervised and managed under working plans. The larger area is under coppice. Three-fourths of the communal and one-sixth of the state's timber forest is managed under selection system. Combinations of farm and forest culture, sartage and fioritage, are still quite extensively practiced. The production of saw timber under these practices is naturally small. Of the 40 cubic feet of wood per acre produced in the better class of managed state and communal properties, only 10 cubic feet are saw logs. And if the private forests were taken into consideration, the average product on the whole would appear still smaller, the private properties being mostly small, 
poorly managed, and largely coppice. Neither the owners nor their managers and guards have, as a rule, any professional education, although the means of obtaining it exist in the schools at Nancy and Boris. Blessed for the largest part with a most favorable climate and with rich soil of tertiary formation, the difficulties in forestry practice experienced by other more northern and continental countries are hardly known. Hence, many practices which are successful in France might in Germany prove disastrous, and such yields as some of the oak forests show unattainable. The greatest interest for the forester attaches to the methods of conversion of coppice into timber forest, to the extensive areas reforested during the last century, which probably exceed three million acres, and to the reboisement work in the mountains. 1. Development of Forest Property As in Austria, private ownership of forest property is largely preponderant, while state property is small. In ancient Gaul, the Romans found the forest outside of holy groves as communal property, after the conquest, all the unceded lands, especially the extensive mountain forests, were declared either state or imperial property, more than half the whole territory, and were managed as res publica in the administrators of public affairs. And while later, with the advent of the German hordes, property conditions shaped themselves somewhat according to their ways, the influence of the Roman law and institutions were never quite eradicated. The country outside of the public property was by the Romans divided into communities called fundus, each placed under a Gallic seigneur or ex, a former chief, now proprietor, his tribesmen and the remnants of the earlier Cecil population becoming serfs. One third of the fundus was handed to the serfs as their property and divided among them, the first private property. Another third was retained by the seigneur and utilized by means of the service of the serfs, corvées but usually so burdened by rights of user on their part, and the last third became common property of the community at large. There remained, however, here and there, also some of the original free communes are Mark, Vicus, so that five different property classes were in existence. The fifth century saw Teutonic tribes, Suevi, Alani, Vandals, and Burgundians, overwhelm the Romans who had for five hundred years kept the Gallo-Celtic population under their rule, and these were followed by Visigoths and Franks, who in turn took possession of the country. The conquerors did not drive out the Gallo-Romans, but merely quartered themselves on them under the euphemistic title of guests, assuming to themselves two-thirds of each estate, and leaving the remainder to their hosts. On these lands, undoubtedly, similar economic and social institutions were developed as in Germany, Communal ownership under these was at first developed to such an extent that the Salic laws declared all trees which were not reserved by special sign as subject to the use of all and any of the mockers. But later, as in Germany, the socialistic mock was followed by the feudal system with its van forests and the creation of great landed proprietors or lords. When Clovis, the king of the Franks, in the first decade of the 6th century, defeated the Visigoths and took possession of the country. He found communal forests of the villagers, ficus, property of seigneurs, equites, royal forests and state forests and remnants of Roman origin. The latter properties and much of the mock forests he claimed for himself and divided two-thirds among his vassals. But the large part of the other third became also gradually property of the nobility and church so that by the twelfth century only a relatively small royal property remained. Afterwards, the royal or state property grew again in various ways, as the power of the kings grew. In 1539, Francis I declared the same inalienable, but neither himself nor his successors paid heed to this self-imposed prohibition, and whenever financial troubles made it expedient, they disposed of some of their holdings. By the ordinance of 1566, Edi de Moulin, King Charles the Ninth again declared the domain of the crown inalienable. Nevertheless, he himself in the same year, and repeatedly afterwards, sold parts of his domain. Henry the Third, in 1579, renewed the ordinance of non-alienation and restored some of the last parcels to the domain by the exercise of the royal right. Himself and his successors, however, continually broke this contract and the royal domain decreased while that of the seigneurs grew. Similarly to what happened in Germany, the church property was taken by machination or force, 
to increase the holdings of kings or seigneurs. Nevertheless, at the beginning of the revolution in 1789, the royal domain comprised not more than 1,200,000 acres, producing a net income of $1.2 million. Then followed an era of ups and downs, continuous changes of policy, increases and decreases of the property until, with the inauguration of the Republic in 1871, comparative stability was secured. In 1791, after the Revolution, the royal property became national domain, and by further spoliation of church property and otherwise, attained an area of 4,300,000 acres. In the law of 1791, a distinction was made between the inalienable domain, which comprises roads, canals, fortresses, harbors, etc., and the alienable national domain, including the forest and other property derived from royal or crown domains. To this national domain was added by the law of 1792 the forest property of the refugees of the Revolution, which was, however, later for the most part restored or indemnified. Finally, when by the Treaty of Basel, 1795, the French frontier had been pushed to the Rhine, the total state forest had grown to around 6,500,000 acres, nearly one-third of the total forest area. But through sales and otherwise, this area had by 1850 been reduced to 3,200,000 acres, and during the period until 1872, the area had been further again reduced to less than 2,500,000 acres. At present, in 1905, it comprises 2.9 million acres, or less than 12% of the total forest area, 55% of which comes from the original royal domain, and 22% from original church property, and 23% from recent acquisitions, secured under the laws of reboisement of mountains, sand dunes, etc. The communal property developed largely in a similar manner as in Germany, from the mock and through the feudal system, with its rights of user as a result. In the twelfth century, the grandees or seigneurs were active in colonizing their domains, acquired as fiefs or otherwise, with serfs and others, giving them charters for villages with communal privileges and rights. Under this method, another kind of communal forest property grew up by written instruments or contracts, in which limitations and reservations of rights are imposed by the seigneurs. One of the most usual conditions of the contract was the prevention of clearing or sale, at the same time, a new set of rights of user, this time on the part of the seigneur, brought new complications. One of the worst features originating in the 14th century as an outgrowth of feudal relations was the right of the third, triage, which gave to the seigneur, whenever he wished to exercise it, one-third of the property free of all rights of user. In this way, the communal area was diminished until 1667, the widespread abuse of this right led to an ordinance abolishing it. It was, however, re-established by the Ordinance of 1669 in all cases where the forest had been gratuitously ceded by the seigneurs, or when the remaining two-thirds was deemed sufficient for the needs of the parish. Not until 1790 to 1792 was this exorbitant right finally abolished. As an outgrowth of the revolutionary doctrine of 1793, the most radical legislation decreed presumptive ownership by the municipal corporations of all lands for which the claimant could not show a deed of purchase, excluding any title acquired as a result of feudal relations. The day of revenge of all old wrongs had come, an appeal to justice being useless. The municipalities increased their holdings freely. Although later legislation attempted to arrest this public theft and to restitute some of the stolen property, much of the communal forest area of today consists of this kind of ill-gotten property. Another method of increasing municipal properties was by exchange of territory for the rights of user. Efforts to get rid of these rights, which grew up as described and to prevent their extension, were instituted much earlier than in Germany. Philip of Valois expressly forbidding such extension as early as 1346. Nevertheless, they continued to grow so that by the middle of the 18th century, they were as general and afforded as great a hindrance to forest management as in Germany. The Ordinance of 1669 also provided for the extinction of these rights, apparently without much success, and the troublesome times after 1789 increased their number. 
Only when the orderly regime following the reign of Napoleon gave rise to the Code Forestier 1827 was a systematic attempt for their extinguishment by the cessation of territory and cash payment begun. And by this time, the extinction may be considered practically concluded, at least for the state and communal property. Private property, not seigneurial, was but little developed before the 16th century. After that, the frequent sales by the kings and barons gave rise to small forest owners, so that by 1789, over 10 million acres were in such possession. During the 19th century, this grew by purchase, by cessions, and by reforestation of wastelands to double that amount, not less than 2 million acres being added by the latter cause alone, while some decrease came from clearings. In 1905, Private holdings comprise 15 million acres, or 65% of the total. The communal and institution forests, 4.8 million acres, or 21%. Leaving for the state forest, 2.9 million acres, or a little over 12% of the total, 22.7 million acres. 22% of the state and communal property is, however, wasteland, and such areas in private hands may be six times as large there being altogether between 14 and 15 million acres of wasteland. 2. Developments of Forest Administration In the earlier times, and indeed into the 18th century, the most important use of the forest was in the mast from oak and beech for the pigs and pasture, for the cattle, besides firewood, for which mostly the softwoods were used. This was given free from the royal domain, and the administration consisted mainly in regulating this use. The main incentive for the regulation of forest use on the part of the king were the interests of the chase. Toward the end of the ninth century, special forest officers, forestarii, are mentioned in Charlemagne's celebrated Capitularium, which describes in detail the administration of the public domains. These were, to be sure, only lower-rank officials working under mayors, intendants, and the Count Combes, who was the administrator and soon independent arbiter of the royal domain, as well as the administration of justice in general. His office early became hereditary. The first mention of forest masters, Maitre des Eaux and Forêts, dates back to 1291, and later ordinances mention higher officials, but the credit for a full and detailed organization and regulation of management belongs to Charles V, the wise Valois, in his Ordinance of 1376. This organization, after various changes by the end of the 16th century, under the reign of Henry IV, took about the following form. Under a general superintendent of forests, titulary head of the Forest Service, a number of grand maîtres, general reformateurs, des eaux et forêts. Some seventeen were appointed by the king to watch over the conduct of the maîtres and gruyères, officers in charge of the forest districts, maîtrises. All of these officials had their deputies and lieutenants under various designations, procureur de roi, greffier, garde marteau, sergeant du garde, etc. A stamping hammer, kept by the garde marteau, was employed for marking trees which defined the boundaries or which were to be reserved in the fellings. In addition to these regular officers, there were employed a great number of capitaines de chasse, whose functions, as the title indicates, related mainly to the chase. The function of the forest masters did not stop with the supervision of the use of the forest and sale of the wood, but included also the jurisdiction of all misdemeanors and crimes committed in the royal and later in all forests. They became thus gradually a privileged class of immense power. Graft and sale of offices became the order of the day. Sometimes the offices were made hereditary and again were limited to three or four years' tenure in the endeavor to break up the shameful practices. For nearly three centuries, all efforts at reform were failures. The method of prescribing the rules and regulations during the 12th to 17th century was by ordinances like those issued by the German princes, the first ordinance on record being that issued by Louis VI in 1215. These ordinances usually appeared under the name La Fée des Eaux et Forêts, the matters of waters and woods. Curiously enough, thus suggesting the relation of the two, the latter term was used exactly like that of the German Faust, designating the reserved territory under the ban, while Bois is used to designate actual woodland or silva.
In 1376, Charles V, in his endeavor to build up a navy against England, made reservations for naval timber and also issued the Ordinance of Melun, a general forest code, the provisions of which lasted largely until the reform of 1669. In 1402, the many ordinances, often contradictory, were codified under one text, and another codification was made under Francis I in 1515. By the middle of the 17th century, the devastation of forests had progressed so far, and the abuses in the management of the royal domain had become so evident, that Louis XIV's great minister, Colbert, was induced to make the historical remark, France will perish for lack of woods. Again, the needs of the navy was the prime incentive of the vigorous reform which he instituted after most searching investigations. The result was the celebrated Forest Ordinance of 1669. For this purpose, he appointed in 1662 a commission which not only investigated conditions but was clothed with the power to reform the abuses which it might discover. For this work, he selected four trusted men outside of the Forest Service, to whom later more were added, and gave them the aid of technical advisers, among whom Fourdoir seems to have been the most prominent. Colbert himself gave close attention to this work of reform. As the first act, the commission recommended the ceasing of all cutting in the royal forests, and after deliberation and consultation with interested parties through eight years, the final law was enacted, a masterpiece whose principles and prescriptions to an extent have persisted into the nineteenth century. The commission from time to time made reports, giving their findings in detail, and these form a most interesting record of conditions prevailing at the time. As one of the historians, Jovain, puts it, the commissioners did not recoil before long hours of inspection nor high influence. They neither hesitated to declare against nor prosecute, great and small alike, nor to pronounce a most serious sentence. A thorough cleaning up was done and a complete reorganization secured. By this ordinance, three special courts of adjudication in matters pertaining to the forest were established, with special officers whose duties were carefully defined, namely the courts of the Guerrilla and the Maitrice and the Table de Marbre. The first-named lower-grade courts took cognizance of the lesser offenses, abuses, wastes, and malversations, disputes in regarding to fishing or chase and murders, arising out of these, Gruries being the woods belonging to individuals in which the jurisdiction and the profit from such jurisdiction belong to the king, or at least to the seigneurs. The courts of the maîtres referred to the forest territory placed under administration of the maître particulier, forestmeister, and were established near the many royal forests as courts of appeal in forest matters. A final appeal could be made to the table de marbre, courts of the marble table, which also decided on the more weighty questions of proprietorship by whatever term held, and especially civil and criminal cases relating to the eau et forêt, the wrongdoings in the discharge of official duties, abus, contraventions to the orders and regulations, misdemeanors or depredations, délits, and all kinds of fraud not included under those cited, malversation. The whole country was divided into 18 arrondissements of Grande Maîtrise de Eau et Forêt, and these were divided into 134 maîtrises, each under a maître particulier, with a lieutenant, a garde marteau, a garde général, two arpenteurs, and a number of God. A financial branch for the handling of monies, and the judicial branch represented by the three courts described above, completed the organization which lasted until the revolution, albeit some details were changed soon after its enactment, and the offices became again purchasable and hereditary. The sale of royal forests was again forbidden, penalties being provided for the eventual purchaser. Theft and incendiarism were severely punished, and specific rules of management were established. Clearings could only be made by permission even on the part of private owners, the methods of sale and harvest were determined. The prescriptions of older ordinances were renewed to the effect that at least 13 to 16 seed trees, Balivaux, her acre in the coppice, and eight seed trees in timber forest were to be reserved in all forests without exception. Private owners were not to cut these seed trees before they were 40 years old in the coppice and 120 years in the timber forest 
while in the public and church forests these seed trees were treated like reserves. Similarly, the prescription that no woods were to be cut before ten years of age was revived from former ordinances, at the time later, 1787, being increased for public forest to twenty-five years. Also, the obligation to keep one-fourth of the forest in reserve, which Charles IX had decreed in 1560, was renewed for the public forests, those belonging to corporations and other public institutions. For the fir forests of the mountains, which had become important as furnishers of ship masts, special regulations were issued and the mast timber reserved for the crown. There was lively opposition to the enforcement of these prescriptions, especially where they interfered with property rights. Nevertheless, they persisted until the changes brought about by the Revolution of 1789. Certain prescriptions, as for instance the exclusion of shepherding, were never enforced, and this practice continues even today in certain sections. As a result of the reform, however, the revenues from the royal forests trebled in twenty years. During the eighteenth century, several famines occurred and led to the encouragement of extending farm operations at the expense of the forest, notably in the sixties, when among other similar efforts some two hundred families returning from Canada, after the English conquest, were colonized in the forest of Poitou. At that time, also the Declaration of 1766 exempted those who cleared land for farm purposes for fifteen years from all taxes. As a result of this invitation, some 750,000 acres were cleared, and the practice of clearing for farm use continued until the middle of the 19th century. In this way, by inconsiderately exposing soil which would not everywhere be found adapted to farm use, wastes naturally existing were greatly increased. The revolution brought with it sudden and disastrous changes. The law of 1791 abolished not only the jurisdiction of the Maitrisa, but removed all restraint and thereby inaugurated widespread destruction and devastation of forest property, against which legislative attempts of the Republican government were entirely powerless. Not only did the peasants take advantage of this order, and the municipalities cut their reserves without hindrance, but extraordinary fellings in the state forests were necessitated by the needs of the navy and the echequier. In 1801, after various previous attempts at organization, Napoleon reorganized the service with five administrators, 30 conservators, 200 inspectors, and 8,600 inferior officers. At that time, it appears that the revenue from the public forest domain amounted to $6 million, a sum justifying such elaborate organization. But otherwise, the methods of Colbert's ordinance were revived. Devastation, however, continued. Incompetence in the service was again introduced, when in 1811, half the number of officials was recruited from superannuated army officers. In 1817, the whole Forest Service was abolished, and the properties placed in the hands of the fiscal agents of the government, without any technical knowledge. The old order of things was, however, re-established in 1820, and soon after the final organization which has lasted to date was effected. 3. Development of Modern Forest Policy In 1822, a commission composed of foresters was instituted to revise the Ordinance of 1669, which here and there modified had continued to be valid, except during the Revolutionary Period. The result of the work of this commission was the Code Forestier in 1829, which is the law of the present day. In it, principles are laid down under which the state, communal, and other public forests are to be managed. All forests submitted to the regime forestier, namely the state and communal forests and those belonging to public institutions, are entirely managed by the state forest administration. The communities or other public forest owners paying for the service not to exceed nine cents per acre or 5% of the revenue. All jurisdiction and execution of forestry laws is in the hands of the officials of the forest administration. The foresters of the state have the exclusive responsibility of making and executing working plans without interference by the municipalities after the plans having once been submitted and approved by them. The corporations have not even the right to appoint their own guards, all such being appointed by the prefects of the departments upon recommendation by the forest department. The fellings usually performed by the purchaser, the wood being sold on the stump, are supervised most rigorously, 
making even the smallest deviation from the conditions of the contract sale, which otherwise would only entail the payment of damage, punishable by fine, and the responsibility for any trespass which may occur on the land reaches 250 yards beyond the limits of the purchaser's territory, unless he gives proper warning and tries to find out the perpetrators of the same. Legal proceedings are brought before the courts of correction and are greatly simplified, as is customary in Germany. The public forest may not be sold, mortgaged, or divided, and the product can be sold only through state foresters. As in the olden times, one quarter of the stands in the timber forest and one-fourth of the felling budget in the coppice is placed in reserve for urgent and unforeseen needs. In addition to these and other restrictions which refer to the public forests, there are prescriptions which apply to all woods in general. All foresters employed, even on private properties, have sheriff's power. Walking in the woods with axe, saw, and wagon outside of the public roads which pass through them is forbidden. The making of fires is forbidden. The making of fire lines twenty yards wide between private forests can be enforced by either owner, and railroads along their rights of way are required to make such. By special law of 1893, the setting of fires even within two hundred yards of a wood is forbidden in certain regions and the punishment of infractions of these laws is very severe. The rights of user are gauged by the administration according to the possible yield, even in private forests, and are surrounded by many other restrictions. The wood falling under such rights of user is cut and delivered by the forest agents, and the rights can be forcibly extinguished by exchange of territory. Supervision of the communal forests, which had indeed existed since the 16th century, was by no means an easy task. The opposition to it, which had always existed and was in earlier times, justified by the incompetence and graft of the officials, continued even after this justification of it had ceased. Thanks to the tact and efficiency of the officials of the modern period, the opposition has been largely overcome, and thanks to the progress made in enforcing these rigorous laws, their necessity has almost vanished, and at present, Relatively few infractions need to be investigated and punished. Moreover, the rigor of the original law was somewhat abated by the law of 1859. There are, however, voices which proclaim that the supervision by the government is not as thorough as it should be, and that the conditions of the communal property have deteriorated. While the supervision of the management of communal property is mainly based on fiscal considerations, the Code Forestier also authorizes the administration to interfere in the management of forests whose influence on the public welfare can be demonstrated. In order to assure the possibility of such interference, every private owner who desires to clear land is required to advise the government of his purpose, when the administration can prevent such clearing, if deemed necessary to prevent landslides, erosion, and torrential action, to protect water sources, sand dunes, for defensive purposes at the frontier, and for public health. Otherwise, the management of private forests is unhampered. By special legislation enacted in 1860 and 1882, however, the special cases of torrential action were taken care of in a special manner, which will be set forth in the following pages. The Reboisement Law of 1882 authorizes the administration to acquire by expropriation mountain forests or mountain slopes, needed for reforestation for the sake of safeguarding them and preventing torrential damage. For Algiers, the same authorization to expropriate was extended by law of 1903 to include all such areas on which, according to the Code Forestier, the administration might forbid clearing, and such extension is advocated for the mother country. As a rule, the administration has been able to avoid expropriation and secure the territories by voluntary sale at less than $10 per acre. At present, the Forest Service is under the Minister of Agriculture as President of the Forestry Council, with a Director General as Vice President and Technical Head, and three Administrateurs Verificateurs General, chiefs of the three Bureau into which the administration is divided, each with two chiefs of sections, inspectors, and the necessary office staff. For purposes of the local administration, the forest area is divided into 32 conservations, each under charge of a conservateur equivalent to the German Oberforstmeister. These are again subdivided into chefferie or, or inspections, two or twelve in each conservation, which are administrative units under the supervision of inspectors, 200, and assistant inspectors, 210. In addition, 
a special service for forest organization and reboisement employs fourteen inspectors and some twenty assistants. The forest districts, or cantonment ranges, finally are under the direct charge of Garde General, 162, with the assistance of Garde General Stagiar, 67, and under foresters or guards, brigadiers, 3,650, altogether a personnel of over 4,400 officials. While this is a larger force per acre, yet the expense for personnel per acre is less than one-half that of the Prussian Forest Administration and one-quarter of that in several of the other German state administrations. In 1909, a reorganization was effected in proving to some extent the salaries. The legislation of 1909 also further strengthened state influence by placing certain private properties under the control of the administration and allowing the latter to undertake the management of private properties at the request of owners for a consideration. The budget for 1911 places the total expenditure for the Forest Administration at $3 million, 98 cents per acre, of which 950000 for reboisement and other improvement work. The receipts for the last five years have averaged near $7 million, so that a net result of $1.60 per acre seems attained, considering the expense of reboisement as new investment. 4. Work of Reforestation well, the most noted work of the Forest Administration, and one for which it deserves high credit, has been that of the reclamation of wastelands, of which in 1879 it was estimated there were still 20 million acres in extent, especially the reboisement work in the Alpine districts as a result of the law of 1882 has become celebrated. The movement for recovery of wastelands dates from the beginning of the 19th century, and today reforestation by state communal and private effort encouraged by legislative acts during the last 60 years has restored well nigh more than 3 million acres of ground which had been lost to forest production. There are four definite regions of large extent in which systematic effort in this direction has been made, namely the sand dunes of Gascony and the Landes of southwestern France, the sandy plains of La Saone, the limestone wastes of Champagne, and the mountain slopes in the Vosges and Jura Alps. The sand dunes on the coast of France comprise around 350,000 acres. Those on the coast of Gascony and southwest France alone have an extent of nearly 250,000 acres, these being the most important and having for a long time endangered the adjoining pastures and fields. It seems that the land occupied by dunes was originally forested and that these were created by deforestation. As early as 1717, Successful attempts at reforestation were made by the inhabitants of La Teste, and from that time on sporadically small plantings came into existence. But the inauguration of systematic reforestation was begun only after a notable report by Bermontier, who, in 1786, secured as chief engineer of the Department of Bordeaux a sum of $10,000 to be employed in ascertaining the possibilities of draining the land by means of a canal and of fixing the dunes. As a result of this beginning, the method for their recovery having been in 1793 experimentally determined by Bramontier, 275,000 acres of moving sand had been fixed during that last century. The revolutionary government in 1799 created a commission of dunes, of which Bramontier was made president. An annual appropriation of $10,000 was made, later in 1808 increased to $15,000, in 1817, the work was transferred to the Administration des Pentes et Chaussées. The appropriations were increased until, in 1854, they reached $100,000 a year, and in 1865, the work being nearly finished, the dunes were handed over to the Forest Administration. There being still about 20,000 acres to be recovered, this was achieved in 1865, when 200,000 acres had been reforested at an expense of about $2 million and an additional expense of $700,000 to organize the newly formed pine forests. Pinus maritima was entirely used. These at present with their resinous products and wood are furnishing valuable material. An unfortunate policy of ceding some of these forest areas to private and communal owners, who claimed them as of ancient right, and also of sales, was inaugurated just as the planting was finished so that at present only 125,000 acres remain in the hands of the state. The returns from the sales, however, reimburse the cost of the reboisement in excess by 140,000, so that the state really acquired for nothing 
a property now estimated to be worth ten million dollars. A similar plantation on moving sands of 35,000 acres is found north of this tract. To the eastward of this region of dunes stretch the so-called Landa, a territory triangular in shape, containing two million acres of shifting sands and marshes, on which a poor population of shepherds on stilts used to eke out a living. In 1873, Chamberlain, an engineer of the Administration of Bridges and Roads, Administration des Ponts de Chaussée, conceived the idea of improving this section by reforestation, and at his own expense recovered some 1,200 acres in the worst marsh by ditching and planting. The success of this plantation invited imitators, and by 1855 the reforested area had grown to 50,000 acres. This led in 1857 to the passage of a law ordering forestation of the parts of the land owned by the state, as well as by the communities, the state at the same time undertaking the expense of building a system of roads and making the plans for forestation free of charge. The communities were allowed to sell a part of the reclaimed land in order to recover the expense, and sold some 470,000 acres for $2.7 million, of which less than $300,000 were used to forest the 250,000 acres belonging to them. From 1850 to 1892, private owners imitating the government and communal work, altogether nearly 1,750,000 acres, were covered with pine forest, at a cost of $4 to $5 per acre, or including the building of roads for a total expenditure of around $10 million. In 1877, the value of the then-recovered area was estimated at over $40 million, this figure being arrived at by calculating the possible net revenues of a pinery under a 75 years rotation, which was figured at $2.50 per acre, with a production of 51 cubic feet per acre and 200 quarts of resin at $3 each, an estimate of recent date places the value to re of the recovered area at $100 million. Centrally located between the valleys of the Loire and the Cher near Orléans lies the region of La Salonne, a sandy, poorly drained plain upon an impenetrable calcareous subsoil giving rise to stagnant waters. This region, too, had been originally densely wooded and was described as a paradise in early times. But from the beginning of the 17th century to the end of the 18th, it was deforested, making it an unhealthy, useless waste. By 1787, 1,250,000 acres of this territory had become absolutely abandoned. About the middle of the 19th century, a number of influential citizens constituted themselves a committee to begin its work of recovery, the Director General of Forests being authorized to assume the presidency of that committee. As a result, a canal 25 miles in length and 350 miles of road were built, and some 200,000 acres, all non-agricultural lands, were sowed and planted with maritime and scotch pine, the state furnishing assistance through the Forest Service and otherwise. A setback occurred during the severe winter of 1879, frost killing many of the younger plantations, which led to the substitution of the hardier scotch pine for the maritime pine in the plantings. The cost per acre set out with about 3,500 two-year-old seedlings accounted to $5. An estimate of the value of these plantations places it at not less than $18 million, so that lands which 50 years ago could hardly be sold for $4 an acre now bring over $3 as an annual revenue. In the province of Champagne, south of Reims, a plain of arid limestone wastes of an extent which in the 18th century had reached 1,750,000 acres is found. About 1807, the movement for the recovery of these wastes began, first in a small way, gaining strength by 1830 after some sporadic experiments had shown the possibility of reforestation. And today, over 200,000 acres of coniferous forest, mainly Austrian and Scotch pine, largely planted by private incentive, are in existence the better acres being farmed. It is interesting to note that land which fifty years ago was often sold without measurement by distance as far as the cry would carry, and rarely for more than four dollars per acre is today worth over forty dollars at a cost for planting of less than twenty-five dollars. The stumpage value of a thirty years growth is figured at from fifty dollars to a hundred dollars. The total forest area is valued at ten million dollars, with net revenue from the 200,000 acres at $2 per acre.
France is unfortunate in having within her territory, although so little mountains, the largest proportion of the area in Europe liable to torrential action. Not less than 1,462 brooks and mountain streams have been counted as dangerous waters in the Alps. The Cévennes and the Pyrenees mountains, or two-thirds of the torrents of Europe, an area nearly one million acres in extent of mountain slopes, is exposed to the ravages of these waters by erosion. Here the most forcible demonstration of the value of a forest cover in protecting watersheds was furnished by the results of the extensive forest destruction and devastation which took place especially during and following the years of the Revolution. Long ago, in the 16th century, the local parliaments had enacted decrees against clearing in the mountains, with severe fines, confiscation, and even corporal punishment, and these restrictions had been generally effective, but during the revolutionary period all these wholesome restrictions vanished. Inconsiderate exploitation by the farmers began, and the damage came so rapidly that in less than ten years after the beginning of freedom, the effect was felt. Within three years, 1792, the first complaints of the result of unrestricted cutting were heard, and by 1803 they were quite general. The brooks had changed to torrents, inundating the plains, tearing away fertile lands, or silting them over with the debris carried down from the mountains. Yet in spite of these early warnings and the theoretical discussions by such men as Bussengalt, Becquerel, and others, the destructive work by axe, fire, and overpasturing progressed until about eight million acres of tillable land had been rendered more or less useless, and the population of eighteen departments had been impoverished or reduced in number by emigration. A young engineer, Sorel, was the first to study the possibility of coping with the evil and proved in his Etude sur le Torrent in 1841 its relation to forest cover and the need of attacking it at the sources. The first work of recovery was tentatively begun in 1843, but the political events following did not promote its extension until, in 1860, a special law charged the forest department with the mission of extinguishing the torrents. There were recognized two categories of work, the one considered of general public interest being designated as obligatory, the other with less immediate need being facultative. The territories devastated by each river and its affluence on which the work of recovery was to be executed were known as perimeters. In the obligatory perimeters, private lands were to be acquired by the state by process of expropriation, and communal properties were to be only, for a time, occupied by the state, and after the achievement of the recovery were to be restituted on payment of the expense of the work, or else the corporation could get rid of the debt by ceding one half of its property to the state. In the facultative perimeters, the state was simply to assist in the work of recovery by gratuitous distribution of seeds and plants, or even by money subventions in some cases. It appeared hard that the poor mountaineer should have to bear all the expense of the extinction of the torrents, and much complaint was heard. In response to these complaints, in 1864, a law was passed allowing the substitution of sodding instead of forest planting for at least part of the perimeters with a view of securing pastures. But this method seems not to have been successful and was mostly not employed. Finally, by the reboisement law of 1882, the complaints of the mountaineers were properly taken care of by placing the entire expense of the reboisement work on the state. The attitude of the mountaineers which was at first hostile due to the restriction of the pasture, has been overcome by the beneficial results of the work, and now the most hostile are ready to offer gratuitously their territory to the forest department. Wherever necessary, the state has bought territory, and from year to year has increased its holdings and continues to acquire land at the rate of 25,000 to 30,000 acres per year, the budget of 1902, for instance, containing $1 million for this purpose, that of 1911, only 40,000. Altogether, the state had, up to 1900, acquired 400,000 acres, of which 218,000 have been planted, and it is estimated that about 430,000 acres more will have to be acquired. The total expense, outside of subventions to communities and private owners, up to 1900, has been over $13 million, of which somewhat over $5 million was expended for purchases. It is estimated that round 25 to 30 million more will be needed to complete the work. Of the 1,462 torrents there were in 1893, 163 entirely controlled, and 654 began to be cured. Among the former, there were 31 which 50 years ago were considered by engineers incurable. It is estimated that with the expenditure of $600,000 per annum, 
the work may be finished by 1945. The names of Mathieu and de Montsay, especially the latter, are indelibly connected with this great work. Lately, however, Briot, in his classical work Les Alpes Françaises, criticizes severely as improperly extravagant the large expenditures in places where the result does not warrant them, and proclaims as illusory some of the methods adopted. End of section 11. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia.